Hello and good evening. Thank you for joining the January Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host meetings, public meetings, in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. And to begin the meeting, I will now take a roll call of the members. Uh, Mr. Monahan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And I, Priscilla Rojas, uh, am present. Okay, so let's start with the EDIC agenda. Agenda item number one, request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the December 15th, 2022 meeting. A motion is in order. Oh. Second. We'll call for a vote. Uh, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Uh, Dr. Landsberg? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to enter into a license agreement with the Massachusetts Port Authority for the use of Bollards number one and number two on parcel M located at Three Dolphin Way within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Parcel M is a three acre site containing an 80,000 square foot building at the easternmost portion of the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. You may recall that in 2018, a cruise ship was brought into Boston Harbor to house hundreds of gas and electrical workers converging on Greater Boston to assist with the horrific gas explosion in Lawrence, Massachusetts. At that time, BPDA installed two bollards on Parcel M to assist Massachusetts Port Authority or Massport with the berthing of that ship on Massport's land. Uh, for anybody watching who, who's not familiar with the term bollard, we've all seen them. They're, they're uh, on the shoreline, they're frequently shaped like mushrooms, and the ships tie the ropes around them, uh, just to put it in, in people's mind's eye. Um, the location of these bollards are on e EDIC property, a BPA property, but they're essential for, uh, 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 for mass port's use of the berth that's on their property. Um, in June 2021, BPDA awarded tentative designation of parcel M to um, Eastern Salt. Eastern Salt intends to utilize uh, both parcel M and the adjacent Massport controlled uh, uh, Massport Marine Terminal to establish a 14 acre multi use waterborne uh, cargo terminal. Eastern Salt is using its current tentative designation period to complete its due diligence towards site design, financing, and permitting. In the meantime, Massport has entered into a short-term license with Ports America to utilize the, the same 14 acres of land uh, for productive maritime use while Eastern Salt conducts its due diligence. Uh, Ports America intends to import and has already started to import um, uh, lumber from Europe to bolster its operations at the Colony Terminal. This use is consistent with both Massport and BPDA's desire to utilize Parcel M and Massport's Marine Terminal parcels for maritime dependent industrial purposes. Um, the use of the BPD and bollards are essential for Ports America's use of Massport's Marine Terminal. Uh, I, I should point out that the temporary use will not interfere um, in, uh, in any way uh, on any of the proposed developments in that section of the uh, Raymond Alpha Marine Park. Uh, BPDA, I'm not proposing that we charge a separate use for the bollards um, because under the terms of the existing lease with Massport, we will receive 12.5% of all revenue that Massport receives from uh, ports, ports of America. Uh, so I'm not proposing a separate use specifically for the bollards. Um, we're requesting permission to license the use of the BPDA owned bollards to Massport for up to two years to support uh, Ports America's lumber importation distribution activities. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, we'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, item number three, request authorization to advertise an issue and invitation for bids for landscaping services in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Laura. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, for, and members of the board for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm requesting authorization to issue an invitation for bids for specialized professional landscaping services in the Marine Park. In the past, these services have been handled as one-off engagements, so this public bid opportunity is part of our overall effort to address as-needed issues more strategically and to care for our property as though we live next door. High quality landscaping will ensure a welcoming experience for all marine park tenants and visitors. So once the snow melts, the selected uh, landscaper will seasonally design and update our planters, plant beds, and other green space, specifically in the spring, summer, and fall. The invitation for bids will be publicly advertised, including targeted outreach to diverse firms, and the contract will be awarded to the lowest bidder who meets our requirements and is qualified. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the check goes aye, motion passes. Okay, thank you. Item number four, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals to engage a consultant to create a marketing campaign to promote the Office of Workforce Development tuition-free community college and Boston SAFES program. Constance. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Chief Jemison. The Office of Workforce Development has established two successful programs that foster education and future success for residents. Boston SAVES, the city's children's savings account program with more than 15,000 participants and tuition-free community college, which has served over 1,000 students to date. The mayor's office has asked us to fully integrate these programs. So today I request authorization to issue an RFP for $100,000 using ARPA funds for a consultant who would create a marketing and implementation plan to cover what we are internally calling cradle to grave. I mean, sorry, cradle to career, and my apologies. And this will benefit residents of all ages. The RFP will be publicly advertised. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, any questions or comments from the board? It's a great initiative. Um, hearing and saying none, uh, we'll, um, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Um, Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Constance. Thank you very much. All right, item number five, request authorization to enter into a contract with Slalom LLC for implementation services with the Salesforce developer portal in an amount not to exceed $568,549.20. Uh, Michael. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, members of the board. Uh, recently, the BPA developed a roadmap for the future state of our Article 80 Salesforce applications. Uh, this roadmap was created uh, with the goal uh, of enhancing operational efficiency, transparency, service delivery, for all stakeholders, both internal and external. Uh, the primary focus of this particular engagement is to replace our existing homegrown developer portal with a new application using the Salesforce platform. The result uh, will be a single ecosystem for managing all development projects as they move <coughs> through the various phases of the development review process. Um, some key deliverables for this engagement include building out project management features like task management and reporting, uh, we'll be updating our existing data model. Uh, one key thing that we'll also be doing is the addition of disability, climate, smart utilities, transportation, and housing information. We'll also be incorporating uh, ArcGIS online mapping and expanding the functionality of our CMS integration for document management purposes. Uh, a few things I want to do is highlight the uh, benefits to the various stakeholders, in particular, for example, starting with the uh, developer. Developers will now have the ability to save and finish their work uh, if they are not able to complete the work uh, in one sitting. Developers and their partners will uh, be able to team up and work collaboratively to complete their submissions together. Uh, developers can also access previous submissions for reference, and uh, they will also provide a wizard-like user experience to help them guide them through the process. Some key benefits for the agency is less data entry by uh, agency staff means more time to work with the developers and engage the public. Uh, more efficient and effective project management with task notifications and automation. 
This will also provide us with better, uh, more robust reporting. And BPA uh, project managers can also better track record submissions that are submitted by the developers. Uh, and most importantly, the key benefits to the public is that more data points means more transparency. So uh, this is a, a start. Uh, some of the things that we'll be doing, this that will enable us to do is to integrate doing document generation uh, through, through templates, uh, integration with Gmail and calendar integration, and Slack and uh, integration, say, with ISD. That is all. Happy to answer any questions you guys I, might have. Great. Um, questions or comments from the board? Um, so I just want to say that I am like super excited. One of my most favorite agenda items of this meeting, um, <laughs> favorite memos. I, I really like the, um, the strategic approach you're taking with your tech stack here and really trying to, you know, get, get maximize, right? Like what we can get um, uh, and consolidate. Like this is just, this is so, so important and, and not necessarily always like the, you know, um, you know, the sparkly, <laughs> sparkly topic um, uh, of the stuff that we do, but it is uh, um, just, just really great. So thanks for your leadership uh, and thanks to the, in advance the team um, for during this implementation. We wish you the best of luck and are here yeah. to support you and, you know, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great. I, I appreciate that, and and I want to make sure this it's it's very exciting. It's something we, you know that I've wanted to do, uh, and I couldn't have done it without the help of my team and many other people within the agency showing their excitement um, and and ready to to get this going. So um, we're very excited about it. Good stuff. Okay, with that, uh, we have a motion as an order. So moved. Second. Uh, we'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. All right. Item number six, request authorization to enter into a memorandum of agreement with the city of Boston by acting by and through its Office of Returning Citizens for the use of the third floor of 30 Dimmock Street in Roxbury. Um, Davo. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Madam Chair and other esteemed members of the board, I'm David Jefferson. I'm an executive director of Power Core Boston. Uh, Power Core Boston is a workforce development training program that has a particular focus on the green industry. Um, right now, we're targeting Boston area young adults that have a GED, high set, or high school diploma for a six month training experience uh, that will prepare them for work that addresses climate change. Um, we provide our members with a weekly stipend, a monthly T-pass, wraparound services that help them navigate any obstacles that they may encounter during their time in the program. And they'll also get an opportunity to complete certificates for CPR, first aid, OSHA 10, prevent, which is a conflict resolution de-escalation training. They'll receive pesticide application uh, training from a partnership that we've established with UMass. And they'll receive just under $2,000 in additional education funds uh, via our partnership with AmeriCorps. Uh, we recently just graduated a class of 21 young adults. Uh, most have gone on to uh, gainful employment after completing our program. Some returned with us for a second uh, round. Um, and we just launched our second cohort this week. Um, OIC and Power Core Boston, uh, we serve a very similar population, and, and it'll be really beneficial to both uh, due to the close proximity of the programs. Um, the site will be located, as mentioned, uh, by the chair on the Demick campus, and it'll provide a rich, uh, robust service uh, offering for our participants um, so we're happy to, to potentially end up in that space it'll cut down on so much uh, running around because there'll be so much available right there on the campus for our, our, our members um, the OIC um, was very open to partner with us um, and when the opportunity was presented uh, they they were looking to move forward on it quickly they would end up uh, occupying roughly 60 percent of the building space and we're looking to go into a five-year lease term the financials for which are in the memo that should have been forwarded to folks earlier uh, I will close on that looking forward to uh, having this partnership uh, with the OIC. It's also the fire department and endemic community center. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Dave. Um, questions or comments from the board? Yeah, another really exciting agenda item. Um, uh, so great to see and hear uh, programs like Power Core um, uh, be here to kind of you know help create and uh, and sustain the whole ecosystem, right? These skills that you're giving to um, uh, to these students are extremely valuable. So just thanks ahead of time. I know this is just for like a you know <laughs> an office <laughs> you know a memorandum of agreement but uh but we want to take the opportunity to say there's great work um and good luck thank you madam chair and this office is very important to us so it is a big deal for us yeah it's amazing um okay uh, with that a motion is in order well this is a big deal for us too so so move second good to hear. roll call for a vote mr monahan aye dr landsmark Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Um, thanks Thank so much. you, guys. Thanks right. again. See you. Um, OK, item number seven, personnel. Uh, Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jemison. Uh, we have a number of items for your consideration on the EDIC agenda and with exact details included uh, in the board memos. Uh, we have nine appointments in the Accounting and Planning Department, Sunia Aquaviva, uh, Senior Resilience and Waterfront Planner, and Benjamin Sunkeler, Senior Planner 2. In the Finance Department, Riley Barsamian, Procurement Specialist. In the Office of Workforce Development, Shannon Fitzgerald, Crew Leader, Power Corps Boston, Monique Mitchell, Senior Program Manager, Living Wage and Wage Theft, and Lucero Castaneda, Assistant Director of Policy, Worker Empowerment. In the Communications Department, Lacey Rose, Chief Communications Officer, and Stephanie Johnston, Digital Communications Specialist. In the Director's Office, Deep Biswas, Special Advisor to the BPD Director. We also have three contracts. In the Office of Workforce Development, Lydia Sarufis, uh, Wythini Alice, and Andrea Silva. Uh, we have one internship in the Office of Workforce Development, Noah Colbert. Uh, we also have two status changes, Lisa Harrington, General Counsel, Office of General Counsel, and Nisha McDonald, Community Engagement Manager, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department. We have one out-of-state travel request, and lastly, we have three departures. In the Office of Workforce Development, Patrick Horn, Legislative and Policy Analyst. In the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department, Christopher Worrell, Community Engagement Manager. And lastly, in the Planning uh, Department, Chantha Sun, uh, Transportation Planning Assistant. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, so that was the last agenda item. I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, so moved. <laughs> Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on to the BPDA uh, portion of the meeting. All right, so thank you for joining the January Boston Redevelopment Authority board meeting. At this time, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is continuing to host public meetings in a virtual setting for the health, safety, and accessibility of Boston residents. For more information and updates, visit bostonplans.org. <clears throat> the open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov cable. Okay, so I'll begin with a roll call of the members. Mr. Monahan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And uh, I, the chair, Priscilla, am present. Okay, let's go to item number one, 
Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the December 15th, 2022 meeting. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. That's aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on February 16th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the proposed development plan for plan development area number 134, 1234, and 1240 Soldiers Field Road project <clears throat> and to consider the proposed project as a development impact project. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Bill Mark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three is being moved. Item number four, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on February 16th, 2023 at 5.50 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the proposed development plan for planned development area number 140, 176 Lincoln Street in Alston and to consider the proposed project as a development impact project. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number five, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on February 16th, 2023 at 6 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the 119 Brain Street, Street project as a development impact project, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number six. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on February 16th, 2023 at 6 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the application for Olmsted Village Smart Growth Development Plan within the Olmsted Screen smart growth overlay district a uh, motion is in order so moved. second call for a vote mr monahan aye julian smart aye mr miller aye and the chair votes aye motion passes uh item number seven board of appeal uh brian good afternoon uh thank you uh chair rojas uh, members of the board secretary palimas and Director Jemison, for the record, my name is Brian Glasscock. I'm Deputy Director for Regulatory Planning and Zoning at the BPDA. Uh, this afternoon, I'm here to request um, authorization to present uh, recommendations on 66 petitions to the Zoning Board of Appeal. This covers uh, three hearing dates, uh, January uh, 31st, February 7th, and February 16th. Okay, uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. And thank item you, folks. Thanks, Brian. Um, item number eight. Request authorization to enter into a license agreement with Watson Healthcare for the Homeless Incorporated for use of a portion of the Blair lot known as Area 3 for a twice weekly mobile health clinic. Lauren. Madam Chair, members of the board. The Boston Public Health Commission and Boston Healthcare for the Homeless have requested use of part of the Blair lot to continue to provide mobile services delivering health care to some of the community's most vulnerable citizens. The Boston Public Health Commission's A Hope is a harm reduction and needle exchange site providing a range of service to active injection drug users, including free legal and anonymous needle exchange risk reduction supplies, and risk reduction counseling referrals. Boston Healthcare for the Homeless uh, have responded to the evolving challenge of providing care to itinerant and vulnerable populations by creating an integrated and multidisciplinary street team for Massachusetts General Hospital and for Massachusetts Mental Health Center. Together, these teams work together to offer fully integrated and co-located medical and behavioral health care to long-term itinerant at-risk people. This license would allow the use of the space within the Blair lot for Mondays and Wednesdays, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, to host a mobile health clinic focused on addiction and primary care. The licensees acknowledge and agree that the licensed premises is a future development site and the permitted uses are only temporary. 
The licensees will provide adequate insurance coverage indemnifying the BPDA and agree to secure the area when not in use. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you. Okay. Item number nine. Request authorization to award a contract to McCourt Construction Company Incorporated for the parcel P3 Environmental Remediation Project in Roxbury in an amount not to exceed $229,450. William. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I am before you today to request authorization to execute that construction contract with McCork Construction Company for the soil remediation uh, project at Roxbury's parcel P3. This matter was last before you this past September to request authorization to advertise a public bid for this work. Uh, as you'll likely recall, P3 is a nearly eight acre parcel located on the corner of Tremont and Hooter Streets in Roxbury, uh, for which tentative designation will be requested later this evening. Uh, the BPDA has been awarded $250,000 for mass development for an initial phase of environmental remediation to aid in the redevelopment. As authorized by the board, the engineering firm GEI Consultants prepared construction bid documents in compliance with Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 3039M. The work uh, primarily includes the removal of an on-site underground lead hotspot. Uh, we'll remove that in its entirety. It's about 250 cubic yards. Uh, we will also remove a portion of a soil mound that is on the site. So it's mostly dumping and urban fill. Um, we'll dispose of the most contaminated portions first based off some soil pre-characterization sampling and testing. Uh, the project was competitively bid and publicly advertised in October of this past year in accordance with the Massachusetts General <laughs> Laws. We had 64 interested parties download the bid documents and five bids were opened and read aloud on November 29th. The lowest eligible and responsible bidder was McCork Construction for an amount of $229,450. Uh, all documents required by Chapter 3039M and the invitation for bids were properly submitted by McCork. Uh, GEI, our engineer of record, uh, who produced the bid documents, uh, they reviewed the submitted bids and recommends award to McCork as the lowest and eligible qualified bidder. The total contract amount is for $229,450. We are recommending a 10% contingency in the amount of $22,945 for a total authorization request of $252,395. Uh, the work will be funded by the agency's fiscal year 23 capital budget, primarily sourced by that $250,000 mass development grant I mentioned. Uh, therefore, we are requesting authorization for the director to enter into this contract with the court. And if approved, work is expected to begin as soon as weather allows and will be complete by early summer. I'm happy to answer any questions for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Mission passes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, item number 10, request authorization to execute a contract with HRNA Advisors Incorporated for the downtown office conversion study. Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair, Secretary Paul Hemis, and members of the board. Uh, I am Andrew Nami, a senior planner with Downtown and Neighborhood Planning, and uh, I'm asking again for authorization to execute a contract with HRNA for the Downtown Office Conversion Study um, that came before you uh, originally back in November. The RFP uh, for the study was issued in November of last year. And as you might recall, the study will be part of an ongoing effort alongside Plan Downtown uh, to generate strategies that can revitalize downtown in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The primary goal of the study will be to identify highly actionable funding and land use strategies to help successfully convert vacant downtown office spaces to viable uses. Um, the BPDA received uh, seven proposals for the RFP an evaluation committee composed of BPDA planning division staff evaluated the seven teams based on five criteria, respondent team qualifications, project manager experience, approach to process and management content, and the respondent interview. Of the seven teams, HRNA advisors received the highest rating from the evaluation committee for their substantial expertise and knowledge working on complex real estate analysis and policy initiatives that they can bring to the 
to the project, along with notable experience conducting uh, uh, office conversion studies in other cities. Their consultant team includes PM and and C and Util, who bring a understanding of the architectural and cost challenges of conversion, as well as additional insight into local design and uh, zoning expertise. The awarded contract will be for six months with an amount not to exceed $100,000, and will kick off next month. And thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Ms. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks and good luck. See you, Andrew. Um, all right. Item number 11 request authorization to execute a contract with Mulf B and Company for Arbor Services on BRA and BRA owned properties. Uh, citywide in an amount not to exceed $120,000. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm requesting authorization to award this Arbor Services contract to Malt B and Company. As I mentioned to the board in November of last year, we've increased the budget of this contract uh, compared to previous contracts based on our needs. And to reemphasize the remarks I made then, as well as in the EDIC portion of today's meeting, this is part of our overall effort to address as needed issues more strategically, to be really proactive, to be ready for them, and to care for our property as though we live next door. The scope of this contract specifically includes tree trimming, tree pruning, tree removal, stump cuts, and tree planting, all of which uh, following industry standards. Uh, after publicly advertising this opportunity, we received three bids, of which Malt B is the responsible and eligible bidder with the lowest total price, and therefore we recommend this award. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Uh, so moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Williams Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Okay, item number 12, request authorization to advertise an issue, request for proposals to engage a consultant to, cons to assist in the preparation of the Copley Connect Design Services Planning Study. Um, Nick. Um, hi, Madam Chair, this, uh, I'll actually be presenting on behalf of this one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hemus and Chief Jemison. Uh, nice to see you all. I'm Ted Schwartzberg. I'm a senior planner in the downtown and neighborhood planning department. Uh, I'm here to present a request for authorization to advertise and issue an RFP for consultants services for design services as part of the Copley Connect Public Realm Initiative. Uh, and um, excuse me, uh, if you could please advance to the next slide. The uh, genesis for this project uh, actually is uh, in a state act, uh, the Commonwealth uh, uh, Acts of 2017. Chapter 57 uh, has regulated that the BPDA uh, should spend $200,000 to study improvements to public realm in Copley Square. And uh, with the assistance of uh, neighborhood stakeholders and uh, elected officials, uh, when we began to scope out this project, we looked at the parts of Copley Square that might be appropriate to, to look at for public realm improvements. Uh, and I put these historic photos here to show that uh, looking at the street network around uh, Copley Square is a way that in the past planners have looked at public realm improvements. Uh, and we looked uh, first at the capital project that the Parks Department is undertaking right now where the Parks Department is renovating the park itself and the Public Facilities Department uh, is renovating the McKim Building uh, entrance and the plaza at the McKim Building on Dartmouth Street. And so that left a, uh, a pretty obvious gap of who would address uh, the public realm of Dartmouth Street. Uh, and if you see on the image on the top right that in the 1960s, uh, something like a forerunner to what we're doing right now uh, took place where uh, you can see there are traffic cones blocking off an extension of Huntington Avenue that used to run east all the way to Clarendon Street. Uh, and then that street network was subsequently updated as is seen in uh, the picture of the 1970s on the left. Uh, and that's our current street network. Uh, and while that park has been updated once since that image and is uh, about to be updated again, uh, we took the opportunity to use the first half of uh, this $200,000 commitment uh, to look at Dartmouth Street over the past summer. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
so uh, over the summer, uh, we ran a 10-day pilot event uh, where uh, temporarily the street was blocked off to non-emergency vehicles. And this was done uh, because Dar uh, one of the unique attributes of, uh, for Boston of Back Bay is that we have a gridded street network. And that means you only have to travel two streets in any direction to find another one-way street that uh, will get you to the destination. And we really tried to stretch out the most for our money. Uh, and we hired two consultants, uh, Good Design, a landscape architecture firm, and uh, Kittleson Inc., which is a transportation company. And they helped us look for 10 days at how the space could be used uh, and alternate uses for the space apart from non-emergency vehicles, uh, help engage the public. And we talked to about 1,000 people. Uh, and then also look at network impacts uh, for motor vehicles that are traveling not just on that block, but in the surrounding area in Back Bay. And uh, we now have the results in. And uh, briefly put, uh, there was uh, a lot of positive reception from the stakeholders we talked to. Of course, it was not universally well received, but most people out of those thousand we talked to really liked the idea of uh, creating a world-class class space here between the McKim Building and H.H. H. Richardson's uh, Trinity Church. Uh, and then looking, uh, another thing we heard is that it was very important to understand what does it mean for traffic impact. And so we found that the biggest impacts were during rush hour uh, on the order of uh, about a minute or less uh, at peak demand times. Uh, other streets that were parallel uh, had impacts. And so uh, now that we have that data, the request that I'm here today is an authorization to uh, uh, issue an RFP to uh, to complete this study uh, as we were required to by the legislation uh, and use uh, the rest of the funding uh, to bring on a design consultant uh, while the park is under construction over the next year uh, and then analyze this data and understand how we could make alterations to other streets, uh, for example, Ring Road uh, and other parallel streets to Dartmouth Street to minimize those relatively minimal traffic impacts that we saw over the summer uh, and then also explore ideas for permanent improvements uh, to the street. And uh, to be clear, uh, what I'm asking for today is just the request to put out an RFP uh, to help with these design questions. And, and we don't have a design answer at this time, uh, other than to say that this is a great opportunity to improve public realm in Boston. So thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for your vote, Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Director Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Ted. Thank you very much. All right, item number 13. Request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals to engage a consultant in the assist to assist in the preparation of the Alston Brighton Needs Assessment. Uh, Patricia. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jamison, and Secretary Polnis. Uh, I'm Trish Kafferke. I'm a planner in the Downtown Neighborhood Planning Department, requesting authorization to advertise an issue as an RFP to engage a consultant to assist in the preparation of the Alston Brighton Needs Assessment. So the needs assessment is the first stage of a larger neighborhood-wide plan for Alston Brighton. The needs assessment will serve as the ex existing conditions analysis for the neighborhood-wide plan which will follow it, establishing an equity and need-driven framework for that plan. The project is expected to be completed within six months from the date of the notice to proceed. Uh, demand for the needs assessment arose out of a request by the Harvard Alston Task Force, and it was made financially feasible by the Harvard ERC Phase A board memo, which was approved in July of 2022. The RFP includes four primary tasks. They include data collection and analysis across a comprehensive set of topics, um, a determining of service gaps that result in unmet needs for the Alston Brighton residents, designing and implementing an equity community engagement strategy for high quality community participation in the needs assessment, and a presentation of the findings and recommendations to the community. The final results of the needs assessment will supply the community with the information that they need upon which to base development mitigation recommendations, provide a basis to the com coming neighborhood-wide planning initiative, and deliver findings which nonprofits, other governmental agencies, et cetera, may use to further their own work, um, providing services to the Alston Brighton community to diminish need. The request for proposals for the Alston Brighton needs assessment is estimated for an amount not to exceed $800,000. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Will Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye and motion passes. Thank you. Okay, item number 14. Request authorization to award tentative designation status to the HYM Investment Group, LLC, and My City at Peace as the redeveloper of parcel P3 in the campus high school urban renewal area for the construction of five mixed-use buildings consisting of 184 condominium units, including 144 income-restricted units, 282 rental units, including 164 income-restricted units, uh, 617,700 square feet of life science space, 47,500 square feet of retail space, 31,300 square feet of nonprofit space, 10,000 square feet for life science training, uh, 480 parking spaces, and 43,500 square feet of open space to enter into a license agreement with HYM Investment Group LLC and My City at Peace for pre-development activity on said parcels and to take all related action, Jonathan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Jemison, Madam Secretary, and members of the board. I'm here today to request approval for tender designation for the HYM Investment Group and My City at Peace for the redevelopment and long-term lease of parcel P3 in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. Parcel P3 is a 330,939 square foot parcel of vacant land that sits between Tremont, Whittier, and Vernon Street. This is the largest developable parcel in the BPDA's real estate portfolio and is located near the Ruggles train station. A previous attempt to develop this land commenced in 2007, but the tentative designation for the previous proponent finally terminated in 2019. This parcel has sat vacant for a long period of time, and the following, uh, and following an extensive public process, we are excited to move forward with the community-driven development at this site. In 2016, Land Nubian Square was launched, which was designed to encourage meaningful community conversations and critical feedback for their developments in Nubian Square and to identify larger development goals for the neighborhood. This disposition for P3 has followed that design. The BPDA held 13 public meetings focused on parcel P3 between February, February 2021 and August 2021, prior to the release of the RFP. Following these meetings, a robust RFP was drafted with um, development objectives driven by community feedback, including the creation of affordable housing, sustainable, resilient, and healthy development, development without displacement, economic development, and diversity and inclusion. The RFP was released in October 2021, and the BPDA received two proposals in March 2022. A project review committee which consisted of 19 community members nominated by local elected officials, participated in a robust RFP evaluation process, reviewing the, uh, the developer's proposals, comments from members of the community, and letters of support. At the end of their review, the committee recommended the partnership of HYM and My City at Peace to, to be the redevelopers of Parcel B3. On October 3rd, 2022, the, B, the PRC presented their recommendation to the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee, who then voted unanimously in favor of the HYM My City at Peace development. HYM and My City at Peace proposed the development of five mixed-use buildings consisting of 188 condominium units, including 144 income-restricted units, 282 rental units, including 164 income-restricted units, 617,700 square feet of life science space, 47,500 square feet of retail space, 31,300 square feet of nonprofit space for Embrace Boston, 10,000 square feet uh, for life science training, 480 parking spaces, and 43,500 square feet of open space. Since the initial proposal was submitted, the project team has committed to delivering home ownership units in the first phase of the, of the development, which is responsive to the community feedback around prioritizing of, um, low, of income restricted home ownership opportunity. HYM and MyCAPs have also committed to paying at least $2 per, 
per square foot in ground rent to the BPDA and a 5% transaction rent over the term of the proposed ground lease. At this time, I will turn this presentation over to Tom O'Brien and Reverend Brown to give a more detailed presentation of their, pre of their proposal. Tom and Reverend Brown, the floor is yours. We can't hear you, Tom. Can you hear us? Yep, now we can. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. So my name again is Tom O'Brien um, with the HYM Investment Group. I'm here with my partner, Reverend Jeffrey Brown. Uh, Reverend Jeffrey Brown of uh, My City at Peace, and we are here with, uh, with most of our group of uh, P3 Roxbury. So we are we're here to present this project. We'll try and be as quick as we possibly can. It's been um, four years in the making to get to this point, but it's an honor to be in front of you. Thank you so much to the members of the board. Thank you, uh, Secretary Paulimus, and thank you, Director uh, Jamison. We really appreciate the opportunity to present before you. I would just start by saying, you know, as River Brown said, we're gathered here uh, as a team because that's part of the vision that we bring to this site. And there are at least a few other items that I would add just at the beginning of this. The first is our focus has been to try and create as much home ownership as we can for the community using this site. That's number one for us. Number two has been, could we find a way to connect this community directly to the life science business, which is so important to the greater Boston region, but has not been fully connected to the black and brown communities of uh, Roxbury and surrounding uh, communities in Boston. Um, and then I would say too, the other piece of it, which certainly we reflect carefully on is, we want to deliver on this project, which is an important part of the vision. We know that the community has been waiting for this site to be redeveloped for a long time. And so uh, while this is complicated and difficult to do, we're excited to be here and excited to take the next step and uh, deliver from this project. So Reverend Brown. Can we have the next slide, please? So our group is a very diverse group of professionals uh, and minority uh, business enterprises. And I would just like to name the names of the group members so that you all appreciate that diversity. So My City of Peace, uh, with myself, uh, Thomas Sullivan and Denisha McDonald, uh, the Madison Park Development Corporation with Leslie Reed, Intia Ambrosi Zaza and Peter Munkenbeck, the Dream Collaborative and Dream Development with Greg Minot, Troy DePisa, and Nick Brooks. Uh, the Onyx Group with Chanda Smart, Shabnan Masmasarmi, and Carlos Castillo. Uh, Lab Central Ignite uh, with Gretchen Cook Anderson, Johannes Froyov, and Maggie O'Toole. Embrace Boston with, with Imari Paris Jeffries, who's on uh, with Duncan uh, Remage uh, Healy. Uh, Prive Parkin with Ricardo Lewis, and then Howard Stein Hudson with Tom Timlin, McNamara uh, Salvia with Adam McCarthy, and, and Vi Energy with uh, Samira uh, Amadi, uh, Niche Engineering with Deborah Danik and John Hedlund, Agency Landscape and Planning with Gina Ford and Bree Hensel, Goulston and Stores with Peter Kochansky and David Leinhardt. Uh, Dane Torpy with Joseph Feaster, John Moriarty and Associates with Chris Brown and Andrew Hall, and Maven Construction represented by J.C. or Joe Cole Curtin. Next slide, please. Great. So uh, thank you, everyone. So Greg Minot. Uh, so as with every dream project, and I know I speak for HYM and my city of peace, uh, our vision really began uh, with listening um, and you know, not just seeing. And so before I put pen to paper and began sketching ideas for this project, we met with over 25 Roxbury um, uh, organizations and our abutters over the last two years. Uh, so with that feedback, we really started to shape the site uh, following three key principles, which I'll roll through really quickly. Next slide. Uh, so first, we wanted to really um, integrate with a, a vision for a vibrant mixed income community um, with a mix of, uh, of, of affordable and market rate units, both rental and home ownership. Uh, as, as Tom just mentioned, a robust economic engine for Roxbury with over approximately 700,000 square feet of lab space. And throughout this, on the ground floor, activating with uses that really celebrate the culture and history uh, of Boston, 
and you know they're anchored by Embrace Center, uh, which will be a 31,000 square feet cultural and uh, economic justice center that will be uh, run by Embrace. Next slide. So key to our proposal is to not only connect the community through job training and job connection to the life science business, but we also look at this site and say, uh, the site is less than a mile from Longwood, and so is it possible to create uh, a cluster of life science buildings here? And we believe it is. This would be uh, you know, a, a new direction for Boston, and, and then we believe that we can create from the value of that life science a cross-subsidy pool of funds that will go into the creation of uh, the affordable rental uh, units, which we'll do in partnership with Madison Park Community Development Corporation, uh, as well as affordable home ownerships, uh, which will, uh, you know, as, as Greg said, we will create uh, approximately 145 affordable homes um, that will be available for purchase um, for uh, members of the community. Uh, we'll create a space, a permanent space for Embrace Boston, which will be a, a space uh, for uh, free music, for uh, education, for talks, um, for gathering, all of those sorts of things. Lab Central Ignite, which is a major entity that's based in Cambridge that has spawned the growth of the life science business in Cambridge, will move its Lab Central Ignite headquarters. We're here with Gretchen Cook Anderson, who's the head of Lab Central Ignite. She'll move her headquarters from Cambridge to this site in Roxbury, which is a really big, huge move. Uh, and we're very excited about that. And then there are a variety of other master site related uh, issues to be taken care of from environmental cleanup to below grade garage to uh, uh, water sewer. Our, our team has a deep amount of experience in managing uh, complicated sites like this and those other pieces will also come from that same cross subsidy. Next slide please. And so we thought a lot about how to incorporate the site into a very established existing neighborhood um, and so you know, first we wanted to really integrate with, into the existing neighborhood with, with streets, sidewalks, bike paths, and open streets. Next slide. We also thought about how we'd activate and through a carefully planned mix of uses uh, throughout the site and, you know, being sensitive to the, the heights of the existing buildings around us. Um, and of course, the planned Nubian process that was over many years being responsive to those guidelines. Uh, we created an environment to really create an 187 activity across five buildings as outlined on the slide. Next slide. I have one quick thing just on activate, uh, which is working with the BPDA team. The team has, um, has asked and we have responded positively to delivering the home ownership units at an early phase. So still in process to work that through, but our commitment is to deliver those home ownership units as quickly and as efficiently and as early as we can in the, in the phase of it. Sorry, I forgot. No, that's all right. Next slide. So in terms of Cultivate, we are really envisioning this as a holistic part of the uh, Nubian Square revival. Um, with Embrace Boston and with the Onyx Group, uh, take care of the retail, uh, we will have a vibrant cultural space that we hope to be a destination spot uh, for those who come from out of town so that they can see the richness of Roxbury. Next slide. Um, and this is just a slide that summarizes the housing units. So 466 total, 144 of these, as we said, will be affordable home ownership units to a range of income levels. Um, 164 uh, will be affordable rental units. We'll work on uh, that with Madison Park Community Development Corporation, who is an, a butter and a, and a, a key neighbor uh, to all of us on the site as well, uh, and 158 market rate units as well. Next slide, please. I think that, you know, this piece, also, obviously, we've talked about as well, that these buildings will create 2,400 permanent life science jobs uh, and 1,600 construction jobs. Our intention is to connect these jobs uh, directly to this community, uh, and we can do that in a variety of different ways with Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, uh, Roxbury Community College. Uh, you know, we made very specific, um, uh, you know, had this specific discussions programmatically with these entities to create that, as well as the wonderful presence of Lab Central Ignite, which will be on site as well. Next slide, please. So again, in terms of retail and culture, we've already talked about uh, the Onyx Group will, will be uh, in charge of that. 
we really do expect to have uh, the kind of retail space that would be uh, homegrown, if you will. We're looking for local businesses that will uh, participate in this so that can be truly the kind of destination space uh, for Roxbury. Next slide. Yeah, of course, throughout this uh, project, we're, we're looking to incorporate sustainability measures um, in uh, site-wide and, of uh, 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 course, building specific measures and uh, complying with the, um, the requirements of, of the BPDA and uh, uh, passive house and different strategies that we'll be using throughout this project. I think that's the last slide. It might be yeah. oh. So as a Baptist minister, I'll be short and say thank you for listening and thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, at this time, we are happy to answer um, any questions. Yes, yes, uh, sorry, I'm just moving my screens around here. Um, my, my eyes are giving out on me. I need to have a big screen over here <laughs> to see you all. But it was really cool to also see you side by side all there in a room. Um, that's really, uh, I guess, exciting to see again. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I, I just have a comment. Uh, I'm impressed with this presentation and really took away the uh, lis listening to the community and assembling a team that uh, has a lot of local presence. So uh, I commend you on that. And I, I like to see the mix of uses to see, you know, we badly need the affordable housing in this community to see that's a big component here, but also the job training. So uh, I'm very impressed with this. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? I would just add that uh, this has been a very, very long time coming uh, with uh, a couple of uh, false starts uh, over the years. I've attended a number of the community meetings and um, I, I think that the uh, folks at this table and, and outside who participated in this process for many years um, are all to be commended for uh, both uh, the assertiveness of the community uh, in terms of expressing the values and the material outcome uh, that they uh, wanted to see and in the responsiveness um, of uh, our own staff within uh, this agency and uh, the uh, development uh, team uh, in uh, providing something that I think is going to be uh, transformative not only uh, in this uh, immediate area but really transformative in both process an outcome uh, to black and brown communities uh, throughout New England. Um, you, you've really established uh, some strong precedents here for uh, the kinds of mixed uses uh, that will really invigorate uh, not only the economy and the culture, uh, but also job training for uh, young people who are going to be moving into the jobs of the future. So I. Uh, commend the team and I commend the community um, and um, thank, frankly, all of the folks who've shown uh, both persistence and patience uh, in uh, bringing uh, this development to this stage uh, where we're, we're in a position to uh, approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Priscilla, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So, um, any additional questions or comments? Um, yeah. So, I just did a couple before we before we call to a vote. So, again, you know, echo the sentiments of my uh, fellow board members. Um, you know, I really see this as you know, um, kind of like the ecosystem, right, you know, working and seeing this as like this project being able to connect like two ecosystems that aren't necessarily always um, that, that are disconnected, but are interrelated, right? So I definitely just love what you're you're doing here and uh, and the um, 
the number of partners and collaborators, right? Uh, kind of that whole rising tide lifts all boats uh, mentality of um, just incorporating all of the, you know, the, the great knowledge um, and opportunity that we have in, in Boston. Um, as I was looking at the slides, I was thinking, oh, I wonder if like the Power Core you know, students, right, um, who are going to learn how to do some of this future proofing um, solar work, maybe they could be the ones that end up installing that, you know, and I think um, just projects like this create really cool opportunities. Uh, um, and and it's, it really looks like that all-inclusive Boston campaign <laughs> that we did. Like it just kind of looked at that, looks like that in, in, um, in reality, right? Like so, um, just very moved, really excited. Um, and with that, uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I gotta move my next screen. Okay, here we go. I'm on agenda item number 15. These are certificate of completion. Um, so request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the 125 Armory Street project building C uh, 137 Armory Street in Jamaica Plain. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 16, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the 6 through 26 new street project in East Boston. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 17, request authorization to issue a partial certificate of completion for the Winthrop Center project in downtown. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 18, request authorization to adopt a minor modification to the South Cove Urban Renewal Plan for parcel, parcel R1 located at 49 through 63 Hudson Street to include residential and public uses and to eliminate the parking. Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hamas and Director Jemison. My name is Chris Breen, the Urban Renewal Manager, and as you stated before you, is a minor modification resolution regarding parcel R1 located in the South Cove Urban Renewal Plan area. This modification to the plan allows the project to comply with the building and land use requirements within that existing Urban Renewal Plan. Specifically, the modification now allows for residential and public uses on site. Uh, it also adjusts the parking minimums and setbacks to match the recently approved project from last month. Um, let me know if you have any other questions. Other than that. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Chris. Okay, item number 19, request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code in connection with the Notice of Project Change for the change in ownership for, for a change in ownership for the 28 through 30 Geneva Street project from uh, Joel uh, DeLuca to Geneva Real Estate Holdings LLC and to take all related actions. Quinn. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Palimus and Director Jemison. Uh, the proposal before you is for a notice of project change for an article in a small project located at 28 to 30 Geneva Street in East Boston. This project was originally approved by this board in May 2019 as a five-story, 26-unit condo building. In January 2021, this board approved a project change reducing the building to four stories and 19 condo units. The only change before you today is a change of ownership as the project has changed hands. Uh, Attorney Jeff Drago is here on behalf of the ownership group to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? 
Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Hands Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. No. Um, item number 20, request authorization to approve a two-year renewal of the 2013 Institutional Master Plan for Harvard University's campus in Alston, pursuant to Section 80D-5.2E, Section 80D-8, and Section 51-296 uh, of the Zoning Code, and to take all related action. Tyler. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. The proposal before you is the Harvard University Institutional Master Plan for Renewal for the years 2023 through 2025. This is a renewal of the existing IMP that was board approved in March of 2017. At this time, Harvard does not anticipate any new institutional projects for the term of the renewed IMP. Furthermore, the review process of this IMP renewal began with the IMPNF for the Fifth Amendment IMP which included the renewal request that was filed on September 8, 2022, initiating a 30-day comment period. Harvard presented the IMPNF for the Fifth Amendment to the Harvard Austin Task Force on September 22, 2022. The BPDA approved the IMPNF for Fifth Amendment IMP on December 15, 2022, with the renewal request to be considered separately prior to the expiration of the previous renewal. There is no presentation for this renewal, but Mark Hanley from Harvard is available to answer questions you may have regarding this IMP renewal. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. Right. Item number 21. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 36 senior income restricted residential units, residential rental units, two parking spaces, and 18 bicycle spaces, uh, subject to continuing BRA design review located at 207 E Street, <clears throat> and to take all related actions, Caitlin. Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Pohimas, and members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Caitlin Coppinger. I'm a Senior Project Manager in Development Review. The project I bring before you tonight for consideration is the 207 East Street project in South Boston. South Boston Neighborhood Development Corporation uh, proposes the renovation of the former St. Augustine Convent into 36 affordable one-bedroom senior residential units. The project will also include a 12,730 square foot addition in the rear of the building. The first floor of the building is proposed to include an entryway into the building, a trash room, management offices, and two elevators, as well as a resident amenity area and residential units. Floors two through five will just include residential units and resident amenity areas. The proposed project will maintain the existing front yard and fence within the current property. The front courtyard will include saving existing trees on site with the addition of new landscaping and an entryway and a seating area. The side of the building will also include covered resident bike storage. The project has received significant community support, including from Councillor Flynn and Councillor Flaherty. I'm happy to turn it over to Eileen from the planning team to further explain the planning contents. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, Ch Secretary Pohimas, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Eileen Michaud, and I'm the BPDA Neighborhood Planner for South Boston. The proposed project at 207 E Street is not located within the boundaries of a recent planning initiative. Instead, planning division staff considered the neighborhood context, adopted citywide plans, including Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030, the zoning code and public feedback to review the project. Um, next slide, please. The key considerations of BPDA staff during review of the proposed project include the provision of several accessible entrances to the site for residents of the building, preservation of existing mature trees on the site to the maximum extent possible, and pro providing adequate maneuverability for the two proposed parking spaces on the side of the building. Pending board approval, the proposed project will proceed to the Zoning Board of Appeals for approval of the zoning relief. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to the development team to present the project in more detail. Thank you. 
My name is Donna Brown. I'm the executive director of South Boston NDC. We're a nonprofit developer of affordable housing in the neighborhood. And I'd like to thank Madam Chair, the board, and Chief Jemison for this opportunity to present McDevitt Senior Homes. This site is a real gem in South Boston, and it is a really unique opportunity for us to uh, work with another nonprofit to leverage affordable housing. So the site right now, it was originally the convent for the St. Augustine's Parish, which was closed back in the early 2000s. At that time, the Archdiocese of Boston sold the building to the Paraclete Foundation. And until the COVID pandemic in 2020, they had been operating the building as an after-school educational support program for local youth. And after they closed in 2020, their small board realized that they couldn't reopen uh, the building needed some work and they weren't able to do their fundraising. And so they went through a process with their board to, to determine what to do next and decided to sell the property and set up a scholarship fund with the proceeds. In the meantime, we were negotiating with them and we now have the property under agreement at a below market price with the stipulation that we create affordable senior housing on the site, preserve the open space in the front of the site, and the facade of the building. So this is a true win-win for the neighborhood where we're able to address a critical need for affordable senior housing. We're also enabling the Paraclete Foundation to set up their scholarship fund. And, and we're preserving this building that really pays tribute to the work of the nuns in our community who served the neighborhood for so many decades there. So it's um, you know a really unusual opportunity to be able to create any affordable housing in South Boston in this tight real estate market. Um, and, and we're really excited to be able to, to bring this project to life. The, I'd like to take it, uh, an opportunity now to introduce Michelle Apigian from our design team at Icon Architecture to talk about the design for the, uh, the design program. I'm not sure if she's connected to this, so. I'm, I'm here. Here she is. Okay. 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 Thanks, Donna, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to um, listen to this presentation tonight. Uh, as you can see, this is a fabulous neighborhood, wonderfully located with neighborhood amenities and transit and a wonderful place um, for seniors to be able to continue to remain independent in that community. Next slide, please. Uh, here you're seeing an aerial view of uh, McDevitt Hall, the, the convent that um, served the former school, and behind it, the uh, massing of the proposed addition, which is strategically to the rear to maintain this absolutely wonderful green forecourt. Um, a real, as Donna said, a gem not only because of the building, but because that type of green space in South Boston's um, streets is very unusual. Next. Again, it's 36 one-bedroom units for seniors, all affordable. Uh, there's also some lovely program spaces, uh, primarily located on the top floor, where there's great views and uh, making use of a form of solarium that was actually part of the convent, um, but enhancing that and augmenting that, as well as some office space to provide uh, resident services and property management. Next. Here is sort of the frontal view of, and where you're getting to see not only the uh, building itself and, and it, the, the green space, but also there's a lovely masonry wall that uh, runs along two sides of the site with this wrought iron fence along the sidewalk on E Street um, and these piers, all of which we intend to maintain. Next. Uh, site plan wise, E Street here is on the left, and you see that green forecourt just inside of that. So the intention is to maintain that and augment it to the extent that um, we can maintain the trees, create an accessible path that allows folks to come to some seating areas in the front of the building and enjoy the shade of that, of that green space. And then you can come along, I don't know if I can use my tools, it might be helpful, uh, come along down this along the side of the building to the rear, which is access to the new construction wing of the building, which will provide up to uh, appropriate elevators, as well as an ex a truly code compliant stair to making the project much more uh, accessible and universally friendly. Um, 
to the north or sort of tucking away some of the uh, utility needs and keeping them as best as we can out of the green space. Next. Um, here is an axonometric rendered view looking uh, down the kind of shared right of way between the convents, the former convents, and the uh, adjacent condominium building. And you're seeing the walk along the existing building, meeting the new construction wing, where we really focused on materials that were uh, resonant with the brick and the sort of the, the, the fired clay that is brick, but wanting to. Um, not mimic it and rather sort of play off of it. So the front facades that face East Street are uh, intended to be a terracotta in more of a buff color. So again, related, but not the same, uh, and with some uh, fiber cement infill panels. And at the top, you're seeing um, what we intend to be probably not a true copper, but a kind of copper-like element, which plays on what's very difficult to see here, but I think you see the elevations copper that's on the solarium at the very top of the building. Uh, you can also see sort of a, some porch-like elements and fencing along that walkway that are intended to really, again, uh, build off of the portico that's at the front of the building, existing building, and the wrought iron uh, balconies. Next. I'll just quickly run you through the facades. So here you're looking to the, uh, this is the north facade, which is within three feet of the proper line and therefore is not able to have any actual glazing on it, but trying to take advantage of the terracotta turning the corner and then a couple of different uh, ver uh, colors of clapboard siding that is so common and prevalent in South Boston and with the panels that are really building off of them down, as my tools just for a second, building off of the, um, the proportions that are highlighted on this edge of the building, in particular, that second floor uh, was when the chapel was. It has these amazing stained glass windows. Next. The rear of the building has a projection, which you'll see more clearly uh, on the following um, facade, but is intended to all just be uh, fiber cement siding on the, on the body of the building with that terracotta wrapping all around the base of the building uh, and that um, copper element at the top. Next. And then here you're seeing that front walkway with that with a recessed at, recessed entrance so that the, they can uh, wait and sit out front waiting for a ride or for a friend without uh, while being covered. Um, and again, seeing the terracotta start to turn the corner and and, be, and come all the way around the entire base of the building, drawing on some of the cast stone banding that's on the building and holding that line as well as the banding um, and the cornice lines. Next. Oh, I think that's it. That's all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I, I don't get excited about too many presentations, and this is the second one tonight that I'm excited about. But I've been in the building a number of times. I, I know the, uh, the work that's needed to be done there. But to take this building with a great history and to provide housing for 36 of our seniors um, that's affordable is tremendous and, and so badly needed. And the other important thing, you can drive many blocks in this neighborhood and not really see much green space. That's a beautiful little spot and to maintain that is, uh, is greatly appreciated. So congratulations, I'm really impressed with this. Fabulous, other questions or comments? And just a small question, are you going to retain uh, the uh, wrought iron um, uh, entryway element? Yes, the pier with the, with the arc, arch over it. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Great. Great. Other questions or comments? Yeah, it's fab fabulous. Um, okay, with that, um, a motion is in order. No move. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Mr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair vote, votes aye. Um, motion passes. Congratulations. Good yeah. luck. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Um, OK, so I know what else. Um, all right, item number 22. Request authorization to enter into affordable housing 
rental agreement and restriction for one unit in connection with the proposed development located at 348 through, oh, sorry, 748 through 750 East Broadway. Michelle. Hello, and thank you, Chairwoman Rojas, Secretary Prohomius, Director Jemison, and members of the board. For the record, I'm Michelle McCarthy, Deputy Director of Housing Policy and Compliance, here before you today on the 748 to 750 East Broadway project in South Boston. This is a nine-unit rental project that received its zoning board of appeal approval on December 6, 2022, and does not need Article 80 approval. The project is here before you today because it has voluntarily agreed to provide one income-restricted inclusionary development policy unit. The vote today is to authorize the execution of an affordable housing agreement. I would like to note that Council, Council President Flynn has written a letter of support for this project. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. <coughs> Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay, item number 23, request authorization to enter into an affordable rental housing agreement for one unit in connection with the proposed development located at 595 Albany Street. Michelle. Hello and thank you again, Chairwoman Rojas, Secretary of Bohemus, Director Jemison, and members of the board. For the record again, my name is Michelle McCarthy, Deputy Director of Housing Policy and Compliance, and I'm here before you today on 595 Albany Street in the South End. This is a 10-unit rental project that received its board, Zoning Board of Appeal approval on August 30th, 2022, and does not require Article 80 approval. This project is here before you today because it will provide one income-restricted inclusionary development policy unit. Your vote today is to authorize the execution of an affordable housing agreement. I'd like to note that Council President Flynn also wrote a letter in support of this project. Thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, questions or comments? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Aye. I mean, Roll second. Yeah. Roll call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, item number 24. Request authorization to issue a certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 24 residential home ownership units, including four income restricted units, 27 parking spaces, and 24 bicycle spaces, subject to continuing BRA design review located at 26 Coffee Street, and to take all related actions. We have Nick. Nick, you might be on mute. Nick, are you there? Nick. Uh, Do you want me to um, go on to the next one and then we pick this up, or how do you want to do this? Uh, we're ready. Hold on, we just need uh, Nick to, to kick us off. Actually, why don't we just pause in Newpour? Why don't you go ahead and take 25? If uh, Chair Rojas, if you want yeah. to read 25 and we'll come back. Let's do 25. Um, request authorization to approve the application of New Boston Food Market Development Corp and Wadette Reed LLC for termination of entity and project status under Chapter 121A <coughs> and acts of 1960. Chapter 652, as or each as amended, to terminate the Chapter 121A status for the new Boston Food Market Chapter 121A project and to issue a certificate of project termination. Newport. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the Board, Director Jamison, Madam Secretary, I am here before you today to present the application of the new Boston Food Market Development Corporation. NYDET Reed LLC for termination of entity and project status under Chapter 121A of the General Laws and Acts of 1960, Chapter 652, each as amended. The application received by the BPDA requests the termination of the New Boston Food Market Chapter 121A project, which would include first a determination and finding of the owner that the owner has carried out the obligations and performed the duties imposed on it by Chapter 121A, and second, the authorization for the director to execute and deliver 
a certificate of project domination. The project is located on White Ed Circle and Food Hall March Road in South Boston, consisting approximately of 19 acres of land, which is bounded by the South Boston Bypass Road and New Frontage Road North, located east of the Southeast Expressway. The project is also to the south of the city tow lot, which lies off of Frontage Road. The project consists of nine buildings altogether with appropriate parking areas, roadways, and railways necessary to service the project. All of the original occupants were engaged in the business of wholesale dealing, processing, and institutional purveying of foods, meats, poultry, and other food products. In January 2023, the owner submitted an application requesting termination, citing that any continuing benefits of the project as a Chapter 121A have been rendered moot due to economic and legal circumstances. Specifically, the food purveyors that occupy the site have moved out on their own accord as of January 2021, and the intent underlying the original Chapter 121A conferral has been realized. Multiple developer plans and scenarios for the transition to other private development uses have not been realized, despite the owner indicating that they have made several efforts to this end. As of today, transportation initiatives serving the public interest are under active consideration for the project area. Most significantly, the project area was the subject of an offer and notice of intent to acquire property dated December 15th, 2022, issued by the MBTA. Pursuant to that notice, an order of taking may be filed by the MBTA with the Suffolk Registry deed of the land court at any time. The MBTA has informed the owner that such a taking is imminent. For all of these reasons, the application requests the approval of the certificate of termination. I'm joined by my colleague, Mallory Toomey from the BPDA's legal department and Chris Tesaurus representing the owners. We would now be happy to answer any questions from the board. Okay, thank you. Um, questions or comments from the board? I have a question. Um, this is an area which for decades has served as a uh, vital uh, area of employment, uh, food distribution, um, and uh, other uses. And if I understand what is likely to happen uh, next, uh, if we vote to approve this, um, we will uh, be, in effect, uh, opening the way for the MBTA, the MBTA, to turn this into a uh, storage yard for its uh, subway cars. Um, and I'm curious as to what our knowledge is of what the uh, likely next uses of this um, employment generator for so long uh, are likely to be. I mean, this is a big deal of a change. It is. You're, you're absolutely right. I'll um, speak to what I know of this proposed change and then invite Chris Tesaurus, who I know is in our attendees list tonight, um, who needs to be promoted to a panelist to testify further. Um, I believe, Dr. Landsmark, that a number of the uses that you cited have already moved out of this, of this proposed site of White Ed Circle as of 2021. And the fact they have moved out due to their own sort of economic reasons is part of the motivation in sort of the city um, getting on board with or being, being willing to explore alternative uses for this location. Um, so I don't believe that there is any risk of displacement as of now because these uses aren't presently in the site. Dr. Lindsmark, um, while he's being promoted, uh, this is Ken and Ryan. I'm the deputy director for downtown and neighborhood planning, and I oversee the plan new market initiative. So some of the uses that um, we're talking about in this location are uses that we're looking at preserving within the new market area, which is very close to Woodette Circle. So we are doing active planning that's looking at how we can change some of our regulations to preserve those types of uses and keep them stabilized as the city grows in the areas kind of surrounding that. So we're addressing it contextually very close to the site. So I wanted to give you a little bit more context about that. 
Uh, let me chime in, if I could, a little bit. This is Chris Tesouris. I'm the attorney for the, uh, the owners of the project currently. Um, you know, it's, it's the old adage, one door closes and another door opens. Uh, when we took on the project in 2020 uh, with the approval of the board, it was with the intention that these food purveyors and other users were on their way out by their own volition. Uh, many of them relocated, some retired. Uh, so they have vacated the site effectively as of 2021. Uh, I think that uh, makes it pretty clear that there are no current displacement issues as a result of this. And then secondly, so that's the door that has closed. Uh, attempts were made to try to develop it alternatively. Those attempts did not meet with success. The MBTA was part of the dialogue, as was the, uh, uh, the city, in terms of the best uses here. And uh, the MBTA determined uh, that they felt they needed to move forward for reasons uh, of their own. Uh, and I believe the door that opens here is it opens the door with the city for a dialogue directly between the MBTA and the city concerning the best uses of that site. So the developer at this point is exiting uh, as a result of the taking that is planned by the MBTA. But that certainly leaves the dialogue very open and perhaps only beginning between the city and the, uh, and the state. What is that likely to mean in terms of uh, what the city gets? Beyond I mean, it raised the question of displacement. I understand market forces are what they are, and COVID has, has uh, reshaped a lot of supply chain uh, 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 factors in ways where, you know, private industry moves as it has to move. Mm -hmm. um, that happened. I want to know what happens next that is beneficial to residents of the city. Well, let me just frame that this way. Um, the site is an interesting site because the city does have other interests. They have interests in the tow lot, which is next to the site. Um, the site does have other uh, city aspects to it. So the dialogue that begins, I don't, you know, I think your question presupposes that there's already some conclusion to that. And uh, as far as I know, and again, I don't speak for the MBTA, nor obviously the city, uh, it's pretty clear that that dialogue is, is just beginning. So uh, I think that's something that uh, those two parties need to, uh, to be more, uh, uh, to address, I think is, is a good way to put it. I, I don't presuppose okay. any uh, conclusions. I just uh, feel compelled um, as uh, a board member here with a fiduciary responsibility to the city and to its residents and to its small businesses uh, to underline the fact that uh, there's an expectation uh, that a once lively employment generating area that doesn't just become a storage yard um, and that the kinds of values that uh, were realized on this site for decades um, are, are somehow sustained in a way that provides continuing benefit uh, to the city and small businesses uh, and, and residents within the city of Boston. Um, I, I know everyone's going to operate in good faith. I also know that um, capital and market forces have a way of shaping things. And uh, I just want to be assertive about um, an expectation as a public official uh, that whatever the outcome is, uh, is one that clearly is beneficial around matters of economic development, employment, resilience, um, and the other kinds of, of values and goals uh, that have always been implicit in this particular um, uh, site. Uh, which has, for logistical purposes, um, so much value that other sites of this size don't have. Yeah. Well, I can, okay. The determination does not change any of that. The issue you have in front of you uh, is, is wholly separate and distinct from, I, I believe, the issues that you are concerned about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump, jump in here just because I do want to like kind of bring it back to what, what you just said. So, so can you re-articulate right, what the issue is in front of us, right? So what happens when we take this vote? That's kind of 
I just want that just to be restated without a little bit of the, well, without all of the, you know, the legal laws, right? Let's just, sure. what, what happens. And then, um, <laughs> then the second is um, from, so you were mentioning orders of taking, just clarify like orders of taking that's, who's taking that order of taking or, and then what is, um, so who now owns this in ownership? I just want to clarify like those three things. So what does this do? Who's doing the taking and then um, who owns? Sure. Right now, the ownership structure is, is actually an original ownership structure mm -hmm. that goes back to the uh, the original formulation of all of this back in, uh, I think it was late 60s. So it's owned by New Boston Food Market Corporation. Uh, that company uh, had a transfer take effect in 2020, uh, 2020 with the board approval, uh, such that um, uh, Wadet Reed LLC, a new investor, uh, purchased all the interests of the corporation. So the corporation that's always owned it still owns it. Um, the shareholders of that prior corporation were the food purveyors and, and the people who were operating on the site. They are the ones who have vacated, again, as of 2021. So that's sort of your, your, the baseline of ownership right now. Uh, as a result of the notice of intent issued by the, mass, the MBTA itself, the MBTA board voted it on December 15th and issued the notice on December 14th, uh, 15th. Uh, the MBTA is now set under Chapter 79, a clock ticking, whereby a taking could occur 30 days, essentially, after the notice of intent issued. That has now run the 30-day clock, so that at any point in time, the MBTA can take the property, and they can take it by filing an order of taking uh, with the appropriate registry of deeds in Suffolk. At that point, title in the property will vest in the MBTA. Uh, the current owners will be out of it, will have no title to the, uh, the property whatsoever. And um, at that point, the MBTA is uh, in a position where they and the city can discuss what the uh, intentions are of the property going forward. The I'm termination sorry. does, just to fill it out. I, it's not clear as to what gives the MBTA standing uh, to exercise eminent domain um, over this parcel. And, and I think you should be clear about what provides that standing. And also as a corollary to that, if we were not to approve this this evening, what would happen? They have statutory authority to do takings. So that's, I, I think, beyond, beyond question. Um, the fact that they're so, Chris, do you mind if I jump in? This is uh, Mallory Toomey, um, BPDA legal counsel, and I've been working on the 121A um, for the BPDA. Um, uh, this action that we're taking is only for the 121A itself. We, uh, the the ownership structure for the project site, um, is the actual owner of the land. We don't. We have a small portion interest as in the city also has a small portion interest um, in the in the project site but they're they're just pieces of a much larger puzzle um, so the MBTA's ability to effectuate an order of taking is because it's private ownership um, the the small pieces of public ownership are only interests and that we're still working through um, but the what the action that we're actually taking tonight is only for the 121a itself we will be de-designating uh, the, the current owner as a 121A entity and de-designating the project site as an actual project uh, with 121A benefits. Um, that won't even take place until we issue the cert certificate of termination. So as we work through these next couple of kind of big points in the ownership interest, um, we, we have a little bit of time um, to kind of figure out some of the finer points. But um, again, we feel comfortable with where we're standing in, in terms of the, the interest there, but um, the ability to effectuate the order of taking um, is very clear because the majority of the project site here is private. Members of the board um, and Dr. Wansmark, uh, with permission, just to expand a little bit on, um, on, on Council or Mallory's point, 
I would just add that this, this action tonight uh, moves what has been a, a three-party discussion for a series of months uh, into being a two-party discussion where we are uh, talking directly to the MBTA um, about um, city interests and roads um, and other rights of way and the parcel that, uh, that Mallory spoke to. Um, we've, our position, not only in the vote that's being taken today, but our position in uh, control of other ownership and rights of way that are essential to making this into potentially um, something that will support rail here in Boston and the region generally um, is uh, this, this land gives us a position to sort of uh, come to the negotiating table with the MBTA uh, and, and open up a series of other planning opportunities. We had a, a, an extensive discussion with MBTA about other properties they own adjacent to and other properties that we own adjacent to uh, this parcel uh, where um, through work together on a consolidation um, of, of rail storage in some parts, we may be able to have access to other um, through, a, again, a, a planning process, um, MBTA property, um, which might make it possible for there to be um, more development in and around this area. So uh, it's our view that this puts um, a key piece of land into the hands of uh, a very capable uh, and, and uh, development entity that has a lot of nearby parcels that when combined with our ownership, as you may uh, be aware, uh, the Casaza uh, yard is very nearby. Uh, and we have other, and again, as, as Mallory said, we have property on the site itself uh, that belongs to us along with rights of way. We believe this puts, makes a very complicated future uh, negotiation about planning opportunities into a simpler one where we have a counterparty uh, who's uh, very interested in, in achieving um, more than just uh, a little bit of storage. They're actually uh, interested in achieving um, a greater development plan for the area. So I pass it back to um, uh, Priscilla as chair, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions about what I said, um, Dr. Wansmark, other members of the board. Okay, other questions or comments? This was very helpful, by the way, and, and uh, so thank you all that <laughs> that you know popped in um, to to answer these questions. Um, it's it's that was very helpful. Um, I still have an unanswered question on the table, and that is, what happens if we do not vote to approve this this evening? It doesn't change anything with respect to the MBTA's rights to take the property. It further complicates um, any dialogue that could ensue because there will be unfinished business on the 121A side that has no impact on, on the city and the state dialogue. So uh, it effectively um, leaves open issues that are really not issues that have anything to do with the future development of the property but have to do with just an appropriate and an orderly and I, and I think a, a, a merited winding down of this and taking the private ownership aspect, as the director said, out of it and leaving a clear path for dialogue between the state and the city. So just to be clear, the taking will uh, compensate the current owners and uh, we'll proceed no matter what we do and uh, make this a two-party dialogue where one of the parties may actually be giving up some of its leverage in its negotiations with the other. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not the last part, but the first part I would agree with, that the taking certainly uh, does take title away from the current owner and the current owner under the statute and under the state constitution actually is entitled to compensation for that. But that's where that ends. Whatever happens beyond that between the two parties is between the two parties. Right. So I, I may interrupt for just a second. I want to underscore something that Mallory said just a minute ago and the director repeated again in his statement. There are two discrete pieces of property within this area that are not impacted by the taking. One of them is owned by the BPDA which we're working to sort of on the paperwork to record the deed for. The second piece is owned by the city of Boston. 
if and when um, the state agency decides to sort of take action to consolidate these properties, we will be a negotiating party in those discussions. And so we fully expect to sort of work with them and, and maintain that role as an interested party um, in the deal. And we will continue to sort of keep the board updated as and when those transactions happen. To, 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 to put a final point on it, um, access to those rights of way and that parcel, um, unless they are achieved, no storage can reasonably be created on the site. So um, we, we have in our land portfolio, and again, pardon me, Arthur Jamison, um, addressing the question from Dr. Landsmark, um, we still have all the leverage we need um, to before any kind of storage could be constructed. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that was helpful as well. Okay, any further questions or uh, comments? I think we all want to, you know, stay updated <laughs> on how this all progresses. So, uh, but with that, uh, uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Opposed. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, let's go back to item number 24. Um, we all ready for that? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, request authorization to issue a certificate of approval in accordance with Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 24 residential home ownership units, including four income restricted units, 27 parking spaces, and 24 bicycle spaces, subject to continuing VRA design review located at 26 Coffee Street, and to take all related actions. Nick. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Pohemus. I'm here before you this evening to discuss the proposed project at 26 to 28 Coffee Street, located in Dorchester. The proposed project contemplates the construction of a new four-story building with 24 condo units and 27 at-grade parking spaces with 24 bike parking spaces. Of the 24 units, four will be available at 80 to 100% AMI. In addition to construction jobs, the project will also be providing a ride share for the building through get around and a $300 credit per unit for the use of the ride share vehicle. And they will be making a $7,500 contribution to Boston Parks Department and a $7,500 contribution to the Daniel Marr Boys and Girls Club. Before I turn to the development team to take you through the project, Kathleen Onifer will take you through the planning context. Good evening, Chair Roja, Secretary Polhemus, and members of the board. I'm Kathleen Onifer with Downtown and Neighborhood Planning. The proposed project is not located within the boundaries of a recent neighborhood planning initiative, so planning division staff considered the na broader neighborhood context, recent adopted citywide plans, including Imagine Boston 2030, Go Boston 2030, the zoning code, and public feedback to review the project. Um, another key item of planning context as well as review of this project is that the project falls within the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District and will address the sea level rise design flood elevation through project design. Uh, and that informed many of the design review comments that staff completed. Next slide, please. During project review, BPDA staff's key objectives were to maximize usable open space on the ground floor for residents, improve the building's street presence, align the proposed parking ratio with the Boston Transportation Department's parking and bike parking guidelines, and minimize the impervious pavement on the lot, particularly in reference to the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District and thinking of stormwater. Thank you, and I'll now turn it over to the proponent team. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Director Jemison and Secretary Blamus. I'm John Fulgini, I'm the counsel for the team for 2680, 2628 Coffee Street. And you know, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon with you all, uh, kind of culminating in a project that kicked off probably about 14 or 15 months ago. We have worked extensively with BPA staff, local electeds, the neighborhood, and based on that feedback, we've made many changes, which we feel makes this project a better project than it was when it first entered the Article 80 review process. 
Um, we're really excited. We have 24, um, as you guys stated, 24 home ownership condominiums, 27 off-street parking spaces. This will provide much home ownership uh, opportunities for the community. Additionally, we're providing four affordable units, uh, which is approximately 17%, uh, obviously exceeding the current IDP. And finally, the, something which I've never worked on a project before, um, and in order to induce use of public transportation and less dependency on vehicle ownership, uh, through every uh, sale of a condo, there'll be $300 allocated to each homeowner to make use of our two on-site on car share vehicles with the building residents so that you know a lot of these people will not have to own their own cars because when they do have to run errands or pick up things that they can't otherwise carry, there'll be two cars on site for the 24 units. Um, that being said, we want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to James Christopher from 686 Architects to walk you guys through the design. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Secretary Polinus, and Director Jemison. My name is James Christopher. I'm one of the principals of 686 uh, Architects uh, with the Project Architects. I'm joined by William Christopher, who's our staff architect. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, the project before you today is 26 to 28 Coffee Street, illustrated there. It's in between uh, New Hall and the Ponce Ave on uh, Coffee in Dorchester. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, our site is about a mile away from the red line and has direct access to a couple of bus routes. Uh, so we are uh, working with uh, close proximity to the MBTA. Next slide. Um, this is just viewed along um, Coffee Street facing east towards Naponson Avenue. You can see it's a mix of multi-family buildings and uh, smaller residential buildings and uh, larger uh, multi-families. Next slide. <clears throat> View facing west towards New Hall. Next slide. And uh, subject properties to the right. Um, this is our front elevation addressing Coffee Street. Uh, the building is 41 feet tall, it's four stories. Um, it steps in from the street and uh, uh, at 14 feet on the, uh, on the left end of the building in this elevation and down to uh, 19 feet on the right end of the driveway side. Uh, we're proposing a mix of cementitious siding, hardy panel uh, and uh, clapboard, and then glass railings on the uh, uh, balconies as well as a, a roof deck which is recessed. Next slide. Uh, this is our, our parking side elevation. You can see towards the left end of the slide here, the incline ramp. Um, the parking and first floor has been raised in accordance with the Coastal Floodplain Resiliency Guidelines to be at 21.5 feet, so that the entirety of the parking and mechanical spaces at grade are out of the floodplains. And you can see our sh uh, shed uh, cover for the parking to the rear. Next slide. So our rear elevation, continuing the pattern and uh, uh, balconies that we demonstrated along the front, the shed parking structure to the rear and to the right, which would be on the uh, right side elevation. Next slide. Um, this illustrates our uh, left side elevation where there would be some additional parking as well as uh, outdoor patios accessed uh, from the interior common room which is a community room. Next slide. And this is our building in uh, Rennery. We have um, a uh, uh, pedestrian ramp to the left end of the building, which uh, creates the handicapped accessibility to the elevated first floor, which gets the building out of the floodplain. Um, we feel the building addresses the street nicely. Um, as part of the community process in the BPDA plans, we are planting 13 maple tree, red maple trees, over 30 shrubs, <clears throat> uh, several seasonal uh, flowering, uh, flowers, and a uh, substantial amount of grass. Next slide. This illustrates uh, our outdoor patios, the shed parking to the rear, and the pedestrian access to the interior common community room, which is right off of that uh, pedestrian, uh, the main entry and the uh, patio area. Next slide. Um, thank you, take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monaghan. 
Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Chair of those I motion passes. Thank you very much, and um, good luck. We'll see you. Thank you, time. All right. Um, okay, so we are going to uh, skip ahead because we still have some time uh, here before the public hearing. So let's go to agenda item number 30. <clears throat> Request authorization and delegate authority to the Office of the General Counsel to respond to the open meeting law complaint regarding the adoption of Mayor Michelle Wu's executive order entitled an order relative to speeding the production of affordable housing. Lisa. <clears throat> You're muted, Lisa. Sorry, first memo. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, I am here tonight because on December 28th, uh, 2022, the BRA was notified that a public meeting law complaint, I'm sorry, an open meeting law complaint had been filed uh, regarding the board's adoption of Mayor Michelle Wu's executive order entitled an order relative to speeding the production of affordable housing on November 17th, 2022. Uh, pursuant to the laws of the Commonwealth, the procedure is for the public body, that is the board of the, the BRA to meet and delegate responsibility to respond to the complaint um, to someone. In this case, we ask that you delegate uh, the responsibility to respond to the complaint to the Office of the General Counsel, uh, and we will prepare an appropriate response. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. All right, item number 31, request authorization to disperse $200,000 from the Harvard Alston Partnership Fund to 20 nonprofit entities and to enter into grant agreements with said entities. Mark. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark McGonagall, Deputy Director, Community Engagement. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm here before you seeking your approval of disbursement of funds to the Harvard Alston Partnership Fund. Uh, this fund originated back in 2008 as part of the, at that time, Alston Science Complex approvals. Uh, there have been several additions and extensions over the years. Uh, and I want to give a big thank you to the members of the Alston Partnership Fund Advisory Committee, uh, all volunteer uh, group of uh, dedicated neighborhood uh, folks that were very cooperative. I had the uh, privilege to sit on their last deliberation, which resulted in the disbursement recommendations that you see before you. Uh, and if you have any questions, happy to take them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Chair, that's aye. Motion passes. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. All right, item number 32, personnel. Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and uh, Director Jemison. We have a number of items for your consideration uh, on the BRA agenda with exact details included in the board memos. We have uh, one out-of-state travel request, and we have two departures in the Office of General Counsel, Lisa Richardson, Associate General Counsel, and Eileen Brophy, Interim General Counsel. And that's all we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Okay. And item number 33, contractual. I need a motion to pay the bills. I move that we pay our bill. Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan? Aye. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Please pay the bills. And with that, folks, we um, are at 5.30. Our uh, public hearings don't start until 5.40. So we are gonna take a 10 minute break. Um, and then when we come back, we'll start with uh, item number 26. Uh, so uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.
uh, the beginning of our public hearing. So simultaneous uh, Chinese interpretation are being provided for this meeting using the language interpretation function within Zoom. We ask that you be patient in case of any technical issues. Uh, language interpretation will not be enabled until instructions on how to access the interpretation have been interpreted into Cantonese and Mandarin. <clears throat> Once interpretation has been enabled, a global icon will appear. A reminder to all that are speaking today, we ask that everyone speak slowly for the interpreters. If you're speaking too quickly, I may interrupt you and ask you to speak slower. Thank you. Uh, to enable interpretation for Cantonese and Mandarin, please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and by selecting Cantonese for Cantonese and Mandarin for Mandarin. You must also mute original audio. So, uh, Horan and Wei, uh, will you now please uh, interpret the instructions that I just gave? Hello, uh, this is Horan. I'm the uh, interpreter for tonight's meeting. Uh, I'm the interpreter for tonight's meeting. Uh, I'm the interpreter for tonight's meeting. Uh, the interpreter for Yeah, Thank you. Hi, my name is Wei. I'm the Mandarin interpreter. Hey, 大家好,我是普通话的同声翻译啊。你要点这个三个点，三个点出来之后呢，会有这个呃这个语言选项，就选择普通话的这个翻译选项。嗯，如果是遇到技术问题呢，请拨打这个六幺七九一八四二三三，或者发送电子邮件至啊，bpda@b
It is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. So staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be, an, will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking both support and opposition at the same time. So if you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel and this will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. <clears throat> when your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you are calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. And at that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. And finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And Ms. Sarah Black will now begin the presentation. Sarah. Madam Chair. Oh, yes. A point of order, I am uh, a board member of um, one of the nonprofit organizations that has taken an active role in this matter. Um, and I think it best that I recuse myself from this hearing. Um, and if uh, Secretary Prohamus can uh, reach out to me at the end of the, um, the hearing, I will return for the subsequent uh, hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Lensmark. Duly noted for uh, for the record, and we'll see you soon. So, um, Ms. Sarah Black. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, so, good evening, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Polimus. Uh, my name is Sarah Black, and I am a senior project manager at the BPDA. I am here before you today to discuss the proposed development plan for plan development area number 134, Longwood Place, located in the Longwood Medical Area. The plan development area, that plan development area development plan was filed on January 3rd, 2022. The action being requested today is to consider the approval of a plan development area through Article 80C on this site. There are no Article 80B large projects being proposed at this time. The Longwood Place PDA development plan is located on a 5.89 acre site at 305 Brookline Avenue in the Longwood Medical Area neighborhood of Boston, commonly known as the Simmons University Residential Campus. The development plan envisions up to five buildings anticipated to be constructed in three phases with up to 1.7 million square feet of gross floor area in total, including approximately 1.3 million square feet of office, lab, research and development, 340,000 square feet of residential with 388 units and 20% affordable units on site, 44,000 square feet of retail and 15,000 square feet of community space. The development plan also includes approximately 2.6 acres of publicly accessible open space. Many significant community benefits are being proposed as a part of this PDA, including those 388 new rental residential units with 20% affordable units in each proposed residential building, approximately $17 million in housing linkage payments, and approximately $3 million in jobs linkage payments to the city's housing and jobs trusts, respectively. Most importantly, the approval of this PDA is an important step in enabling Simmons University to construct the Living and Learning Center, which my colleague Christina will discuss shortly. The BPDA hosted three public meetings and four IAG meetings virtually between January 2022 and December 2023, to, uh, excuse me, December 2022, 2022 uh, to review the PDA development plan. These meetings were advertised in the local newspapers, posted to the BPDA's calendar, and email notification was sent to all subscribers of the BPDA's Longwood Medical Area neighborhood updates. The proposed project received approval from the Boston Civic Design Commission on September 6, 2022. A key point of discussion at public meetings has been the impact of future development projects proposed within this PDA on the Emerald Necklace, which abuts the PDA site. The development team has made a consistent effort to hear, analyze, and address those important community concerns to the best of their ability over the course of project review. 
I am pleased to share that since the last public meeting, the development team has further reduced the height of building A, which has the tallest zoning envelope within the PDA by 25 feet to 295 feet total in response to these community concerns. In addition, the development team has proposed to invest $7 million to mitigate these anticipated impacts. $6 million will be provided to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department to set up an endowment for the maintenance, improvement, and protection of the Emerald Necklace. $1 million of that payment will be earmarked for a study of the shadow impacted areas of the Emerald Necklace. The BPDA recognizes the need for a uniform policy for regulating development impacts on open space and is committed to using this study to develop such a policy. This study will be completed within approximately one year from the approval of the development plan and is intended to inform a similar effort that will examine the impacts of development on open spaces citywide. I would like to thank the IAG for their tireless advocacy and work on this project to date. I would also like to specifically thank Councillor Bach for her continued involvement in this year's long review. At this point, I would like to hand it off to my colleague, Christina Rico from the Planning Department to present the planning context for the project followed by a presentation from the development team. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, esteemed members of the board, Director Jemison and Secretary Polimus. My name is Christina Rico, and I am the neighborhood planner for the Fenway and Longwood Medical Area. I join you this evening to give planning context for this proposal. As Sarah mentioned in her introduction, the approximately 5.9 acre site operates today as a residential campus associated with Simmons University. In December 2020, this board approved an institutional master plan for the university, which articulated a vision for a consolidated campus that would relocate existing residential uses into a living and learning center on the university's academic campus, designed to accommodate athletic space, a dining hall, and approximately 1,100 dormitory beds. The IMP imagined that the residential campus would, in turn, be redeveloped to provide needed funding for the institution. This proposed development plan is a critical step to fulfilling the One Simmons vision that will support the continued growth and viability of Simmons University in this neighborhood. For the redevelopment of the site, the development plan proposes a mix of uses connected to and supported by the well-established research and development economy associated with the Longwood Medical and Academic Area. The project site is located within the LMA Interim Guidelines Study Area adopted by the BPDA in 2003. The interim guidelines adopted 20 years ago were intended to be superseded by more formal analysis and codified by changes to zoning, which did not materialize. In the intervening years since the interim guidelines were adopted, several long range planning efforts, including Imagine Boston 2030 and Go Boston 2030 have provided additional context and guidance relevant to the consideration of this project. Next slide, please. The project site spans approximately 1,000 feet along the Brookline Avenue and requires network level coordination to carefully balance project access with the safety, access, and reliability of the broader LMA street and path network. On-street improvements include dedicated pickup drop-off spaces along Pilgrim Road and Brookline Avenue, as well as a concentration of multimodal upgrades along Brookline Avenue, where the proponent will construct a separated bike lane and floating bus stops. The site's minimum 20-foot setbacks along Brookline Avenue will enable bus priority measures to be designed in concert with the BPDA's Fenway Kenmar Transportation Action Plan and expanded high-frequency service patterns emerging from the MBTA's bus network redesign. Vehicle impacts, including their conflicts with people walking and biking, are mitigated by consolidating vehicle access to the new mid-block street, locating all parking and loading within an underground garage and limiting on-site parking to a quantity below the maximum allowable. Short, short Street, today a pedestrian alley between Brookline Avenue and Pilgrim Road, will be upgraded with walking and biking paths separated by trees and vegetation, creating a more pleasant connection between the LMA, Longwood Station, and the Muddy River Path Network. The central connector links Short Street and Mid-Block Street with public space, and Mid-Block Street deliberately aligns with the colleges of the Fenway Path Network, beginning at the Emanuel College Gateway. Taken together, the project site expands this critical off-street walking network through the LMA and Fenway, bringing it closer to the Muddy River Path Network and the Riverway. With that, I am pleased to turn the presentation over to the development team for additional project information. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Palamas. 
My name is Laura Brink Pazinski. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate at Simmons University. For close to a decade, Simmons has been planning the future of its two campuses, a plan that enables a sustainable, responsible, and economical physical plant. Significant deferred maintenance and the challenges that we face with a bifurcated campus inspired us to consolidate all of our residences, dining facilities, and athletics on our academic campus. As one of the only remaining women's institutions in the country, this plan strengthens our future and supports our incredible mission. Simmons is responsible in our planning. We are shrinking our footprint for efficiency and to better deliver our educational promise. What we have termed One Simmons is the most profound strategy in our history and it will allow our legacy to continue. Many say that they understand how important this project is to Simmons. And if that's the case, then we must see a path forward for Skanska to develop the Longwood Place development on our former residence campus. If it isn't possible, then Simmons won't be possible. Skanska has been a tremendous thought leader for us, helping us to create all of the goal, helping us to achieve all of the goals that we have set forward. They've done so while working closely and collaboratively with the city and our neighbors. Having a responsibly designed development is significant to Simmons as we know that this is a crucial location for so many. Simmons is grateful to the city of Boston, members of the IAG, and our close neighbors for the diligent work over the past many months. While all of that work has been happening, Simmons has completed the first two phases of the One Simmons project. We have renovated spaces for our students and cleared the path for our new living and learning center. The students who attend Simmons have every intention of changing the world. They're special people who are determined to improve the human condition through helping professions in the health sciences, social work, and others that bring hope and understanding to the world. Please help us continue this mission that started in 1899 to educate women for independent livelihoods. We hope to shore this mission up for the next 100 years, and we'll do so with the One Simmons plan in place. And with that, I'll turn it over to my partner, Carolyn Desmond. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, BP Day staff, and all the community member members that are here tonight. I'm Carolyn Desmond with Skanska, and I'm excited to be in front of you presenting this project. This is the culmination of years of work with Simmons and the city. Since being selected by Simmons as their partner, man, five years ago, we've maintained a community-focused approach, which has resulted in a transformational mixed-use project that has evolved based on feedback from city departments, Councilor Bach, the IAG, our residential and institutional neighbors over the past two years. Carolyn, can I interrupt you for a second and just remind you to speak slowly? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello. We've taken every issue to heart and worked to incorporate changes that truly benefit the LMA and the Fenway neighborhoods. We recognize that it is difficult to satisfy everyone's individual priorities, and we do not claim this project does that, nor do we think that it's possible for any development to achieve such a lofty standard. We've recognized their objectors to specific components of the project, namely the shadows. But we also know there's a lot of misinformation out there in terms of the height of our buildings, the shadows they cast, and the environmental impacts of these shadows. We have been completely transparent throughout the process and have hopefully illustrated that we understand the need to protect and invest in our valuable public parkland. This is why, as you, heard, as you heard earlier, we have worked very hard from the beginning to reduce shadow with each subsequent iteration of the PDA project. And as recently as two days ago, as Sarah said, we agreed to lower the height of the tallest building again by 25 feet and make an unprecedented financial investment of $7 million to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. The plan we have put forth is a plan that best balances the priorities and feedback we've received, is economically viable, supports the overall city and neighborhood goals, and perhaps most importantly to the city at large, really allows Simmons to continue as a world-renowned institution. We really believe the benefits and value creation of this project far outweigh any negative impacts, and we hope everyone can see that tonight. We could be more excited to move this project forward and really set Simmons up for success, Thank you for your time and your partnership during this planning process. I'll kick it over to Victor um, with Sasaki, and he um, and I will both talk a little bit about the benefits um, as we go through the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carolyn. Next slide, please. My name is Victor Vizgadis, principal with Sasaki. Uh, as we've already heard, this project sits as a vital part of the Imagine Boston 2030 urban core. 
Uh, we know that it sits at a confluence of multiple uses in the LMA and the Fenway itself, the intersection of commercial, residential, medical, education, all sorts of things happening here, but without a place for those necessarily to come together. And despite the fact that we have this incredibly valuable, amazing resource of the Emerald Necklace, the area is also missing other vital types of public realm open space for people to use on an everyday basis. Next slide. We went through significant conversations with various community organizations, individuals, city groups before we submitted the first pass of the PDA in early 2022. You see that representation here of the massing of some of the metrics. Next slide. Following that, uh, we sat down and did a lot more work with all of our neighbors, individuals, institutions, community organizations, city agencies, the IAEG, uh, other interested parties to really understand the concerns and how we could refine this project, as Carolyn just said, to make it the best possible neighbor for everyone. Next slide. That resulted in a series of major buckets of issues that we really focused on refining the development of this project, again, to make it the best possible neighbor that we could, touching on an inclusive public realm, the redevelopment of residential program, really refining the density and mass of the site, a focus on transportation infrastructure, really developing the community offerings, and paying close attention to environmental considerations. Next slide which after many iterations resulted in a resubmission of our proposed development, as you see here. We moved a lot of massing around, we reduced the overall size of the project, we reduced the height of the buildings, including what Carolyn just mentioned, we increased the amount of public space, we doubled the amount of residential on the site, as well as a significant increase to interior community space. Next slide. Part of this is also to really rethink what it makes to create an inclusive public realm, making sure that we are providing a variety of space types, not to compete with the Emerald Necklace, but to supplement the Emerald Necklace, to provide spaces that are not provided today to make this a valuable and vibrant community. Next slide. As I've already mentioned, we radically increased the amount of housing, more than doubling the amount of square footage on the site, redistributing it across the site to really create a week-round, day-round, year-round activated site beyond normal office hours, with also a real focus on increasing the amount of affordable units on site. Next slide. Uh, we redistributed massing across the site to pull more of the density towards the busy corridor of Brookline Ave, redistribute some of the open space closer to the heart uh, of the LMA, but really to focus on being a good adjacent neighbor uh, and pulling some of that taller mass closer to the existing tall buildings and capitalizing on a lot of these neighborhood connections. Next slide, please. As Carolyn mentioned, uh, you know, a real focus as well on developing a robust transportation infrastructure, not only to just get people to and from the site, but to do so in a welcoming and much better, safe way for pedestrians, for bikes, for buses, and yes, for cars, uh, as well as service vehicles. So really focused on increasing the welcoming aspect and the safety along Brookline Ave, again, with raised bike lanes, bigger pedestrian areas, safer and more welcoming bus stops, more robust infrastructure along Short Street for bikes and pedestrians, solving some of the challenges that exist today on Pilgrim Road and driving all of our traffic and service vehicles as quickly off the surface city streets as possible and getting them underground. Next slide. So that you see a radically changed Brookline Ave with much wider, more generous pedestrian bike thoroughfares. Next slide. And as another example, the addition of a really needed pedestrian signalized crosswalk across Brookline Ave. Next slide, please. As well as then the inclusion of more interior community spaces in addition to those exterior community spaces to make sure this is a year-round site for everybody in the neighborhood, not just residents, not just tenants on the site, as well as to uh, offer a very significant, diverse set of retail and community options that just don't exist in the area today. Next slide. Then I'll turn it over to Kelly just to talk a little bit about the ecology. Thanks. Uh, my name is Kelly Farrell. I'm an ecologist and landscape designer with Sasaki. And first, 
On site, we want to emphasize that the proposed design with layered native plantings will play a much more significant ecological role to the local ecology than the current land and trees approach, and also the regional importance of developing on already developed land. But I know that off site, there's a lot of concern about the potential impacts of the proposed shadows. I was brought onto the project to investigate this because before I became a landscape architect, I spent several years conducting habitat surveys and endangered species surveys in the Northeast. I know and love the plants and habitats that grow both in the cities and in the wild world around them and where they occur in both of these places. Um, and so that's why I was brought in to look at this. Through numerous design iterations, the proposed building massings were looked at to minimize the shadows that they cast. And currently, the shadows have been minimized to be only in the early morning and later afternoon when sunlight hours, when the sunlight is less direct and the flora might be less photosynthetically impacted. The shadows generally last fewer than two hours on the vernal equinox and get shorter and faster than there as the season progresses. I looked at the site to get a better sense of what's currently growing there and how it may or may not be impacted by increased shadow. Unfortunately, it's impossible to say with precision what the impacts of these limited shadows will be because there hasn't been a lot of research on this as a whole. But we don't believe that the short duration of increased shadow will have a substantial negative impact on the mature canopy trees that are part of the emerald necklace. The current understory is mainly composed of species, both native and non-native, um, that are well adapted to shade. And the native shrubs that were recently planted in Higginson Circle tend to be species that are well adapted to both full sun and partial shade. And we anticipate that they would be minimally impacted by the increased shadow, which again will be you know, relatively limited in its duration through the season. For the sake of brevity in the presentation, we're not including the specific shadow studies here, but we are prepared with those studies in an appendix if the board should have questions and want to walk through them. And with that, I would like to pass it back to Carolyn. Thank you, Kelly. Next, next slide. Um, I'll wrap up here quickly with the overall public benefits, um, summary of benefits. Um, when we look at this in three, three big categories, the public realm benefits, the community benefits, and the economic benefits. So I think these are all very important to point out. The total um, investment in the public realm improvements for this site is over $8 million, $12 million in addition for, for the public open space. We've already talked about $7 million investment in the Boston parks. Um, and then one thing that as we move on to community benefits that is, um, has been a, a, an ask for us and something that we're very excited about doing is creating a, train, a training hub um, for the, uh, so, sorry, um, community space which, with a focus on a training hub um, and committing to the development, uh, the cost of the um, fit out for that. We are also making $4 million in transportation contributions, and this project is expected to generate over $50 million in estimated tax revenue once fully complete. You heard about the linkage fees that we, the project will um, be contributing toward, but I think really importantly is the jobs that this also creates. 5,000 permanent jobs, 5,000 construction jobs should not go unrecognized. Um, the DE&I program for this, this project will include a really robust framework for a DE&I strategy from each phase of the project, through design, through development, through construction, and through operations of this site. You heard a little bit about a focus on sustainability and resiliency and of course a year round commitment to um, the public realm and making sure we have spaces both inside and out to um, allow the public to come and use. Next slide. I'll quickly touch on the phasing. Um, this, this project we anticipate being three phases, so this does not all come at once. Uh, the first phase would include the, um, a very significant portion of the public realm just south of the mid block street, um, as well as building one and the construction of the public heart. Um, phase two would be buildings three and four, a residential and commercial building. And phase three would be the, um, the buildings farther north, which would be a residential and a commercial building. I should also say that in phase one, the, um, the plan is currently to build a full underground garage um, from the beginning. So with that said, I will, um, I will conclude. Thank you all for your time. And we'll, we'll jump in at the end and respond to, to any of the, the comments that come from the public. So I think that's it for now.
Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Um, so uh, I just have a, a, a quick question because I know we're, we're, we're short on time and, uh, and everything, but um, it, the, uh, you mentioned like the, the shadow studies and I tried to take notes, but I was an accounting major, <laughs> not, not a science major. Um, so can you just go through one more time? You said the, the shadows, something about like the equinox and it, can you just go through that and, um, one more time. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry for my rapid response. Yeah, it was good. It was good. The, the equinox, which is on March 21st, is often considered the beginning of the growing season, which is a little bit variable. But at the equinox, we have looked at the shadows, and the very maximum shadows are approximately two hours. Most of them are shorter. As the season continues, the sun gets higher in the sky relatively. And so the shadows that are cast will be shorter in duration and smaller in extent as we work our way towards summer. Okay, perfect. No, thank you so much. I was like, it was going to be in my brain, and I was just like, mm -hmm. I okay, um, awesome. Okay, with that, the, there, this is a public hearing, so we'll hold uh, to um, <clears throat> for for board questioning after after we get through all the um, public testimony. So, uh, Secretary Bohemus, do we have folks who would like to testify? Sure. Uh, we're going to start with Councillor Buck. Great. Uh, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, Dr. Uh, Jemison. Um, I, and please forgive me, you have a seven-page letter from me on this one. I will not be reading it into the record, but um, I'm just going to try to summarize a little bit sort of some of the overall points because uh, it's quite a big project and we've heard quite a lot from lots of my constituents and I just want to give the board a little bit of a sense of the conversation. Um, I think one key thing to know about this project is was alluded to at the start of the presentation which is that it's very central to the future of Simmons which is obviously a treasured institution in my district. Um, I think a lot about it because uh, I think all the archivists who work for the city of Boston and many of the social workers we work with every day were all trained at Simmons. Um, and uh, as was alluded to, you know, there's not a lot of um, small women's colleges left in the country. Uh, the private kind of small college model, I would say, is pretty financially vulnerable right now. And so this entire plan of consolidation um, is, is quite important to Simmons um, from a kind of like long-term sustainability perspective. Now, I say that with some mixed feelings. I don't generally think that our private institutions should be counting on city rezonings from a financial perspective. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that, just sort of honestly and frankly, that Simmons um, and its sort of place in our educational ecosystem is, I think, an important like interest at play here in this project. Um, the project, you know, we've been, as was alluded to, working uh, with the team and going back and forth with them on a host of fronts over the whole past year or more. Um, a big thing for me that meant a lot in this project was that they doubled the percentage of the square footage that's being used for housing. Um, I think this board knows that my feeling is that uh, we really, in some ways, like when we evaluate each project as it comes to us, we're sometimes missing the trick of kind of what's the overall use breakdown and the fact that like, you know, we can get all this housing linkage money and if there's nowhere to build housing, it doesn't do us any good. So it meant a lot that they went from 10% of the square footage to 20% of the square footage of the um, project being housing. So it's doubled to 388 units. And they also committed to 20% being uh, on-site affordable units. Um, so you know that's important on the housing side. And as you know, 17 million in linkage, it's a substantial amount. Um, on transportation, uh, we made them redesign the site plan quite a number of times. Uh, Brookline Ave is a key corridor for the MBTA's future bus plans, and so having a bunch of curb cuts on it wasn't going to work for bicyclists, for buses, et cetera. Um, so they're really doing kind of all the internal motion of the site underground, like in that garage, and so there's kind of just one access um, point. Uh, it, they're also um, devoting, I, I've been asking everybody in the Fenway, because we've got this big Fenway transportation plan um, underway to devote five dollars a square foot to kind of helping us make that transportation plan a reality because the Fenway situation on transportation is so bad right now um, and uh, and they're doing that that's that's what the four million dollars is in addition to all the sort of project things 
Um, and I would say that we also push them to decrease the number of cars in that parking lot overall, because um, we really do want to see people walking to work in the Fenway and not having everybody drive in. Um, lab workforce development, uh, a big, another focus of mine. Um, there's both a space there and money for the fit out. And I think one of the things I, I mentioned in my comment letter that we're focused on is making sure that the way that that kind of cashes out actually kind of aligns with the strategic plan that um, uh, Chief Wynn is, is leading and kind of make sure that like it's really part of the city's overall push to have a joined up lab pipe, pipeline because that's the only way that the lab projects are um, really going to drive actual shared prosperity in Boston is if we have that serious workforce development pipeline um, in place. Uh, so those are you know a bunch of the big things that we worked on also activation inter internal and and, uh, and outdoor kind of public spaces amenities. For me, having the LMA be more of a all day, all season place is important. Um, right now, it's pretty dead after five o'clock, even though there's lots of people sort of beavering away in their labs. Um, and we do want to see kind of that more broad activation. Um, the big concern about this development, and you've heard it alluded to, is the question of shadow on the emerald necklace. Um, and uh, you know, I think it sounds like the board has them in an appendix, but it, the the basic gist is like. When you look at shadow, you don't necessarily look at December 21st shadows because the plants are um, all you know, dormant at that point and everything is super long. And you don't really look at summer because the sun's right overhead and so you don't see anything. And so the equinox like being alluded to is a big focus. Um, and the, you know, I think that if I had to quickly summarize the back and forth on the shadow, I would say the Skanska team's point, which you've heard today, has kind of been we're, this is, it's before 10 a.m., it's after 5 p.m., it's fast moving shadow, so not kind of dwelling on things. In fairness, this section of the emerald necklace um, is frequently shady. I walk through it often um, and, you know, just by the trees, et cetera. Um, and so the kind of contention on the team's point has been that the impacts here are not going to be um, substantial and negative. The arguments from park advocates um, in response have been that, you know, well, that building sh shadow is sort of different from tree sh shade, for instance, because it's like more enduring and kind of like continuous um, than, you know, a tree loses its leaves and so it doesn't, it doesn't have that same shade. Um, there's a lot of concern about kind of icing on the pathways. Obviously, the shoulder hours of the day are the days in which people commute by foot and by bicycle. Um, and then there was mention of the LMA interim guidelines, which I will say uh, didn't come to my attention until this fall. Um, but were a set of guidelines that the BBDA put into place back in 2003 that said no more than an hour of additional shadow on the emerald necklace. Um, and like, and basically, you guys never actually did the promised planning process that would have codified something into zoning. So this is one of these like guidelines that are sort of sitting out there um, from a while ago. And so, uh, which I will just say is another side frustration of mine, and obviously underscores the point of why we need like things to go past guidelines and actually be in zoning, be codified, be like really our rules that are on the books. Um, and that leads me to kind of like the big conversation around this project, which has been the idea that like we should not have to go to the barricades. Parks advocates shouldn't have to do it every time that there's something shadowing a park. Like developers should know what the kind of expectation is when it comes to like what's acceptable and what's not on shadow. If we want to be a city with a park every 10 minutes walk, like, we can't make it, there's absolutely no new shadow on parks, but we have to have kind of like binding rules that people can count on and that don't change project to project. Um, and so a big push from the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and tons of parks advocates has really been like, hey, we need, we need to actually like codify something. We can't be fighting this every time. And I think folks famously know that there's state law around shadow for the Boston Common public garden um, that we went back and forth on a few years ago, but that's only 2% of the parkland in the city and the rest of it doesn't have this kind of formal protection. Um, so I think a really like good and exciting thing that the um, project mitigation is proposing to do is to fund a, a serious study, but study isn't really the, quite the right word. What we really want is a study that results in a policy recommendation. Um, and from my perspective as the counselor for the Fenway, it's kind of important that that be a two-step thing where the initial focus is on the emerald necklace and the Fenway specifically because I think with the way that the Fens are kind of a linear park, we have a lot of places where these kinds of 
issues come up and a lot of other developments um, where it's being raised. And I think we really want to make sure that um, when we're talking about a project that affects the FENS, that we're looking at kind of a, um, a, a first cut as fast as we can, like serious analysis of how to have a working shadow policy, sunlight po policy for the FENS. Um, and I, I really appreciate that the BPEA commitment that's codified in the board memo is to really like taking the um, million dollars that Skanska would pay if this PDA were approved um, to like kind of immediately do that and have it done within a year. I will say that for me as a counselor, um, having that and then being able to have that guide conversations, including ADB conversations about this site is important. Um, and then I think that the goal would be to and this is something I'm I'm want to work with the board on is kind of like getting mitigation dollars together over the next year, citywide to make sure that then by 2024 we're doing the kind of what's the citywide application of that, um, so that we can really talk about having both a fence and then ultimately a citywide sunlight policy to kind of get us off these barricades. Um, I think one of the things that's got people have gone back and forth about is if we do that study now, you know, what's the impact on this project? So this is a PDA that the board's being asked to consider today at ADC. Obviously, there would need to be ADBs for the buildings. Um, we all know that zoning envelopes are not necessarily the buildings that get built in the long run. Um, and for me, as a counselor, I've therefore been kind of most focused on building one in the plan build out. Um, so that's why I, I'm, I am grateful. I, I did push in the last couple of days for the reduction that's been mentioned the further reduction of um, building one from 320 to 295 feet. And just so that folks know, that's um, 295 is the current tallest building in the LMA. So my feeling is that I, I, I actually think that this does need to consider to continue to get cut deeper than 295. But certainly, it seems to me that given all the issues at play and the proximity of the site to the park, the board shouldn't be um, supporting a zoning change that would have a building taller than the tallest building in the LMA. So that was kind of the basis on which we went back and forth, and the zoning envelopes come down to 295. And like I said, I, I'm really grateful for that. Um, so that's, I know, Madam Chair, that I, I've gone on for quite a while. Um, oh, the one other thing I forgot to say was that the $6 million for the park's maintenance, for the fans and the emerald necklace, um, I'm actually the uh, trustee on the $5 million one we have set up for the common. Um, and I will say that it's really enabling us to get to a lot of serious deferred maintenance. I think what's been interesting in this conversation is coming out kind of all the things that the Emerald Necklace needs. And specifically in that area, we've got a really like in disrepair Olmstead Bridge that's like right under this site, just to the north. Um, we've got a very steep grade that where we really need like some retention against erosion into the Muddy River. Um, we've just got a lot of investments that we've made that the federal government's made through the Army Corps of Engineers project that like are only going to last if we actually maintain them. Native plantings are really important, and us continuing to maintain those so we don't get a sort of resurgence of all the invasives that we've cleared away. Um, so there is a real need for kind of ongoing support of our parks, and that's true across the board. And it's obviously a city budget responsibility that I work on a lot, um, but it is something where I think like a six million dollar maintenance like trust set up the right way could really could really help us with those things. Um, so yeah, like I said, I've gone on at length. Um, that's just kind of to give the board a full sense of the picture from where I sit as a counselor. Um, in light of all these considerations, um, I, I am supporting um, the, uh, the application today. I think that, like I said, there's a lot still to be worked out in ADB, and we need to be really aggressive on that moving forward on this sunlight policy. Um, but I also you know, really recognize the need for, you know, there's a temporal thing here where Nothing at this site happens until the One Simmons project is built, and the One Simmons project um, isn't in a position to be built until um, the zoning hurdle is cleared. So, uh, thank you for your indulgence. Yes, um, no, thank you. Like, we really appreciate when you come. We read, I, I read all seven pages or however many pages you sent, right, from the letters and, and the color that you bring to this, I think is really important and is an important part of the, of the conversation and the dialogue that we have through um, through these you know, public hearings and, and everything. So, um, so no need to apologize. You are always welcome. Well, thank you. And um, really, like, thanks to all my constituents, too. I know you're going to hear a lot of folks on both sides. And I, I just want to say that, like, and, and I really mean this. And, and it's, always, it's always tough when you don't, you know, everybody's in different places on things. But like, 
the honestly like the the honor of being the counselor for the Fenway is how many people just care so intensely about this place um, and and have so much like depth of knowledge and experience and perspective. So um, we've been getting like lots of really thoughtful comments throughout this process and uh, and really just appreciate everybody who's who has weighed in and who I know is going to weigh in tonight. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Wack. Um, okay, so Secretary Polhemus, uh, I think we can, um, any further testimony? I see some raised hands, so. Yes, indeed. Just a reminder, we're taking testimony only on Longwood Place. We have uh, several other hearings late, later on, but right now we are only uh, taking testimony on Longwood Place. E. Smith, you can unmute yourself. E. Smith. If you're having difficulties, you can call 617-918-4254. Larry Norton, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Um, thanks so much, uh, Madam Chair, Director Jennison, and members of the board. I am uh, wholeheartedly agree with this project. Uh, the rendition looks incredible, and I hope the people of the Fenway area, I'm a lifelong city of Boston resident, and uh, I hope the people of the Fenway will agree with me that is uh, certainly an, an addition to the neighborhoods. The Skanskara Saki uh, development team are second to none, and I believe it will be uh, a beautiful addition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tim Horn, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Horn. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. I'm the current president of Fenway Civic Association. I live at 120 Street, and I've lived in the Fenway for 35 years. Um, Fenway Civic Association is widely uh, involved in public open space, whether it's the Lionsgate Rehab, which we got the first CPA funding for, the redoing of Symphony Park, the Burns statue, or the Boyd O'Reilly statue that's just been redone. Uh, we care very much about our open space. Um, we served on the uh, um, IMP for the Simmons University. Uh, in fact, three members of Fenway Civic served on the Simmons University um, uh, IMP. And we worked really hard to try to get this, this uh, on Simmons project going. And we testified in favor of it uh, many years ago, uh, before COVID, and for I think really the uh, Skanska was actually chosen. But um, we went and we testified. Um, and then we had a change of real estate person. And we didn't get a lot of back and forth, unfortunately, at that point, because it was COVID. Um, we're here, we were there to testify in support of Simmons when the zoning was changed from residential R3, R4 to Boston General Zoning. Um, and at the time, we expressed in our letter that we thought that really we should be getting at least 50% housing in deference to the real underlying zoning uh, that the community was giving up. Well, we gave that up. We got a project back that was 10%, and now it's 20%. Um, we have a shadow. That is the biggest problem that we face. Um, at this point, the project itself, on uh, every other respect, I think is there. I would love to see what the shadow studies are now, but until we can actually get the shadows into a shape where they do not create a precedent for other projects that are going to be coming forward, I think we need to table this one and, and just come back in a month and, and just let's see what happens. Um, I think it just takes a little bit more to make this a great project, the, uh, really the perfect project. Um, that's, I, I have to leave it there as my time's running out. There's so much more I can say about shadows and how we have an existing parklands ordinance that protects everything because you have to have a setback and building height is minimum or a maximum that's set so there's no more shadows. When you allow a building to be built behind it, it makes that ordinance moot. It means it's meaningless. Thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me testify tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Tom Ward, you can test it. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, how, how are you? It was a great right. presentation, and uh, it's a beautiful project that's going to come along. Uh, hopefully, I have a family member who is a senior at Simmons, and she's doing a great job. She's on the swim team, and 
That's a great area too, and I'm all for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Fukuda, you can unmute yourself. Hi, yes. Um, thanks to everybody, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Marie Fukuda. I'm a Fenway resident. And like others who will be testifying tonight, I'm a strong supporter of our institutional neighbors. I've served on several community institutional partnership bodies as well as on institutional master planning task forces. And I'd like to say we want to see some inscribe as partners and educators, but we have a greater desire to ensure that the project proposed to realize the one Simmons plan adheres to requirements laid out in LMA guidelines guidelines that reflect these public resources needed protections and that the BRA was charged with that responsibility. The guideline principles, they're listed as being in effect and implemented through Article 80. They are to enhance and protect the physical assets of the LMA, including its parks, with a specific restriction of new shadow impact on city park land. The guidelines say that in the interim period, which again is in effect, no project will be approved if it casts new shadow for more than one hour on March 21st on the Emerald Necklace, a standard that is far exceeded in the current proposal. Next, language in the filing that states that heights and shadow maximums within the proposal shall be unappealable upon approval of the plan directly contradicts some of the statements that these issues can be renegotiated in individual Article 80 review once the PDA is approved. Similarly, the funding of a future shadow policy that is not applicable to this project, as, writ as written in the filing, makes it challenging for anyone to understand how the project will continue to address these impacts through future filings. Um, in short, the impacts are large and concerning to a great number of residents and stakeholders who worked hard on the almost $90 million improvements made on the Mother River project. Um, I'd say the recent changes to Building 1 to reduce the height should be the start and not the end of exploring how the project can pursue shared goals of residents and the city while helping to realize the one Simmons plan and protecting our most important asset, our parks. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Greenow, you can unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Catherine Greenow. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to say um, that while I support uh, Simmons University's efforts uh, to consolidate their campus and grow, I don't think the university should have ever even considered uh, giving up their residential campus if that development would include shadows on our treasured emerald necklace. Um, that they were counting on a zoning change through the PDA as the BRA has handed out PDAs constantly, never, as far as I know, in the Fenway, never once turning a request by a developer for a PDA down. Uh, that Simmons' initial uh, efforts seem to be um, flawed. Um, also, they certainly would have been aware of the restriction of not more than one hour of shadows um, in the interim guidelines that were mentioned before. I also want to say that all of us here on this Zoom call, and uh, particularly uh, the members of the uh, BRA board are stewards um, have, of the work of Frederick Law Olmsted and the benefits of having parks and green space that he provided for us. Uh, we are under a fiduciary responsibility to continue. And I do not think that should easily uh, be um, ignored. Um, as I say, we need to carry out uh, the restrictions that are necessary in order for us to all enjoy uh, the parklands. Uh, even more alarming is the level three biolab, uh, which is proposed for the site. Um, it prevents severe dangers to the health and safety of local residents employees, patients, and, um, and students in the area. 
Uh, I think that it's going to be a very dangerous uh, uh, process. And um, although the common response is that the process of um, bio level three labs is highly regulated, um, it's regulated because it's dangerous. And uh, we do not need or want dangerous pathogens and viruses studied on site or delivered to the site. Um, I, th I think- Ma'am, I'm sorry, your time is up. We have a limit of two, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, Christopher Ryan, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Chris Ryan here, resident. Uh, I approve the project. I think it's gonna bring uh, great things to the Fenway area, and uh, thank you for your time tonight. Bye. Thank you. Kathy McBride, you can unmute yourself. Hi, this is Kathy. I've been in the Fenway for 35 years. I'm a homeowner, and I strongly object to this proposal for the reason that it would pass devastating shadows on the emerald necklace. There's been a lot of talk about the shadows and trying to diminish them. It's not, it, the LMA guidelines in 2003 were, were created by a large consortium, including Longwood Medical Area, Masco, all the hospitals, all the concerned abutters, citizens, citizens advocates groups, parks groups. This was a very thorough study with great science and it should be adhered to. It calls for a one hour max of new shadows and this exceeds it tremendously. Also opposed to the idea of mitigation um, coming first when the developer should propose a guideline, should propose a, a project that meets the existing guidelines. I think there's a path forward for everybody. If we can reduce the heights, reduce the, uh, there seems to be excessive amounts of public space on the ground level as well as a very large private park, which can be reduced. The heights can be reduced. The buildings can be squatter and shorter and everyone can win. We cannot allow the city to sell out our parks. Mitigation should not be the go-to. Mitigation is not heavier weight than the public's need to have the assets. We need to be the stewards, as someone else mentioned, and protect our assets. We've had the emerald necklace designed for 200 years for a reason. What's next? Uh, any other park is open to this. Franklin Park, there'll be development ongoing. We need to have sustainable, responsible development, and it is the responsibility of the BBTA to protect citizens' rights above private gain. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sean Lynn Jones, you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Sean Lynn Jones. I'm a town meeting member in Brookline, representing the area that includes a large section of Riverway Park. And I'm also vice president of the Brookline Green Space Alliance. There are a lot of good things about this uh, project. Uh, my mother went to Simmons, so how can I really oppose something that would benefit uh, Simmons University? But the shadows are a major problem. I'll try not to repeat what other people have said, but I want to make three major points. The 2003 guidelines were good then, they need it now too. There's been an increase in the number of people living and working in the Fenway LMA area and using the Emerald Necklace Parks. All levels of government have spent tens of millions of dollars to restore the Muddy River and the Emerald Necklace. But this project would put its shadows right on the areas that have received the most extensive restoration. And we also have learned a lot more about the health benefits of parks. Every week, it seems, there's a new study showing how just having green space and trees and being able to walk in a park helps mental and physical health. So let's reaffirm the 2003 guidelines, not reject them. Second, I want to emphasize that it is a serious problem if the shadows cover a large area and endure for an hour or two or three in the morning. That's when commuters use the Emerald Necklace. That's when people go running in the Emerald Necklace. That's when students are going to school on the pathways through the Emerald Necklace and over the bridges. It's not a minor problem, it's a big problem. 
Third, let's remember the Emerald Necklace is a regional resource. It exists in Boston and in Brookline and in, is used by people from many other communities. The shadows, particularly on the equinox days, are very severe on the Brookline side of the riverway in the Carlton Street footbridge area near the Longwood T station and the Chapel Short Street bridge over the river. I've heard nothing about those impacts. I've heard nothing about the need to mitigate those if we can't reduce the shadows. So for these reasons, I think we should not approve this project now. We should work a little bit harder and see what more we can do on both modifying and if we have to, mitigating the shadows uh, and their impacts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Mayna Perez. I'm here representing hundreds of my sisters and brothers that work in the city of Boston. I want to thank uh, the BPDA staff for conducting a very thorough and really good review. I also want to thank the Office of Mayor Michelle Wu for allowing the community to be part of the process and definitely the developer, the proponent, for going above and beyond on trying to accommodate all issues raised through the review process. Each building that is to be built it still has to go through rigorous review and more issues will come up and I am sure the developer is going to be accommodating uh, the needs of the community. What I want to say, Madam Chair, is that this project is of great importance for the entire city of Boston. We all know we are living in a very unusual housing crisis like never before. Boston is the third most expensive city to rent behind San Francisco and New York. As a proud Bostonian, I don't like to be behind any other city, but in this particular issue, I am glad we're behind those cities. For many years, we have asked universities to please build housing dormitories to free up the housing stock in the city. It is very important that we keep this in mind that times are completely different. With respect to the neighbors and the issue of the shadows, I think we're going to have a bigger issue. We have people sleeping in parks at this moment. If you have Boston Commons, Franklin Park, Malina Cass, this is going to get worse if we don't build more housing or we don't get the apartments we need. Uh, with all due respect, I ask the board to kindly consider voting on the affirmative on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Minor. Paul Sullivan, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Plumas, Director Jemison, Paul Sullivan, on behalf of the City Council at large, Michael Flaherty, understanding that the, the, the heights have been reduced, uh, the council to go on record in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Freddie um, Beakley, Bikley. Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I have a, a comment that fall into a couple of different categories, uh, basically the regulatory impacts and the use. Um, so I'll try to be concise. Uh, first of all, this project does belong under the LMA guidelines. And I remember working with the BRA of your and they and the institutions at the time were sensitive to how the continuous expansions um, were perceived by the public and how they impacted the area in reality. Um, and it was the result of this uh, that there was a plan, a welcome out, which was to have a green overlay that protects the historic parks, much like the parkway or the of the parkway. We were really grateful and relieved with the city's recognition at the time of what is most valuable and at risk and how to protect it. The guidelines include protecting the parks from excessive shadow from development. And the guidelines were placeholders, as, as was mentioned, to protect the green perimeters while the final LMA master plan was done, which of course it did not. Um, so because this did not happen, the interim guidelines still apply. And I don't believe that it's an arbitrary decision to apply them or not. They are on the books of the head of uh, our lady. We've not, not seen any renderings of the Skanska project that complies with these guidelines. In fact, we haven't seen much of any uh, renderings that do uh, um, address the shadows uh, at all, a very minor, by very minor effects. 
um, if the guidelines were adhered to, we wouldn't have this protracted, this protracted acrimony about having to make the development shadow damage palatable after the fact, which cannot be done. Any shadow impact money that, that does nothing to give us back our sunlight after it's gone. And the developer would not need to throw money at a citywide shadow study that will safely never happen to his project, like donating to a homeless shelter on the other side of town. The only shadow mitigation is to not make the shadow in the first place. Mitigation money needs to go to Brookline. Mitigation money needs to go to DCR, if this is the way uh, that the project is going. It should not just stop in Boston. It is a, uh, a national and, and uh, an area treasure, treasure, as the speaker from Brookline stated. So um, is there um, an agreement for mitigation to go to Brookline? I have that question. The other uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, your time is up. We have a two minute time. Andrew Hoare, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Um, thank you and thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Andy Hoare, president of CBRE Boston, a 40 year veteran of the commercial real estate industry in Boston. I speak tonight as a strong advocate for Longwood Center and for these fundamental reasons. First, for those of you that do not know, Skanska and the local development team have demonstrated time and again, they not only are among the gold standard in their industry, but they are also the ideal partner in a public and private process. They are a leader in the areas of DE&I and sustainable building practices, as Carolyn already mentioned, and, and really important in today's environment they have the balance sheet to survive and thrive in good times and bad. Most importantly, I would emphasize for all of us at the hearing tonight to really appreciate the true and positive impact of a $2 billion project on Boston. This transformational project will bring much needed amenities and community oriented retail to the neighborhood to support frontline medical workers, patients and local residents, new affordable and market rate housing, which is badly needed, new research office space and cross-disciplinary spaces to support Boston's life-saving innovation, programmed open space and interior community space. All of these improvements, which will benefit the residents of the area and the city. But most importantly, this project will secure Simmons's future. I believe that the benefits outweigh the limited impacts and I believe this project is worthy of moving forward. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, sir. Tom Yardley, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Director Jemison. Sorry, Th Tom. Th thank you, Director Jemison, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Secretary Polimus, for the opportunity to speak this evening in support of this project. Uh, my name is Tom Yardley. I am uh, Vice President for Area Planning and Development for the Longwood Collective, uh, formerly MASCO. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization representing 22 members in the Longwood area, including Harvard Medical School, five colleges, Fenway, and Simmons University. Um, I also served on the Brookline Avenue CAC. Um, I, I think it's important this evening, without uh, minimizing the uh, considerate commentary we've heard around shadow impacts, uh, not to overlook the significant benefits that actually the previous speaker uh, alluded to which are very significant for one of the nation's uh, preeminent academic medical centers as well. So while there are definitely shadow impacts and we would certainly not seek to minimize them, we, do not, we should not be losing sight of the significant benefits of this massive investment in the, in the district and in the city as a whole. Um, it's gonna redefine uh, the gateway to one of the world's leading academic research and healthcare centers. It's providing market rate and affordable housing and very importantly, very desperately needed research space, which is in close proximity to clinical space and the teaching spaces that make Longwood such a unique area. Um, I can see my time's coming sh short as well here, but there's a lot of other amenities as well, as well that uh, Skanska has been uh, extremely cognizant of in terms of investing in community-oriented storefronts, programmed open space, um, and most importantly as well for the health of Simmons University, it will help ensure the long-term viability of Simmons University. 
uh, allowing for completion of dormitory space, dining, athletics, et cetera, et cetera. And I also want to applaud the BPDA for a very robust public process that has resulted in significant changes to this project over a long, over a 12-month process that I think has been actually very receptive to comments uh, that have been provided by uh, the community at large. So I will stop. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to comment that we are very much strongly in support, and we submitted a letter with uh, co-signators from some other major institutions as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Martin O'Riordan, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I'll keep it short. Um, this is the only way that the long-term viability of Simmons University is going to be assured. Uh, this is a great project for them. ANSCA is the only entity that I know of that can pull this off. They are going to have to build a 12-story building on the Simmons campus and then start the development. The only reason they can do it is if they it out of pocket. And I'm sure you've all heard of uh, projects that can't get financing right now because of money so tight. Uh, that's the biggest thing. The second thing is this is probably the best location for lab space in Boston. And because of that, the value in going through with the tax rate will be substantial to the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Jared Dodge, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and board members. Really appreciate your time on the matter and your consideration in this project. Um, I've been a Fenway resident for about five years now, and I'm here to voice my support for uh, the project. Uh, I want to speak a little bit more from uh, an anecdotal standpoint. So, so my experience, rather than rehashing some of the uh, you know, more factual comments uh, uh, that were covered at large by the presentation. So you know, I, I want to start off by saying that naturally there will be objectors, but uh, I think this type of project really truly exemplifies why people choose city life. Um, and, then I, and then I also want to say that when, you know, when I go and travel to other, uh, to other parts of the city, uh, I go there for the experience that this type of project will provide, right? Um, the, it, it really is the essence of an entertainment and living ecosystem within a city. And I don't want to have to go outside of Fenway for entertainment, for dining, and, uh, and whatnot. I want to be able to do that all within the city. Are there other parts of the city are uh, self-sufficient in this, in this area? And I think Fenway is still on a path towards that. And uh, this, this project gets a little bit, us a little bit closer to that. Uh, Next, I just want to mention that, I, I, of course, I, I'm, I'm no arborist, and I don't know the calculus of shade and trees and how that affects uh, plant life, but I can speak experientially, and I'm, I'm truly surprised that, that there hasn't been more reference to other cities and urban developments in, in this sense, that I visited New York City and Central Park. I lived in Washington, D.C. for over a decade, and there are tall buildings in both of those cities, and adjacent to many of those tall buildings are very, very healthy ecosystems of nature and trees and plant life and animals. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the, the science will say on it, but I can, I can say that uh, speaking from, from my point of view and looking at other cities, this, uh, you know, the risk I think is, is a little bit overblown. Uh, lastly, you know, I want to I want to reinforce my um, support for the project based on a lot of the compromises that Skanska has made. Uh, that, go, that goes a long way in my book, and uh, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to share my thoughts and, and uh, support for the project. Thanks. Thank you, Katie Schuller Bleaky. You can unmute yourself. Um, I I want to speak about this because I am in a unique position to address um, some of these issues. 
First of all, I have been a longtime volunteer for the Emerald Lakes Conservancy. I uh, chaired their uh, annual fundraiser. Um, which raises um, about a million dollars a year for the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. And I have been a trustee of Simmons College for the past 10 years. Um, I, we at Simmons have been working on this project long before Skanska got involved. And I want to echo some of the comments that have been made about Skanska because we chose Skanska for all the things that people have already said. Their, their availability of um, funding this project, their sensitivity to their surroundings, and their ability to be a good team player, which I think they have demonstrated in their, in their changes and ability to be responsive to the local objections and understanding the needs of the people. I understand from the Inland Echoes prospect um, the shadowing problem. Um, I think that saying, following up on the, the previous um, speaker, there are lots of cities that have very tall buildings and their parks thrive and survive. And this project for Simmons is so key to our maintaining our availability to serve students, to house them on campus, which is part of the city's 2030 project to bring more people on campus and limit the um, time people are in outside housing. Please approve this project. It is amazingly important for Simmons and all the surrounding area. Thank you. Thank you. David Reed, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for the whole BTA board. I'll, I'll be brief because many of the um, topics have been covered, but basically this is a transformational project for this for area of the city. To connect, to be able to connect the Longwood Medical Area with the Fenway area and Kenmore Square is really significant. It offers an increase in open space, and ends, uh, you know, in accessibility to the parcel. Right now, this lot is basically a gated community with that uh, iron gate along Brookline Ave. It's gonna offer the ability to have wider sidewalks, protected bike lanes, um, and we've already heard about the reduction in parking and increase in housing, so I won't go into that. But basically, the pros far outweigh the cons. I understand the issues of the shadow, but I think it might be you know, overstated or overemphasized the impact of that. So I highly support this project and thank you very much. Thank you. Karen Jeromini, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, can you hear me? I can, yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Karen Jeromini, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Windsor School. I promise to be brief as Windsor has submitted a letter of support for this project. Windsor is a nonprofit private middle school and high school for girls with over 600 students and employees immediately abutting the Skanska site. We have been involved in review of proposed plans with Skanska for the last two years. Windsor strongly supports Skanska moving forward for approval of the Longwood Place uses in the PDA plan that is before you. We appreciate all the changes made to the plan over the last year to widen Pilgrim Road and to accommodate all service vehicles underground as well as the increased community open space. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Freeman, you can unmute yourself. Oops. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I've submitted written comments, which I hope will be shared. I have a few additions based on what I've heard tonight. I'd like to start by saying I echo um, Marie Fukuda, who made a lot of good points. Um, I appreciate that the proponents have reduced the height, but from what I understand of the guidelines, they're still three to four times the height of uh, the surrounding buildings. and. It just seems like um, like it's a good start, but it caught my attention that there's two and a half acres of open space on the property, and maybe there's some reworking that could reduce height. Not that I want to lose the private green space, but there just might be more room for compromise. Um, 
adding the housing, doubling the percent, I think they said, is certainly an admirable goal. I'm not sure it's Simmons number one um, goal for, for a project like this. So again, it's finding the balance and um, Oh, I had one other point. Oh, the whole, the all or nothing approach that Simmons can't survive without this project seems um, to use the word overstated that has come up tonight. It's like, let's keep talking and find something that really works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Wolf, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Steve, I can't hear you now. You must have muted yourself. Didn't do a thing, but I'll try again. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I live in the Fenway, which has been changing rapidly in recent years, and I've watched how the BPDA behaves for more than 30 years. And I have to say, not a pretty picture. You have never met a development you didn't like, and you've never met a zoning restriction that you couldn't dodge. It doesn't surprise me to find that you're ignoring your own guidelines for the LMA. Um, the height limit in particular of 150 feet, this almost doubles it at building A, even with the slight reduction in height. Uh, critically, I think this is really an issue, is ignoring the limit on the amount of new shadows a project can throw on these world-class parks that exit that wrap around the site. I'm not asking you to deny this this request. Uh, in fact, nobody who has spoken against or in, in opposition tonight has asked you to deny the request. And none of the 2,200 plus people who have signed the petition that we organize has asked that you do that. What we are asking is that you press the pause button, send the proponent back to the drawing board and bring the project into compliance with common sense guidelines that this agency itself threw up 20 years ago. I'm gonna say two quick other things. I'm sympathetic to Simmons's dilemma, but, but this is, people are not gonna like hearing this. One of, one of my closest friends is a Simmons graduate. And yet, what kind of precedent do we set when we sacrifice public park lands to protect an institution that can't find a formula the market will embrace. Is this really your job as a board to ensure the success of private educational institutions? I would argue that it's not. And my final point is that parks advocacy isn't just a bunch of privileged people concerned about aesthetics. Parks provide me mental health benefits, which has been alluded to tonight. They provide critical environmental services like flood control and cooling in the summertime. We need to take their help seriously if we're going to meet our climate sustainability and, and uh, carbon decarbonization goals for the city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Vincent Coyle, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. My name's uh, Vincent Coyle. I'm the business representative of the Iron Workers Local 7 of Boston. On behalf of the men and women of Iron Workers of Local 7, we look forward to seeing this project move forward. As a father, um, as an iron worker in the field, and as a representative, spending many days in the Longwood area, um, having having more amenity space and open space in that area will benefit everybody that lives and works in that vicinity. Simmons College needs this um, competitive market out there, and we'd love to have. We've had a great relationship with Simmons College and Skanska, and we'd like to see this project move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Gary Walker, you can unmute yourself. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, Director Jemison, Gary Walker, representing uh, electricians and technicians, Local 103. I'd like to speak in strong support. Um, Simmons, uh, Simmons University has been, as, as well as all of our institutions in the city have been um, wonderful supporters of the, of the men and the w women of the building trades. We would like to return uh, the favor by supporting them and thanking them for the jobs they create. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Rick Keogh, you can unmute yourself. 
Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of the board. Uh, Rick Keogh with the Sheet Metal Worker at Local 17. I'm one of the representatives. I'm here to represent them, my members of Boston and uh, the ones that work in Boston, actually live in Boston. Right. So I have a lot of family members that live in uh, Boston. And I'm just here to, uh, you know, Simmons College, like every one of our universities, like Gary said, they, 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 that's what makes Boston. The, the hospital districts and the universities are just so great. And Simmons is one of them. And also, Scances does, does such a great job. I just want to say uh, I hope this project moves forward and I approve of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Burns, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Secretary Bohemus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Director Jemison, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Michael Burns. I uh, just want to thank you, uh, the BPA, for the community process. Uh, we look forward to working on this project, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thanks, Mr. Burns. Matthew Impas Impastado. Hi, this is Matt Impastado. I'm a city Boston resident. Um, have been since um, 1997. Um, my wife uh, grew up in um, in the shadows um, that will be created by this building. Um, and my mother-in-law still lives there. My son um, attends Boston Latin School and um, walks, um, walks these paths um, back over to visit with his grandmother. Um, my wife is actually a Simmons grad. Um, I am a strong um, proponent of this project. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, um, but that I do notice, um, is that this project is going to regenerate um, an old connection that was there prior to Simmons building um, the campus that's there. Um, and they'll be rebuilding this connection um, adjacent to the property, I think, on the, the Windsor side, um, which will really connect the Longwood medical area to what I believe is the only um, non-maintenance facility that was built um, and designed within the park system. Um, it, the little like gazebo that's adjacent to the bridge. Um, there has been a lot of talk of shadows and I, I, I truly understand that, that there will be some additional shadows cast. And I don't wanna point at a, another building as a precedent to say, you know, one building has done it, so another should be able to. But I look at it more to, as an example of the health of the emerald necklace. If you look at the, the residential building that was built down by Jamaica Pond, you'll notice that the emerald necklace is, is thriving down in that area, and people are enjoying it within the shadow of the building that's cast down there. I think it's a 30-story building, probably similar in height to this proposal. So I'm a strong proponent. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. John Buxton, you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. My name is John Buxton. I'm board member on the Fenway Civic Association. And I ask you to please take very seriously the concerns that we expressed in a letter to the BPDA. First, um, when Skanska says, oh, we started taking consideration of what the public thought and of the neighbors thought. Skanska was aware that there was no way under the current regulations that they could build a building that cast a shadow on the Emerald Necks. They knew that that was the starting point. The BPDA, the BRA, is not a independent body which decides what the laws of the uh, Commonwealth and of the city will be. If you allow a shadow that violates your and the city um, requirements regarding shadow on the emerald necklace, you are saying apply to us and if we like the project, we'll approve it. That is not an acceptable method for dealing with the community. I appreciate a lot of things about the project, but the height of the building must come down. They knew from day one that they could not build this tall a building. And all I can say 
is Skanska, I like a lot of things that you have done on this, but you can't get around the fact that you are violating the initial and very important provision that you are casting a shadow on the emerald necklace and the BPDA or the BRA that built the West End at the expense of the neighbors will not legally be allowed to ignore those regulations. Please, BPDA, do not pretend that you are all powerful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Adam Schulman, you can unmute yourself. Adam Schulman. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much for putting the opportunity to speak here. My name is Adam Schulman. Uh, I'm speaking in support of the project. I'm a long time, but um, over 22, 23 years of the, of the Riverwood Square condominium building. And we are absolutely direct buyers to this project. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Riverwood Square Association. Um, I've been attending the IAG meetings. I've been attending all the public meetings. And I've been working with Skanska for the past um, year. Um, I believe the Skanska and students have been very, very uh, cooperative and professional um, the whole time. And they've listened to comments and suggestions. Um, and you know, being the immediate budding building that's going to have the biggest impacts of this project, um, they've developed a very positive, harmonious relationship with, with the board of trustees in my building, um, including having really good direct lines of communication with them and us during construction of this project, and it does want to construction. Um, I believe the project has evolved substantially since its initial concept, um, and I believe that this project will do what, it, what I think people know, which is going to be really invigorating this particular area of the LMA. And we need it back to together with the Fenway area. Um, they're doing a lot of positive things for this project, breaking up the super block, block creating new paths, um, new open space. Um, it's a good mix of uses. Um, and I think, um, as I mentioned, it will improve this area more than make it negative. It's going to certainly help students' college be positive. And overall, I think the similar impacts that people are talking about are a little bit um, a, a, a little overblown, um, or maybe worse than they, they think it will be a trade. Um, so I support the project and I think it should be improved and should be at this point move forward. Thank you. E. Smith, you can unmute yourself. E. Smith. If you're having difficulty, you can dial 617-918-4254. Sarah Naylor, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. My name is Sarah Naylor, and I am a resident of the Fenway. I'm a unit owner and a trustee at the same, excuse me, <coughs> waited a while, now I have to cough, um, at the complex um, that abuts called Riverway Square Condominium. And I have communicated with Scansa and its representatives, as Adam has uh, previously stated. And uh, we have expressed all the condo concerns, and they have been very responsive. They've set up some protocols with us to ensure minimal impact from the project. And we believe that this will improve the area um, of our condo units, including our condo units, and we support the project. Thank you. Cade Gennard, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Cade Gennard, resident, and I support this project and can't wait to see what it brings to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pamela Jorgensen, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Pam Jorgensen. I'm the current president of the Fenway Victory Gardens. I have two points to make, actually three. I want to say that I completely support what Tim Horn and Marie Pakuda said earlier. I want to ask the question, um, there's been a proposed shadow study 
will the results of that shadow study apply to this project? Because it seems to me that what we're asking here is to open the, open the barn door, let all the horses out, and then study how we should manage the barn door. Um, and so that's my main concern. I would definitely support this project if it were within the um, parameters of the shadow studies and the shadow recommendations and everything else. I'm not saying I don't support the project. I'm saying that the shadows, which no one here has claimed any expertise on, are a major in What happened? Forward. I'm sorry, did you not hear me? No, keep going, keep going. Okay. I heard somebody speak. Okay. Yeah, I think it was just a mute thing, new mute button, okay. but we, um, yes. So my, I, the question I really like to have answered is, if the shadow study is done, will this project be subject to it? Is there anyone here who can answer that question? So this is just for, for public, this is just for, for testimony that we've taken, taken note of your question, um, so, but it's not a back and, back and forth one. Okay, and the final point I'd like to make is to what extent this creates a precedent. The idea of buildings shadowing the Fenway Victory Gardens would basically eliminate the growing of tomatoes and other fruits and vegetables in the Victory Gardens. And I would hate to see that happen, and I think the entire city would hate to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you. So if anybody's having difficulty unmuting themselves, I've got a different phone number for you to call. It is 617, no, actually I'm being told no, not to, okay, the phone number is fixed, so the phone number we've been using is correct, I apologize. Um, a lot of moving pieces here this evening. Um, Kelly, brilliant, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Secretary Paul Hamas, um, and I wanna thank Director Jemison for tonight. Um, just a brief point of process, it might be helpful if you could just give us like the two ahead of us so we're a little bit more prepared. Um, I want to say that on behalf of the 21 cultural and academic institutions of the Fenway Alliance, we fully support this Longwood project. Um, we believe the benefits far exceed the drawbacks. And um, we, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. That's, yeah. a, that's another scary moment. So if you could just tell people you can hear them, it might help. Um, we believe the benefits far outseed uh, um, drawbacks on this project. We've heard about some of the um, linkage benefits, and we, we applaud those, um, the jobs, the city housing fund. We really like the work they did with our Fenway Alliance member, Windsor School, to make sure the traffic mitigation plan was in place. Uh, we like that part of it. and. Uh, you know, I know some of my really esteemed parts colleagues, and I mean this quite sincerely, don't, um, don't necessarily agree with me, but I think $7 million to Parks and Rec is significant for the city of Boston, and we, I really like that, we like that, and we think it will do good things for our park system. The $1 million shadow study is really needed, and we applaud that effort and all the advocates who, who um, you know, advocated for that. And mostly the biggest benefit we see is to allow Simmons University to sustain, to remain, and to grow. This is one of the preeminent uh, universities in the country educating women leaders. We need that. We need that in this country. We need this in mass, and we need it in the state. So we want to um, stand fully behind this effort to make sure that Simmons can thrive in their mission going forward. Um, and I would, I, we look forward to seeing a shadow strategy for the entire city of Boston. On behalf of the Alliance, I thank everyone for my time. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And I will take, take your advice and let the next few people know um, who's on deck. So Liz Obell, I'm gonna take you next. Dolores Bugdanian, you're after um, her. And then Claire Ramsbottom, you're after that. Go, go ahead, Dolores. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Dolores Bookdanian. I live at 452 Park Drive, which is within blocks of this project. And I'm closer still to the Emerald Necklace Park, for which I am extremely grateful. It is now one of the few remaining places in my neighborhood where there is open sky and sunlight and a place where nature still reigns. I am really, really disappointed that we're in a position right now of saying how benefits far out we outweigh and exceed the drawbacks. Uh, this project could be and is, it has wonderful aspects to it, but the fact that we've got to 
reject it because of the impacts on our park is really, really frustrating. And I am really disappointed that the BPDA staff has presented this for your approval with this aspect unaddressed. And if you have not had a chance to look at the study, you should, because all morning in the fall and in the in the in the in the spring, there is significant shadow on the park. This is a it's called a necklace because it's a narrow a narrow st uh, stretch of park. Central Park is 843 acres. You know, there's no comparison between a park like that and the emerald necklace that we have in the Fenway. We are, we're a tiny city, and these parks are precious to us. And to, in response to one of the questions that was raised earlier, any regulation, legislation, guideline, planning study, or the like, not in effect as of the date of this development plan is adopted, shall not have any effect on the right of this project to cast the maximum shadows as analyzed in this development plan and, it, and its appendices, nor shall there be any further mitigation required. So no, no future policy is going to affect this project. And once these shadows are in effect, as someone said earlier, they're never going to go away. And it'll just be precedent for saying, well, they did it, why can't we? So I am so disappointed that this is the position that we're in. It's, it's foolish. The height and the shadow impacts probably don't take into account the HVAC and roof structures that are going on these buildings, which will be significant because they're labs. And please don't approve a bio-level three lab explicitly in this, in this project. That's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, and I'm so again disappointed that they threw that in to turn this project into something that we cannot fully support. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Claire Ramsbottom, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire Ramsbottom. I'm the executive director of the Colleges of the Fenway, and I'm representing Wentworth Institute of Technology, Emanuel College, Mass College of Art and Design, Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and Simmons University. We stand in support of the approval of the PDA development plan submitted by Skanska. We thank Skanska and Simmons for all the creative energy they put into this project, years of creative energy, and their collaborative approach to securing the future of Simmons and addressing the key issues for the LMA and the city. This transformational project will bring much needed amenities and community oriented retail to the neighborhood to support our 12,000 students and over 700 faculty and staff. Our institutions provide research, community service, cultural opportunities, and prestige to the LMA and the Fenway neighborhoods. This project will provide open space for them, places to eat and shop, develop leadership skills, and interact with the community. And it continues the engaging development that is increasing the vitality of the area. The colleges of the Re Fenway represent small mission-driven and tuition-dependent institutions, critical in the diversity of our city's precious and unique higher education community. This project is good for our five colleges because what is good for one of us is good for all of us, and our institutions serve a critical need in the city. Most importantly, as you've heard, the project will secure Simmons' future. Simmons is unique in its mission, and its mission is critical to the education of future women. And our future women leaders are vital to the future of both our city, our state, and our country. I urge the PDA, PPDA to move this project forward to the next phase. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Elena Supporter, you're next. But Michael Mancello, you will be after her. And Karen Monty Brodek, you'll be after Michael. Elena, you could unmute yourself. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm Elena Supporta. I represent the Boston Society of Landscape Architects for the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. And I'm a proud, proud signer of the Protect the Emerald Necklace Parks, Please Don't Take Our Sunlight Away petition. It is currently circulating and it has gathered an impressive 2,202 signature tiers as of today at noon. The petition calls for the developers in the Longwood Medical Area to adhere to the LMA guidelines. The BRA created the guidelines to provide protection to the parks in the district, namely Jocelyn Park, 
Evans Way Park, and the Emerald Necklace. The guidelines call for nominal building heights of 75 to 150 feet and specify that no project will be approved if it casts any new shadows for more than one hour on the Emerald Necklace. It is important to note that on March 21st, um, the shadows cast on the Emerald Necklace by the Longwood uh, Place project is currently proposed fall between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. on the Riverway, and then again uh, between the hours of 4.30 p.m. and 7.15 p.m. on the Back Bay Fence. These times correspond directly with the morning and evening commutes. I, I sent a video out earlier, which um, I, I hope that you'll be able to view. It's a, it's a, uh, um, a slowed down version of the moving shadow study. And, and you can see that when the shadows are hitting the necklace, and it's up to, it's, in some places, it's more than two hours of additional new shadow on the, uh, on the necklace. Those of us who live in the Boston area owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, for creating the Emerald Necklace Park System, a national register, historic register site. Let us continue to honor Olmsted's amazing legacy and provide the utmost protection for this amazing landscape. I urge the board to spend more time and the proponents to spend more time considering the impact of 305 Brooklyn Ave proposal before granting final approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Mincello, you can unmute yourself. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director, and members of the board. I'm Michael Minicello, uh, General Manager of Time Out Market in the Fenway. Uh, first off, I've been listening to, to this meeting, uh, actually since 3.30, I've been listening in, and I have to commend the board for the P3 project in Roxbury. I drive past that area every day. And you know it's 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 uh, pleasant to see the development that's happening in the city and how we're moving forward to make it a better place to live, work, and uh, spend our, all our free time. The area developed that we're looking to develop, Skanska, has really been a strong, strong community partner on this program. I've uh, seen it firsthand that they've made adjustments. You know, there's been asked for parking, more residential, traffic flow, bike lanes, all heard, all adjusted, and that includes shadowing. I'm confident, I've worked with a lot of developers throughout the city, and I can tell you that I've witnessed many, many false promises and developers that haven't taken community first and worked hand in hand with the communities. I've witnessed Skanska, they've been a strong community partner and they've, they've listened and made very strict adjustments to all this project from day one. I'm confident they will continue to do that. I support this, and I uh, just request that the board vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Monty Brodek, you can unmute yourself. Um, following Karen, Chad, Chad and Green, Lorraine F., and Catherine, um, Dave Putat, I'm not sure how I did, sorry. Hi, Karen Money Burdick, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Director Jemison, uh, the board, commission, and the BPDA staff. My name is Karen Money Burdick. I'm president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, a nonprofit that supports um, the Emerald Necklace, uh, the Olmsted designed Emerald Necklace. Uh, which is a 1,100-acre resource, uh, and we work every day to support the public parks with the City of Boston, DCR, Brookline, and residents uh, who volunteer and work with us every day. We support the Public Visitor Center uh, and also provide the only public restroom in this section of the Emerald Necklace. Um, this is a very important conversation, and I appreciate the time and energies of the staff and all the others that have worked on this project. Um, the Conservancy has submitted two letters on this project, one objecting to the impact and the shadow of this particular proposal, and one pointing to the, the long overdue need for management and protection of all of our public spaces in Boston, not just the Emerald Necklace. The Emerald Necklace 
It is a lot of Boston's public space. We are half of Boston's public space, um, but it's certainly not all of it. And we do not have uh, policies systematically, and we have done this on a case-by-case -case basis in many uh, situations citywide. Many of you have, have seen them and heard them, and it is not working. It is unfortunate that the board was not shown the shadow diagrams at this hearing because there is a real need to understand how this project not only affects um, the only permanently and publicly fully deeded public space that's being discussed today. The open space that provided in the project is great, but it is not permanently deeded public open space, which the Emerald Necklace is. It is truly a public good. Today, the city of Boston, the Commonwealth, this agency and others have not provided laws, rules, or limitations specific to sunlight and managing sunlight on 98% of the parks in Boston. This is not the case in other cities. We believe that it is possible to do a project that is lower, that has less shadow, and these are trade-offs. These are trade-offs that this project is building a lot of new open space, not permanent, like the Emerald Necklace, uh, on the site, and they are building higher and not using that space. They are making choices, and we are all making choices with this project. If the city chooses to leave, we must develop the sunshine protection policy, not just a study, and not just something for the Emerald Necklace. We cannot continue to perpetuate the system of winners and losers, parks without protection, and parks with. Not all parks have a friends group. We must protect all city parks. Because this project is- I'm sorry, Karen, outside, Karen, your time oh, is up. Okay. Because this project is outside the area that our city parks department can work uh, or comment on, it falls outside that review. Um, thank you, I, thank you, thank you very much for your for your comments. We do have to to be respectful to to the two minute limit. Thank you, Chad and Green. You can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, my name is Shaton Green. I'm a Boston resident. I'm also uh, the business agent for the Boston Building Trade Unions. I want to um, say thank you for this process. It's a very thorough process. Uh, so thank you to the BPTA. Um, I'm in strong support of this project. Uh, Skensa has been a great partner. I also appreciate the jobs that this this project will create, and also um, the housing. Our resident, I mean, everybody in the city needs more housing, and I just appreciate just seeing that happen. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Lorraine F., you can unmute yourself. Good evening, my name is Lorraine Folks, and I'm very much in support of the residents who live right next to, the abutters who live right next to this, these buildings that are going to be built. I also support Simmons College, and I know what they're trying to do. I have friends and relatives who have graduated from Simmons. However, um, what I cannot understand is why anyone would be proposing to put a bio-level BSL three or four in a residential area when considering what BSLs are, BSL safety levels are for three or four. These are pathogen facilities, pathogen study facilities. Research is done as considered dual use. Dual use means it can be used for bioweapons. The NIH and the uh, NIAID and the uh, CDCs all have categories. There's a federal special agents, a federal select agents program of everything that would be studied in the BSL 3 and 4 and BSL 3, 3s and 4s. Rather. What I don't understand is why nobody is explaining to any of the residents in Boston why no one is explaining to any of the ZBA commissioners and why nobody's explaining to any of the uh, BRA or BPDA, BPDA agency people what the differences are in the levels. The reason for is you all live, you all are going to live here as well. Your families are going to live here. We've lived through a containment. We've lived through 
a potential pandemic pathogen um, circulation. We don't want to have another shutdown. You don't want something like that right next to, right next door to people who have to come and go freely, who live and work and pray and work and study and, and enjoy themselves in the neighborhoods, in the city. Nothing like this should be happening in the city at all. No threes or fours in the cities of Boston, city of Boston, in the neighborhoods of Boston. Please stop doing that. And please extend this to pass more than the, the, the speaking time to pass to three minutes instead of two minutes. You can hardly get out what you're going to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Catherine Deputat, you can unmute yourself. I actually need to make you a panelist. So you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. I am a long-time Boston resident, 29 years, and uh, I cannot, uh, well, I want to just say that the word chatter is being thrown around a lot, so it's a lot of people. Catherine, we're having a hard time hearing you. Could, could you speak up a little bit or speak closer to the microphone? Thank you, thank you. Derek Hobson, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Derek Hobson. I'm a lifetime resident of the city of Boston and frequent visitor to the Fenway area. I believe that this project will benefit that area. Uh, over 300 affordable rental uh, units is, is awesome. Uh, 10,000 jobs with 5,000 being permanent, the city needs that. So I ask that you support, that you uh, allow this project to move to the next phase. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dennis Ambrose, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, um, good evening, Madam Chairman. Um, board and all uh, participating uh, attendees of this uh, session. 
Um, <clears throat> I, uh, my name is Dennis Ambrose, and I'm a lifetime uh, resident of Boston, and <clears throat> frequent that very neighborhood, <clears throat> that very area, um, and I have a very personal um, relationship to it. For my aunt, um, <clears throat> Betty Rollins was uh, a, uh, a longtime uh, faculty, um, dean of discipline for years, so I have a connection as far as the growth of our, uh, uh, the raising of, of family. Um, <clears throat> also, um, I'm in support of it because of uh, Boston being the city that it is. And yes, there's no doubt that there are um, cons as far as uh, green space, shadow, um, <clears throat> but you have to understand Boston is a small city, but it, it, it's, it's probably still the, the fastest and, 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 and biggest growing city. So there is no real way around that. Um, I'm a long time uh, member of the union, Copney Union, also represented. And, and I have a personal connection with Skinster dating back almost 20 years now. So I'm a supporter of who you have as far as uh, taking on this, um, this, uh, this project. And um, we also have to look at uh, Boston, not just growing as a city, but we also have to look at uh, <clears throat> the uh, the, the other uh, residents and people who work in Boston. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at the pros and the cons, this is what is expected with growth. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dennis. I r really appreciate it. I'm just trying to keep everyone to the two minute limit, but we, um, we, we heard your statement. I appreciate you. Uh, full support. Thank you and good evening. Cheers. Thank you. E. Smith, you can unmute yourself. E. Smith. Okay. Does anybody else want to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. A. Madison, you can unmute yourself. Hello, thank you. I heard the term long-term viability used quite a bit tonight, and I would like to ask you to look at the long-term viability of Riverway Park. This is a most narrow, sensitive section of the Emerald Necklace. We know the necklace is a significant historic parkland, but this section of the park especially will react to the increased shadow that this scope of project will bring. So before you approve this scope of project, please consider the park experience, the plant health and path conditions, ice removal, etc. And while mitigation does not make up for park health, park preservation, park enhancement, please be fair. You talk about community process, but a great deal of the new shadow will fall in Brookline. Take this into consideration. Take time to look at what you need to do. What One of the lessons of the Emerald Necklace is that, that we share community. We don't have town lines stop at the park. We have town lines through the middle of the park. We share with the state at Boston and Brookline the responsibility for the Emerald Necklace. The mitigation you're giving to Boston Parks Department in effect proves that you see that there's going to be negative impact on Boston Park and on, on the Emerald Necklace that negative impact will be on Brookline Parkland as well. So how can you approve this now when you haven't 
given consideration to what the impact will be in Brookline. So please act as stewards of the park as well as stewards of um, Boston and realize that maybe the park is adding to Boston in a way that makes Boston significant and a world-class city. Thank you. Thank you. E. Smith, you keep raising your hand, so I'm not sure if you're having difficulty unmuting or if there's a problem with the hand raising. But if you do want to testify, um, I've given you the number before, but again, it's 617-918-4254. Uh, Does anybody else want to testify about this project? Dolores, we're only taking testimony once um, for, for people. Anybody else? OK, Madam. Right. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Secretary Pohemis. And so uh, so here's, here's going to be our next step. So we do still have, uh, do we have written testimony? That needs yeah, to be we do, Madam Chair. I'm going to hold on that for just a second. Um, so, um, because I do know that <laughs> a, a lot of you have been listening for, for a while. So, um, I want to, um, first of all, thank you, um, for, for your participation, uh, today and throughout the process. Um, there are a few items and again, we'll, we'll clarify this after we read the written testimony, but I just want to kind of give, um, put some of these markers in, in place. And so we can line up the right people to, you know, to answer these questions. So there's a few items I want to get clarification uh, on that they came up during the, um, the, the testimony um, to make sure that we have the, um, you know, uh, the right, you know, the right facts and, and uh, prior to making our individual votes. Um, so there were the topic of biosafety levels and um, uh, particularly concern about biosafety level three. Um, so I just want to, uh, to clarify that. Um, also reiterate and um, clarify the process of what, what this vote means, which is um, I think super, you know, super important um, on you know, what we're approving here today, PDA, and then also um, the individual projects, right? And how that process works for everybody. Um, and uh, and uh, again, have the, um, uh, some more detail on the, um, the shadow impacts um, and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, and you know, I do want to confirm as well that um, all board members uh, have received all of this information, including the, shadows, the shadow studies that were in the reference in the appendix um, with sufficient time. Uh, including your comment letters, uh, petitions, all the way up into emails that were uh, that are being sent um, right now, right? So those will be read into the record, um, and uh, and that's why <laughs> they're read into the record because we you know don't have time. We're in the meeting to to actually read the ones that you recently sent. So um, so that is going to um, get done. Um, and that, uh, you know, this isn't the first time either that the board members have uh, been made aware of this. Um, you know, this isn't the first time we're seeing this project. Uh, we, like many, like all the members of, of the agency who are working on this project, have been working on it for, you know, for many months. Um, and, uh, and so with, uh, with that, um, I, I think I'll also say uh, that, um, you know, but there's a reason why this, uh, this board is as diverse as it is, um, because we get difficult, you know, difficult decisions. We have difficult decisions to make, right? And, um, and the diversity, I think, is what brings, uh, what brings, you know, what makes this board what it is, you know, you have a, you know, a career auditor and me, a real estate professional, a labor representative, and, you know, one of the finest professors of architecture um, and, and urban, you know, policy and planning and design. So I, I do want to, to say that, um, not, not to be combative, but just to make you understand that, like, we do take this seriously. And, and, and our responsibility as stewards, as well as our fiduciary responsibilities and, and all of that. So again, I want to thank you for your participation. There is still a lot of process to be had, 
Um, but I just felt that was important just to kind of set the stage. So we will um, be attacking, or not attacking, addressing, <laughs> addressing those, those three comment areas because I think those were really important um, concerns that you raised during the comment period. So biosafety levels, uh, what this vote means, and then some additional um, uh, some additional information on the shadow studies and impacts uh, and things like that to follow. So um, with that, let's go ahead and start uh, Sarah uh, to read the uh, the emails. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we do have a few to get through, so um, bear with me. But um, so our first email uh, is from Letitia De Brantes. Dear board members, I apologize for not being able to attend the board meeting. However, I think it's important to voice my support, so I would really appreciate if you could read my testimony below. I'm Letitia DeBrantes, a graduate of Northeastern University and a former resident of Fenway. I write in support of Skanska's proposal for the Longwood Place project located at 305 Brookline Avenue. I was drawn to the Fenway for its diverse offerings and the vibrancy one would enjoy in a city. I loved walking through the Emerald Necklace parks to go to my classes every day. I have observed the changes in Fenway over the years when I lived there and how Fenway became a modern and attractive neighborhood with all the new amenities, additional housing, retail stores, and restaurants. Fenway is a neighborhood that is no longer defined by Fenway Park. It has become a safe and lively neighborhood that's attractive to young professionals, students and residents, a place to live, work, and play. I support good development like the Longwood Place project that creates a new place for people to gather and will bring much needed amenities and community oriented retail to the LMA. This project will deliver new housing, publicly accessible open space, jobs to the LMA and Fenway and secure Simmons future. This development is a great opportunity for the LMA and the Fenway neighborhood and I fully support it. Thank you for the opportunity to submit my comment. Um, the next letter is from Dan Deutsch, the Executive Director of Temple Israel of Boston. Dear Ms. Black, this letter is to express Temple Israel of Boston's support for the Longwood Place project and our appreciation for the BPDA and the thorough public process that has helped shape what will be a transformative development for the Longwood area. This, the project offers a chance to address numerous needs at once, including the continued growth and viability of Simmons University, the current lack of amenities in the neighborhood to support our frontline medical workers and many thousands of patients and visitors, and the essential need for research, office space, and cross-disciplinary spaces to support Boston's life-saving innovation. Additionally, this project will address the need for programmed open space and gathering areas, the demand for housing and community-oriented storefronts, and the reimagining of Brookline Avenue from a cut through arterial to a year round public space supporting those traveling by all modes of transportation. We are particularly excited for the additional outdoor space and connection between the Emerald Necklace and the LMA. We also appreciate the proponent's commitment to fostering diverse on site retail offerings that will prioritize small, local MBE and or WBE retailers and will be accommodating for patrons of varying socioeconomic statuses. During an extensive review process lasting almost 18 months, the proponent has accommodated changes requested by abutting Longwood institutions and the local community. This includes a reduction in project density, three comprehensive redesigns of the site plan and programmatic changes that significantly increase the number of residential units, including 20% affordable units, providing much needed housing within walking distance of Longwood jobs. For these reasons, and consistent with statements and letters provided by Longwood Collective, formerly MASCO, we are in support of this project. Um, this next letter is from Molly Honan De Lorenzo. Dear BRA Board, attention Sarah Black. On behalf of Emanuel College and as a member of the Impact Advisory Group for the Longwood Place Project, I am writing in support of the plan to redevelop the Simmons University campus at 305 Brookline Avenue. As an abutting neighbor to this proposed project, we have followed with interest the various stages of this approval process. We believe this redevelopment, including research laboratories, retail, restaurants, and enhanced green space, will provide excellent amenities for the Emanuel College community. Our students in particular will benefit along with the entire neighborhood. Overall, the project will extend the vibrancy created in the Fenway area over the past decade into Longwood. Additionally, the developers have proposed many adjustments to ensure this mixed use complex adheres to the needs of residents in the neighborhood. The next letter is from Caitlin Maloney. Dear Ms. Black, I am emailing to share my statement of support for the One Simmons project in advance of the BPDA meeting next week on January 19th. 
I plan to attend the meeting to make this statement, but there is a chance that a scheduling conflict will prevent me from being there. If I am unable to attend, I request that the attached statement be read into the public record. Thank you. And I'm realizing actually we don't have the attached statement. Um, I will try to circle that back and I will add it at the end if I can. Um, our next letter is from Jennifer Riley to the BRA board. I am writing to strongly urge the Boston Planning and Development Agency to reject the proposal currently before it to develop the six acre property at 305 Brookline Ave. The five building proposal would not just damage the tree canopy and wildlife in the section of the Emerald Necklace, but also the humans who depend on this green space. Such green spaces are crucial to heat abatement, flood control and carbon sequestration in our largely paved city and in our rapidly warming world. If anything, we urgently need more such open spaces Contemplating selling off the few that we have is madness. Please follow your own 2003 guidelines for LMA development. The people of Boston deserve a strong defense of the Emerald Necklace, our future sustainability, and the future survival of a livable Boston. Um, the next letter is from the Fenway CDC um, Community Development Corporation. Dear Ms. Black, um, Fenway Community Development Corporation, Fenway CDC, is a 49-year-old community-based nonprofit organization that builds and preserves affordable housing and promotes projects that engage our full community in, enhan in enhancing the neighborhood's diversity and vitality. I am a member of the Impact Advisory Group for the Longwood Place Project. I'm sorry I couldn't be at tonight's meeting, so I'm requesting the BPDA to read the support letter at the public meeting. I would like to reiterate my comments at earlier IAG meetings. Previously, I have openly criticized the BPDA for overall lack of planning for all of the lab development proposals, with particular regard to the need for a housing plan and a transportation plan. I have also criticized Skanska for insufficient housing in earlier versions of their proposal. However, I have come to recognize and appreciate the hard work Skanska has done to incorporate the feedback over all those meetings from the stakeholders, the city, and community. I also understand that there has been a lot of push and pull over the last two years, and the design of the site has changed a lot for the better. I particularly want to thank Skanska for doubling the amount of net new residential units, something the city so desperately needs. They have also increased the uh, inclusionary development policy affordable units from 13% required to 20%. This sets an example for the future developments of the Fenway area. Overall, the Longwood Place project will deliver great benefits and provide the following that would contribute to the Fenway Urban Village vision. 388 residential units with 20% affordability that promotes diversity and equal opportunities. 2.8 acres of publicly accessible open space that provides vibrant public gathering places and arts and cultural activities. All parking below grade and estimated $24 million investment to public realm improvements and infrastructure improvements on and around the site to optimize all methods of transportation to promote universal access and 15,000 square feet of indoor community space, including 10,000 square feet of workforce training hub to provide employment opportunities for Fenway residents. Um, and I see I'm at my two minute mark there, so I'm gonna keep moving on to my next letter. Thank you. And I'm actually gonna circle back to the attachment that we did not have from the previous statement. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that now. Um, so dear Ms. Black, my name is Caitlin Maloney and as a graduate of Simmons University, a former resident of the Longwood area and a concerned citizen, I would like to voice my support for the PDA proposal for Longwood Place on the Simmons residence campus. As someone who spent four years at Simmons, who lived on the residence campus, I realize how special a location it is. It was a retreat from the busy times I had as a student. The secluded nature of the space also made um, it easy to forget that we were in the middle of the Longwood area, likely because it contributed very little to the public realm in a vital neighborhood of Boston. It was not a welcoming place for the LMA or Fenway communities and did not foster connections or community between students and the neighborhood we live in. In partnering with Skanska, Simmons has found a developer who has taken the needs of an ever evolving community into consideration when developing the Longwood place. It allows for public gatherings and outdoor spaces, provides much needed affordable housing and workspaces for the critical work being done in the area. My time at Simmons was transformative for me. I received a scholarship which made college financially attainable and provided me with the platform to launch a life better than I ever dreamed here in Boston, all without debt. It was a place where I was able to explore a broad array of academic disciplines, develop meaningful relationships with peers and professors, and bring my full self to the classroom and community and celebrate others who did the same. Simmons changed my trajectory and prepared me to make a meaningful impact on the world. 
Now, almost four years later, the experiences I had at Simmons continue to shape my contributions at work and my graduate program, and my confidence navigating a constantly changing world. It is for all these reasons, and for the thousands of other students and alumni, the thousands of future students that this project must be approved. Simmons is one of a dying breed of historic women's institutions in the country. There are only 30 left. The one Simmons plan was developed to ensure the success of my alma mater and to allow many future generations of women to become leaders, find their voices, and promote social justice. Thank you for your consideration of this critical project. Um, the next letter is from Sarah Palmas um, from Windsor. Dear Director Jemison, the Windsor School is pleased to provide this letter of support to the Boston Planning and Development Agency for the request of SCD Pilgrim Road Master Planner LLC, Skanska, for, B for BPDA approval of one, the designation of the Simmons College residential campus as a planned development area, and two, the development plan for the Longwood Place project to be created at the project site. As you know, the project site is located directly adjacent to the Windsor, Cam Windsor School campus, and the two properties each abut a pedestrian pathway located on privately owned land and formerly known as Short Street. Thus, the Windsor School has a keen interest in the future development of the project site. We fully understand and support the efforts of our educational institution neighbor and collaborator, Simmons University, to enhance their ability to serve their students with modern, state-of-the-art facilities and replace obsolete facilities like the existing residential campus. We have engaged in a months long dialogue with the proponent about matters of concern to the Windsor School with respect to the project, including the density of the project, the heights of some of the proposed buildings as they relate to our campus, the proposed life science uses, the first and first and foremost, the traffic and circulation impacts the project would have on all persons and vehicles traversing the area, and most importantly, the safety of our young students as well as our faculty and staff. We appreciate Skanska's willingness to engage in, a meaningful and product, in meaningful and productive conversations with us to work through many of our concerns. The project as described in the revised development plan as presented by Skanska reflects less density as compared to the development plan filed with the BPDA in January 2022. More generous building setbacks from the former Short Street and thus the Windsor campus, the restriction of underground parking access to the new mid-block street to be constructed between Pilgrim Road and Brookline Avenue, the provisions for underground service and loading accommodations, continued focus on the proposed widening of and other improvements to Pilgrim Road, particularly at its intersection near the Windsor School and other traffic transportation system and streetscape improvements. The Windsor School support is extended for the uses outlined in Exhibit M. I'm seeing that my time is up. I'm going to move to the next letter. Um, the next letter is from uh, Susan Labandabar. Dear Sarah, were you as shocked as I was when you learned that James Starrow opposed a roadway to be built along the Esplanade? He believed that beautiful open spaces and fresh air were essential to everyone, both physically and spiritually. After his death, his wife donated a million dollars to help the city of Boston realize her husband's dream. You know what happened after her death. More recently, the city's attempts to develop Mary Cummings Park were a direct violation of another widow's earnest attempts to provide a public park for the enjoyment of all. On Thursday, the BPDA will vote on the creation of a PDA that would codify a reduction of sunlight reaching the Emerald Necklace. Please, please, let's end the legacy of callous disregard for the exemplary standards set by those who came before us. The board holds in its hands the power to either protect these historic parks and the environment and health services they provide, or to approve a plan that produces private profit by degrading public land. I hope that you will not change the rules concerning the reduction of sunlight reaching our parks. Our next letter from Carol Lasky. Dear city planners, the proposed Simmons University project is an affront to decades of environmental restoration in the Emerald Necklace. The Skanska plan needs to be thoroughly revised so the public, which owns these treasured green spaces, can be assured that shadows and other negative impacts to the habitats of the Muddy River are absolutely certifiably minimized and the parks are protected into the future. Stop the 305 Brookline Avenue project before it's too late. Thank you. Our next letter is from Charlie DiRienzo. Hello, BPDA board. My name is Charlie, and I am a lab technologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I work and bike in the Longwood Medical Area four days a week. Enabling a mixed-use, bikeable, environmentally focused development at this location would reap strong dividends, allowing the area to use less energy, house more people, aid the local neighborhoods, and help our city become bikeable and walkable. We must make a Longwood and Fenway neighborhood that is a place to live and thrive, not just a place to commute to. 
I strongly encourage the BPA to support the, this Longwood Place agenda item, and I am excited for a future where more Bostonians can live and work in an urban environment that works for all. Thank you. Our next letter is from Daniel Bicers. Dear BPDA, I am writing in support of the development plan for the proposed Longwood Place development. Our city and region are in desperate need of new housing, especially affordable housing, which this planned development would help supply. As a Jamaica Plain resident and frequent user of the Emerald Necklace Parks, the planned development would have no adverse impacts on my enjoyment of the park. In fact, the new residents of the development would have easy access to the Emerald Necklace, and I am happy that they would be able to enjoy the parks as well as the additional benefits the planned development would bring. I strongly urge the BPDA to approve the development plan. Thank you. Our next letter is from Stan Everett. Um, so it's Thursday, January 19th at noon. Petition signed equals 2,199, 220% of the original goal of 1,000. The majority of the Emerald Necklace community is not opposed to the project. The petitioners are opposed to the height of several of the project's buildings. The Skanska USA proposal embodies many great planning ideas, but no project, no matter how admirable, should receive a green light when its success hinges on damaging one of Frederick Law Olmsted's greatest parks, the Emerald Necklace, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. The Emerald Necklace represents half of all of the park acreage in Boston. There is also a link to the petition um, and an image of a graphic from the PDA development plan. The next letter is from the Riverway Square Condominium Trust. Dear Boston Planning and Development Agency Board, the Board of Trustees for the Riverway Square Condominium is writing to provide our support for the proposed redevelopment of the Simmons College residential campus known as the Longwood Place Project by Skanska USA Building. The Riverway Square Condominium Building, sorry, the Riverway Square Condominium Building Complex includes 118 units in five connected buildings with addresses from 114 to 122 Riverway. Our building was built in 1915 and converted to condominiums in 1980. We are located directly across the street from the proposed Longwood Place project. The Longwood Place project includes approximately 1.7 million gross square feet of mixed use development, including residential, office lab, retail, community space, open space, and parking. It will be developed in phases over approximately 10 to 15 years, with phase one expected to start around 2026. The project is part of Simmons University One Simmons Vision to consolidate its campus to one location, allowing its residential campus to be redeveloped. The Longwood Place project is a proposed planned development area to redevelop Simmons residential campus. Because we are direct to butters to the project, we have been paying close attention to it, attending meetings, providing comments, and working with Skanska. During the course of the last year, Skanska has held numerous butter meetings and consistently communicated with the condominium board and our residents relative to this project. Skanska has agreed to keep the lines of communication with us open during the project. As a result of our communication with Skanska, we believe that the project has evolved from their initial concept into a project that will reinvigorate the area by breaking up the super block, creating new area pathways and connection, adding new passive and active open space with public realm activities, as well as new retail spaces. While it is undoubtedly going to be a long phased project, we believe that it will eventually improve the surrounding area as well as the value of our homes. The Board of Trustees on behalf of the 118 units and approximately 300 residents at the condominium thanks Skanska for patiently listening to our comments, being cooperative, professional, and developing a harmonious working relationship with us. We support the Longwood Place Project PDA and look forward to seeing it move forward. Um, the next letter is from David Bean. I am writing to oppose the Longwood Place project as it is now proposed. Raising the height of buildings adjacent to the Emerald Necklace can only damage the beauty of the parks and dilute its value to the public. This project and any project that shadows the public space robs that space of one of its most important qualities. The institutions that own buildings adjoining parks own them precisely because of the value of their location. They could buy property elsewhere for their projects, but developing their views of the park is more appealing from an architectural point of view. A college building a dormitory or an office building could bury it underground and have no effect, effect on the light of the park. No, but no one wants to do that. They want to be able to look down from the lofty heights into the Bosky Park. Why should the public give up something it has owned for generations to someone else to be used in their plan to make money? I have heard the project proponents have offered money to repair structures in the park as compensation for the damage that would be done. Structures can be repaired any time and are merely attributes of the park. They are not the essence of the park. The essence of the park is its physical integrity. 
than the inviolability of its earth, its access to sun, air, and water. Parks are constantly under attack. Private parties and public institutions have an appetite for open space that is insatiable. Park advocates cannot rest. There is always another laudable project waiting in the wings. Gobbling up the sunshine that is vital to the health of the park is little different from gobbling up the land. And once gone, it is gone for good. Anyone who is no longer wet behind the ears has seen repeated concessions to private interests of land and sky. Each time the regulators and project proponents announce that it won't happen again. Yet it does happen again. Each concession simply proves that the regulating authorities can be convinced to give in over and over. I urge you to respect your own rules regarding building heights in the Longwood area and limit the heights in this project. This would simply be selling a piece of Bostonian's birthright. That must not be allowed. I'm gonna have a quick sip of water. All right, our next letter is from Stephen Goldblatt. BPDA board, as a resident of Park Drive in Boston and board member of the Audubon Circle Neighborhood Association, I am writing to oppose the BPDA board's approval of the proposed PDA development plan and zoning map amendment for the Longwood Place 305 Brookline Avenue project. The project's building heights will cast shadows on the Emerald Necklace parks and negatively impact the enjoyment of public land utilized by thousands of Bostonians, residents of Brookline and the surrounding area, particularly from disadvantaged neighborhoods and thousands of tourists. Receiving a few million dollars in exchange for this damage is not a favorable decision for those who rely on the parkland for the quality of their life or from a business perspective. A small private green space surrounded by high rise buildings offered by the developers does nothing to balance the inequity of their proposal. It greatly concerns me that Simmons College, an educational nonprofit which has received state and federal benefits in the form of tax rates, student loan support, as well as many others, has mismanaged their finances and needs to sell out to the developers. Simmons financial mismanagement should not be borne by neighbors who will suffer from tragic congestion without a formal traffic study, the inherent dangers of bio level three labs, and the loss of a beautiful and properly scaled campus which exists currently. Thank you for your consideration and please feel free to contact me anytime. Our next letter is from Diane Pienta. Dear Priscilla Rojas and board members, I am a Fenway neighborhood property owner and a resident um, excuse me, I am a Fenway neighborhood property owner and resident, and I am writing to strongly oppose the BPDA board's approval of the proposed PDA development plan and zoning map amendment for the Longwood Place 305 Brookline Avenue project that allows building heights that will cast shadows on the Emerald Necklace parks. I ask that you deny this proposal. The legacy of what we leave to future generations in this city lies in your hands and in your decisions. Is it more important to preserve the historic and little parkland left or grant permissions to large corporations to cast their shadows literally and figuratively on this precious land that is vital to the quality of life in the city, as well as to the thousands of commuters who use these paths each day. I urge you to vote no and not set an irreversible precedent to overturn the zoning rules that have protected these parks for so long. They are precious, irreplaceable sanctuaries in the heart of an increasingly busy and noisy part of the city. Thank you very much. Our next letter is from Betsy Ridge Madsen. Dear BPA board members, I am concerned that the 305 Brookline Avenue project proposed by Simmons and Skanska USA clearly violates your guidelines concerning shadows on parkland. Shadows from this group of proposed buildings would affect the Riverway, the Back Bay Fens, and the Justin Mee Lift Park. All of these are well used and appreciated public green spaces. The vegetation is regenerative, addressing many of our communal needs, including mental and physical health and the amelioration of urban heat islands. Both summer and winter conditions will change significantly with large swaths of shade. Your board was wise enough to establish shadow guidelines. Please adhere to them for the sake of the community. Development dollars come and get spent, but the shadows cast will be there forever. Sincerely yours, Betsy Ridge. Our next letter is from Celeste Walker. Dear BPDA board, I am writing to oppose a PDA for 305 Brookline Avenue, Longwood Place, because its, height, its proposed height is in violation of the stated guideline to protect our much needed green space. It is time to draw the line and ensure that our parks are protected forever. These issues should not be decided on a case-by-case -case basis where residents have to spend hours and hours of time and sometimes money to persuade the city to enforce its own guidelines. Please oppose this spot zoning. Although it is not a, though it is not a recognized legal term in Boston, it is what this is and will set a dangerous precedent for all of our parks. Zoning changes should be done with a process between the city and its residents and cover whole neighborhoods, not individual sites. It would be devastating to the Emerald Necklace parks to ignore the increased shadow hours on the three affected parks. 
These parks are used for pedestrian and bike commuting in the morning and evening hours. The increased shadows at these times pose safety issues for personal security and for physical safety on paths subject to the melting, icing, melting snow, and water issues. Those who have limited mobility will be particularly affected. The increased shadows will impact the health of the tree canopy and the understory green growth. The proposed privately owned publicly accessible green space in the project is no substitute for a public park because we all have seen how public spaces on private property are often amended out of existence due to changing circumstances after the initial plans are approved. I am a resident of Boston and worked in the Fenway area for over 30 years and am still in the area almost daily. I do not oppose the project, but I do oppose this iteration. The Green New Deal should not be aspirational. Enforce the regulation that was put in place to protect the Emerald Necklace. Excuse me, thank you for your time and consideration. Our next letter is from Joanne Robinson to the BPDA board members. I am writing in regard to the proposed Simmons Skanska Longwood Place project at 305 Brookline Avenue. I recognize this development is intended to provide economic and community benefits, but the proposal has significant threats due to the tall buildings that will cast shadows on the Emerald Necklace, Riverway, uh, Justin, Justine Knee Liff, the Back Bay Fens Parks, and the length of the Muddy River. These public parks are recognized by the National Register of Historic Places as some of Frederick Law Olmsted's most important urban planning and engineering designs. Olmsted was also aware of the need to protect these parks because of their narrow spaces and the deep valleys that were designed to contain the Muddy River. The expensive investment to restore these parks and the river, called the Muddy River Restoration Project, funded by Boston, Brookline, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, is almost completed, but the proposed development can cause this project to be wasted. In addition to the guidelines developed by the BPDA that provide restrictions on shadows that will protect these parks is being ignored. The heights of the Longwood Place buildings will disturb the health of the mature trees and beautiful waters that we all can enjoy. The Skanska Sasaki shadow studies show that the early morning and evening will, still, will cause this stable ecological environment to be changed and show how publicly owned areas adjacent to the Muddy River will be affected. This development should be reconsidered in order to preserve our public parks. I believe that your board must delay approvals for this development into your, until you are able to solve the problems of heightened shadows. Sincerely, Joanne Robinson. <clears throat> Our next letter is from Maria Hidalgo Romero. Dear community, please don't let silly objections stop us from building um, sense affordable housing that will lower market rents in this city. Homelessness kills way more folks than a slight reduction in sunlight. The Emerald Necklace Conservancy Group is pushing an atrociously greedy form of nimbyism that should be promptly ignored. Best, Maria. Our next letter is from Jun Siong Lee. Dear BPDA board, this is a written testimony for agenda item number 26, Longwood Place, Longwood Medical Area. The Emerald Necklace Conservancy don't oppose this project, but we do oppose its impacts on Boston's public parks. These parks provide essential health benefits to hundreds of thousands of users. They serve as a critical climate and mitigation mechanism, protecting the institutions and residences around the Emerald Necklace. They also bring vital biodiversity and environmental benefits to our urban ecosystem. With the, currently, current pro, excuse me, with the current proposed development plan, parts of the Muddy River, Justine Mee Lift Park, and 401 Park will see significant loss of sunshine. Tens of thousands of people commute to and through these spaces every day and use them for health and recreation. A loss of more than an hour of sunshine every day would significantly decrease these parks' usability and negatively impact, impact the thousands of plant and animal species that contribute to their vibrancy. There are two letters on the Emerald Necklace Conservancy website that further outline our concern and considerations, which are linked in the electronic copy of the letter. Please postpone approval of the PDA until a sunshine model slash shadow and height concerns can be thoroughly examined and more seriously addressed. Copy to this email is a slowed version of the shadow analysis during the winter season. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this project. All right, and our last letter is from Tess Kennard. Dear Ms. Rojas and the BPDA board members, as a resident of Boston who frequents the Emerald Necklace, I am writing to express my disapproval of the current proposal. I hope that as representatives, your decision today respects and supports the residents, public, and community. I request that you do not approve the current proposal as it stands today and protect our historic parklands. And that is the end of our testimony to be read into the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Sarah. Please take a sip of water, a little bit of break. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, okay, 
So, uh, so we'll move on to board um, board questioning. So, if we could just uh, let's let's start with the, the three points before. So, let's clarify biosafety levels. Um, a, a statement about being this is approving biosafety level three. I don't think that's the case, but let's um, let's clarify that. Um, uh, approval of the PDA and the individual projects. So that's more on the um, agency uh, process side, and then uh, um, you know additional detail on on the shadow. So whatever order. Madam Chair, I'm happy to address the BSL levels as well. If the development team would like to jump in, they are welcome to add to my response. Um, but I want to note that the PDA currently allows for BSL um, 1 and 2 by right, as stated in the PDA development plan. Any consideration of BSL 3 would have to undergo significant review and public process and would require approval by the BPDA board and appropriate state agencies. A vote today, uh, excuse me, a vote to approve today does not grant approval for BSL 3 uses. Okay, cool. that's all the clarification I needed. Uh, so can you just clarify the, let's go with the, uh, the vote today being approval of the PDA versus an individual project. We'll talk about that, the, the, um, how that works. Yeah, so the approval today would be for ADC only, which is essentially the zoning envelope for the project site. Um, as I noted in my remarks at the beginning, um, each, port, each project component, which may be a phase or maybe a building, would have to undergo Article ADB large project review, which is a process I know many folks on this call are familiar with. Um, it would include a full ADB filing of an LOI, PNF, and then subsequent filings as needed, as well as community process and an additional BPDA board vote for that ADB large project approval. So a vote tonight would set essentially the zoning envelope, so the maximum heights, lot coverage, minimum open space, those kinds of dimensional requirements um, as detailed in the PDA development plan. I'm happy to also go on if that doesn't fully answer your question. No, it, it does. I more just kind of want to just uh, restate for the record, right, because we live and breathe this, but not everybody does. Um, okay, great. And then, um, and then finally, you know, for, um, uh, for the developer, um, uh, if you know you 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 heard it, <laughs> you've been you know hearing it, right? The uh, the uh, concerns about the shadow in the park. So you know, less of a direct question, but more of an opportunity to um, you know to, to state your your you know your your case again, um, or or clarify anything um, anything that was said that you know. Um, just gonna leave that open, talk about shadows. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll kick us off and then I'll hand it quickly over to, to Kelly um, from Sasaki who can speak um, on the technicalities. But I mean, we, we do disagree with, with the opposition on the shadow and, and do not find that there is any kind of proof that there is causing harm to the um, Emerald Necklace Parks um, for the shadows, um, which, you know, we are making this contribution of um, to the Parks Department, which we believe will help with the maintenance and a lot of the concerns that uh, folks have brought up tonight. Um, but I think it would be best for Kelly, if you're there, Kelly, um, to hop on and kind of just talk through some of the um, technical impacts from an ecological point of view of the shadows that everyone is asking about. That would be great. Sure. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, so, I mean, first, Sasaki started as a landscape architecture firm more than 70 years ago. We, we love landscapes, we love parks, and we wouldn't support a project that we thought was going to cause a detrimental impact to a park. I think there's been the perception among some tonight that the new shadows will be detrimental to some of the benefits provided to people being able to use them for their mental or physical health. And, and we disagree with that for a number of reasons, uh, partly because of the relatively short duration of the shadows. The majority of the shadows, new shadows on site, will last for less than 90 minutes during the equinox. Again, the equinox is March 21st. It's when you know day and light are about balanced. It is used because it's sometimes used as a proxy for the beginning of the growing season. Um, it is it is a proxy. Growing season is a little more complicated and depends on 
when the last killing frost happens, you know, when, when, when it's now warm enough in the season for plants to start growing, then the growing season ends when the first killing frost happens in the fall. And a lot of species vary their life cycles according to that. They do pay attention to light, but they pay even more attention to temperature um, and respond to that. And a lot of the trees, especially the mature trees in the Emerald Necklace, um, if you look at their leaf out dates, it, it doesn't actually happen until substantially after the equinox, when the shadows, which are mostly under one and a half hours at the equinox, have decreased even more. Um, something else that struck me as, as interesting in the comments is that there are already portions of the Emerald Necklace nearby that have upwards of three and four hours of shadow cast on them, which is substantially more than this new project will cast. And I would argue that those portions of the emerald necklace do still provide a lot of the benefits of mental and physical health. They still provide a lot of the ecosystem services that we're looking to these parks to provide. And that there's not actually a lot of research done between the interactions of building shadows and trees in the urban landscapes. Not a whole lot of people have studied it, and the results that they've found are pretty mixed. One study in a totally different location, but it, it looked at 35 different tree species, and it did not find a reduction in photosynthetic ability when they were next to buildings versus when they were not next to buildings. Another one in Japan looked at hollies, again, far away, different ecosystem, just showing how limited the research is. Um, and the hollies actually performed better photosynthetically. And then, you know, a third one in DC looking at sweet gums, which are a, a native tree to here, a very sun loving species, had decreased photosynthesis. And so, w what we can read out of that is that there is more research needed. It's hard to say that there will be detrimental impacts to the plants based on this, you know, limited shadow that we will be adding. Um, but also that it's important to look at the species. And the species that we do have in the emerald necklace are generally ones that are more flexible with full sun versus partial sun versus partial shade. Um, and, and we really do not believe that it will be detrimental to the plants or physical experience of being in the emerald necklace. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Um, OK. Um, do we have any other that satisfies my, uh, my questions of, of things that were raised for me during the comment period? Um, so do we have any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I'd like to add something. And there was so many of the comments were on the shadow and the impact and you know how important the historic emerald necklace is. And I'm more practical. If it's March or April or October and I'm out for a walk and there's plenty of sunshine, I'm more likely to stay out there. And if there's a lot of shadows, it's, it's not as inviting. So I just encourage, I know there's been tremendous progress made here with the Skanska, Skanska team is to continue to work with the neighbors here and, and as best you can minimize that um, because again, once it's built, uh, there is no changing it. So um, I, I just like to stress that. I, I think there's been great progress made here, but I, I'd like to see that um, you know, shadow mitigation um, reduced or shadow mitigation at, at an absolute minimum. So that's, that's my comment, Priscilla. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, motion passes. Uh, thank you very much all for your participation. Um, and uh, we look forward to the continued process ahead of us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for the time. Really excited for this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on to the public hearing, uh, the second public hearing. We've got three more. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, so this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency held in conformance with Article 80B-5 and 80C-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed development plan for phase one within plan development area number 128 
L Street Station Redevelopment and to consider the L Street Station Redevelopment, also known as 776 Summer Street Project, as a development impact project. This hearing was duly advertised on January 4th, 2023 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case um, and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. So if you're planning on testifying, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click on the hand icon on the Zoom control panel and this will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, testify please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. Um, in an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. Uh, BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. Uh, at that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. And um, Stephen Harvey will now begin the presentation. Stephen. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, but oh. you just read the wrong item. Did I? <laughs> okay, which one? Um, We're on 27. All right. We just finished 26. Okay, so that, uh, which project is it? That's my 620 hearing. Okay. 27 is 1170 Soldiers Field Road. Uh, okay. Uh, Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Scroll too far. Perfect. Uh, all right, I'm going to read all of that again. Uh, well, for the first time, because I read the wrong one. Okay. So this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency, being held in conformance with Articles 80B-5 and 80C-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed development plan for plan development area number 139-1770 Soldiers Field Road Project and to consider the 1170 Soldiers Field Road Project as a development impact project. This hearing was duly advertised on January 4th 2023 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click on the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak and when your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please ask nine to raise your hand. Uh, when I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. And finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Mr. Nick Carter will now begin the presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Bohemus. We are here before you this evening to discuss the proposed plan development area and project at 1170 Soldiers Field Road. The project, located in Alston, was filed in August of 2021 and originally contemplated the construction of three new lab buildings on the site of the former WBZ studio, which will be restricted to biosafety levels one and two. National Development, the proponent, is currently building a new studio on an adjacent site on Sol Sol Soldiers Field Road, all of which will be LEED Gold certifiable and are committed to over 90% fossil fuel reduction with solar PV and 25% heat uh, capacity, heat pump capacity. Over the course of many public meetings and outreach to local elected officials, a fourth passive house and 100% all electric, all residential building 
was added to the project, which will provide 85 units of residential housing, 17 of which will be affordable at a range of AMIs from 40% to 100%. Additionally, all 17 units of affordable housing are one bedroom or larger, and four of which are two bed or larger. After the adoption of the Western Avenue Corridor Zoning Study, which allows for planned development areas in the new study corridor, the development team filed a planned development area application in November of 2022, which complies with the aims of the new zoning. The project will bring a large number of benefits to the area as well as the city as a whole, including new construction and permanent jobs and a new pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, including new connections to Smith Field and a new crossing of Soldiers Field Road. The project will also provide $270,000 for the upkeep of Smith Field, $150,000 to work with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture to commission public art from local Alston Brighton artists, and $400,000 for local STEM education in the form of scholarships for local Alston residents in partnership with new lab tenants and funding for the West End House education programs. Before I turn to the development team to take you through the PDA and the project, Kathleen Onifer will discuss the planning context for the project. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jemison and Secretary Bohemus. My name is Kathleen Onifer with Downtown Neighborhood Planning. Um, the most immediate planning context for this project is the Western Avenue Corridor and Rezoning Study, which was adopted by the board last October and known affectionately as Wacker Z. The plan included new zoning, subsequently adopted by the Boston Zoning Commission in November, that limited the development of large commercial and life science uses like this project to key nodes located at Barry's Corner and near the Boston Landing Commuter Rail Station, and also provided density bonuses for residential uses that increase along with increased inclusionary development units. Wacker Z also included urban design guidelines to shape new development in the public realm as well as recommendations for future mobility improvements along Western Avenue and to build on a multimodal network as sites redevelop. Next slide, please. During project review, staff focused on ensuring complete alignment with the plan recommendations. The project fully complies with the zoning limits for use and dimensions established by Wacker Z in the new zoning and responded to planning and community goals by incorporating residential uses alongside life science uses including attention to family housing and diverse AMI range in that inclusionary development program. The site design also includes the creation of shared paths, new roadways that tie into the overall roadway network envisioned by Wacker Z that will be open to public travel and parking and um, help get that built out of overall access. Uh, it also provides an at-grade crossing of Soldiers Field Road um, to be worked on in collaboration with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, and provides multimodal access throughout the large site, including providing connections between Herder Park and Smith Field, as well as transportation demand measures that will aid in mode shift and are particularly important for life science uses. Finally, staff carefully reviewed the public realm design and sustainability measures to advance planned goals for community-oriented public space and quality of development. I will now turn it over to the proponent to present the project. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm Ted Tai. I'm the managing partner of National Development, and I'll be running through this with um, Naomi Mayu, who is our vice president and uh, project manager. Um, first, thanks for not forgetting us. We appreciate it. And your, your, uh, Madam Chair, your uh, your uh, fatigue is understandable tonight, and we will uh, we will try to run through this uh, as quickly as we can. Um, First, you know, we've been working on this project for five years. It's very exciting to be here and present it. Um, I'd like to just quickly thank members of the community, our IAG, uh, BPDA staff, and uh, elected officials, all of whom were very involved in the project and provided their guidance. As Kathleen said, we had the, I'm going to say, the luxury of working alongside the Wackersy pro process so that um, we really conformed our project as it developed to uh, work within the developing Wackersy guidelines, uh, which it does. So again, we will try to keep this short and just give you an overview and be delighted to answer any questions. Next slide, please. So just as, an, as a, a very high level overview of the project, 
It sits on a little over six acres. It is currently occupied by the WBZ studio, which was built in 1948 and is uh, ready to be replaced. And um, the program consists of three lab office buildings and an 85 unit residential building. Importantly, the 85 unit residential building will include 20% affordable units. Um, a big part of the story here is public realm, and Naomi will go over that in a minute, but um, if we go to the next slide, you can see that the site here um, is in a very strategic location, but if you took the blue line around the site today, essentially it's all fenced. And uh, as you'll see in the photos on the, the next slide in a second, um, it's created really a barrier uh, between Western Ave and uh, the river and, uh, and, and, and the parks that are adjacent to it as well. And if you look closely, you will see all sides of this are, are really cut off by fencing. So a big part of the planning goal here was to create porosity through this site for pedestrians, for bicycles, for vehicles, and to make the open space assets in the area accessible by the community. Can we flip to the next slide? And this shows our plan, which has gone through many, many, many evolutions uh, over the last few years uh, to get to this point, which um, I think has been really endorsed by all involved, including the community, uh, staff, uh, and elected officials. And it takes the site and really opens it up. You see a project that you've previously approved to the left, which is future WBZ. Uh, that is the new studio that will be built uh, adjacent to this site. And once that studio is built and occupied, it allows that 1948 studio, which is functionally obsolete, to be demolished. And that sits uh, right in the middle of the three buildings uh, that are shown as north, south, and east. Uh, those are the three lab office buildings. The residential building is shown down below in the pinkish color. And you can see that driveway A and driveway B start to provide connections that don't exist today from Speedway Avenue, from McDonald Avenue, and out to Western Avenue. And those driveways include uh, not only an area for vehicles to pass, uh, but also a shared use path for bicycles and pedestrians, uh, sidewalks, and the site contains and is really focal, focused around significant open space. One of the earlier iterations of the plan had an above grade parking garage to accommodate all of the cars for this site. What you don't see on this plan is, is parking and that's because there is a two level below grade parking um, structure that was added really at significant expense. But what it did was allow the site to open, allow the open space to increase. And uh, we were really excited about that, that change. So in the end, this will be a phased project over a number of years. As I mentioned, the adjacent project, the WBZ project uh, needs to occur first. Uh, before this project proceeds, um, but we're excited about getting it started. And Naomi can take you through a little bit more of the detail on the uh, site plan and public realm. Thanks, Ted. Um, so as Ted said, dating about five years, our team and the staff, uh, BPDA, as well as tremendous efforts from the community too, um, we're able to form a kind of collective partnership uh, in this project. Um, we were able to prioritize both the future experience for residents as well as visitors to this area and really to develop a strong and meaningful public realm where there is not really one today at all. Uh, part of these accomplishments, uh, we believe, are the connectivity with the fabric of the immediate neighborhood and also supporting some of the new regional goals that Kathleen had identified, um, supporting the future development that will occur on Western Avenue and also being able to connect all of that growth across to Herder Park. 
Um, this includes a future at grade uh, cross signalized crossing of Soldiers Field Road, uh, which achieves one of the specific planning components of the Wacker Z and the Alston Bright Mobility Study. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Uh, with the DCR collaboration, the project intentionally protects the mature trees and enhances the landscaping in order to heighten the experience of those who walk and bike along the green belt that is Soldiers Field Road. Uh, with specific input from the community, we were able to prioritize public art opportunities both inside the buildings and outside as well, and create opportunities for purchasing of the local Walston art to support that local economy. Um, a big substantial investment in improving the infrastructure underground, um, as well as creating you know, new sidewalks that are safe, forest inviting, and uh, some pretty unique open space. You go to the next slide, please. So the collaborative intention we've had with urban design staff and BCDC and how these building, the building architecture came together was to design buildings that looked organic in their environment. Um, the architecture we wanted to make sure was diverse among the buildings themselves. They should be unique as if they haven't all been built at the same time while still relating to each other, especially diversity between the three life science buildings and then creating that visual connection to the residential building as a different use. Next slide, please. The public realm really brings everything together with site features that range from beautiful stormwater retention to flexible open lawn space and inviting hardscape pathways. The landscape offers a variety of different experiences. The green space offers both opportunities for active programmed experience and passive use across demographics and generations. Next slide, please. A little cut off. Uh, the leadership of BTPA staff, the local elected officials, our IEG, and input from others in the community, as well as the local neighborhood associations, were crucial in developing this really strong mitigation package, which we're pleased to present here. Over $9 million in linkage fees, um, and some of the highlights, I won't read all of them for the sake of time, um, but some new housing with 20% affordable units at 40 to 100% of AMI, um, really significant partnerships with. Uh, the um, STEM after school programs for underserved students in the area, as Nick mentioned, as well as the internship program for Alston Brighton re residents to provide exposure to the life science industry. Uh, we also are very excited, as I know the city is too, about the funding for the much needed SFR at grade uh, signalized crossing for pedestrians. And uh, I know it's been a long night, so I'll just wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present and for those that worked with us over the last several years to make this project what you saw tonight. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, okay, so this is a public hearing. So we are going to go to public testimony. Do we have anybody who would like to testify? Secretary Bohemitz. Uh So E. Smith still has their hand up, and I think it's a technical glitch. Um, I'm going to take Rick Keo. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, good evening. This is uh, Rick Keo. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members. Uh, just uh, I'm here on behalf of the Sheet Metal Workers Local 17. I'm one of the representatives. I represent the uh, hundreds of members in Boston and also my family that lives in Boston. And I just want to speak in favor of this project, and I hope it uh, proceeds on going. They're, they're a good company. And it looks like a really good uh, setup for the way it's going to be in there. So I just want to say a favor of this project. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keo. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam Chairman, members of the board, this is Minor Perez representing the Carpenters Union. On behalf of hundreds of our members, I want to go on record in support of the project. Thank you, Minor. Gary Walker, you can unmute yourself. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary, Director Jemison, once again, Gary Walker, electricians and uh, technicians, Local 103, like to speak in strong support also. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Christopher Ryan, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Chris Ryan, resident, uh, strong support of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Vincent Coyle, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi, Vincent Coyle, business agent with the Iron Workers of Local 7. Here I represent the men and women of Local 7 Iron Workers. Uh, we strongly support this project and uh, great presentation by National Development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Would anybody else like to speak for this project, either in support or opposition? Please raise your virtual hand. 
Madam Chair, I believe this concludes the public hearing portion of this item. Uh, I do have one letter to read. Perfect. Go for it. Uh, this is from Council President, or sorry, Councilor Breeden, as well as uh, Rep. Honan and Rep. Moran. We, the undersigned elected officials of Alston Brighton, submit this letter to express our support for the 1170 to 1190 Soldiers Field Road project proposed by 1170 SFR Associates, the proponent, and the Alston Brighton neighborhood of Boston. With this project, the proponent proposes to construct a mixed use office, life science and residential development with four new buildings, totaling approximately 795,000 gross square feet. The proposed project will consist of the following, an approximately 240,000 square foot, eight story office and life science building with ground floor and commercial space, an approximately 246,000 square foot eight-story office building and life science building with ground floor commercial space and approximately 214,000 uh, square foot seven-story office and life science building with ground floor commercial space and an approximately 95,000 square foot six-story residential building containing 85 residential units. Our reasons for support of this project include the following. Wacker Z compliance. The proposed project complies with the requirements of the Western Avenue Corridor Study and Rezoning Plan. The Western Avenue Corridor area in which the project is located was the subject of a BPDA-led planning process that accumulated in the October 2022 approval of the Wacker Z report. The Boston Zoning Commission subsequently codified the zoning recommendations of the Wacker Z report in November 2022. We appreciate that the proposed project is consistent with the zone regulations of the Wacker Z plan. Mixed use development. As requested, the proponent incorporated an 85 unit residential component within the proposed project. We believe that the inclusion of this housing component has resulted in a significantly, significantly improved mixed use development. Project affordability. The project's proposed residential component will include 17 income-restricted IDP rental units made available at area median incomes, ranging from 40% to 100%. With 20% of the project units designated as income-restricted IDP units, the proponent has exceeded the city's current IDP requirements. We appreciate the, the proponent's commitment to the inclusion of much-needed income-restricted housing within the proposed development. Project connectivity. The proposed project will create pedestrian and bicycle connections between Smith Field, the project site, and Herner Park, thereby significantly improving neighborhood access to these green spaces. To enable these connections, the proponent will contribute $650,000 towards improvement to the intersection of McDonald Avenue and Speedway Avenue, and will contribute $1,250,000 to the to the Department of Conservation and Recreation for the construction of an at-grade crossing of Soldiers, Soldiers Field Road. Open space. The proposed project will include approximately 37,700 square feet of publicly accessible, privately owned open space. Um, uh, this on-site open space will include a significant amount of landscaped green space, including a flexible use central green. Parks contribution. The proponent will contribute a total of $275,000 to the Boston Parks and Recreation Department for improvements to an, on to an ongoing maintenance of Smith Field. Arts and culture. Following project completion, the proponent will commission public art for both interior and exterior installation at the project from Alston and Brighton based artists. The proponent will work with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture to coordinate these efforts. Workforce Development and STEM Education. The proponent will contribute $200,000 to facilitate two annual summer internships for Alston Brighton residents with future project tenants in the life sciences industry. In addition, the proponent has also agreed to contribute $200,000 to STEM-focused 
after school programming at Alston's West End House. Provided that all agreed upon mitigation measures and benefits are documented in this project's cooperation agreement, we support this project. Sincerely, Liz Breeden, Kevin G. Honan, and Michael J. Moran. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, all right, questions or comments from the board? Okay, hearing, hearing and seeing none. Uh, well, actually just, uh, I thought that the building designs were, were interesting. I actually like it when I'm not sure like how I feel about it. It just means that I'm gonna look at it again. And then, you know, maybe, yeah, I just, I just don't know, but they, they were uh, memorable, memorable. So, uh, so I think it's cool. Um, all right, so um, motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Lance Mark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have the next public hearing related to 7 Channel Street, right? Before I start reading it, 7 Channel Street? Yes, for correct. Perfect. Okay. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Article 80C-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed First Amendment to amended and restated development plan for plan development area number 53, Channel Center Street, <laughs> Channel Center Project, South Boston, uh, specific to project component number eight located at several, seven Channel Center Street <clears throat> within the South Boston waterfront neighborhood of Boston. This hearing was duly advertised on January 4th, 2023 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We're taking, oh my goodness. Sorry. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you are planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Uh, click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. Uh, this will signal to the staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you are calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone and your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain, and at that time, please conclude your remarks that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. And finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Mr. Daniel Polanco will now uh, begin the presentation. Daniel. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, uh, Madam Chair Rojas, Secretary Paul Humes. Members of the board, Director Jameson, my name is Daniel Polanco and I'm the project manager for the proposed PDA number 53 amendment and notice of project change component number eight at Seven Channel Center located in the South Boston waterfront. Uh, the project's proponent, 7CC73 owner, LLC, uh, owner of Seven Channel Center, which is project component number eight, uh, filed the seventh notice of project change specific to project uh, proposed project on June 24, 2022. The seventh MPC, uh, contemplates approximately 65,500 square feet more of office research and development uses that have been reviewed by the 6th MPC. The proponent also filed a PDA amendment on September 23rd, 2022, specifically to restrict BSL levels, uh, to, uh, BSL, BS, BSL levels to level one and two only. In collaboration with the development team, I hosted a public meeting on July 27, 2022, October 27, 2022, and December 7th. 2022 and an impact advisory meetings on July 26, 2022 and December 7, 2022. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration tonight. I have the development team here with me today to present the project in detail to answer any questions in regards to design changes, mitigation, and other questions you may have. I will now turn it over to Eileen to talk about the planning context. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Pohemis, members of the board, and Director Jemison. My name is Eileen Michaud, and I'm the neighborhood planner for South Boston. 
The proposed project is known as project unit number eight within PDA number 53, as Daniel mentioned, and it's the final project contained within the Channel Center project that's pictured on the slide. Um, the proposed project was reviewed for consistency with the goals of PDA number 53 to create an inviting pedestrian realm, encourage adaptive reuse of existing historic buildings as it is within the, the Fort Point Channel Landmark District, and activate the streetscape with appropriate ground floor uses. The proposed project was also reviewed in light of extensive public feedback. Next slide, please. Key considerations of BPVA staff during a review of the proposed project included adequate street level activation through the provision of ground floor retail use, proper screening of rooftop lab mechanicals to respect the surrounding public realm, and preservation of the historical character of the Fort Point Channel Landmark District by reconstructing the original facade of the three-story brick building. Pen pending BPDA board approval and subsequent design review, the proposed project will proceed to the Zoning Commission for approval. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to the development team to present the project in greater detail. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Chief Jemison, and staff. Uh, my name is Jay Eigerman with Ruben Junius and Rose. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Price at Westbrook Partners in, in a moment, but if we could go to the aerial photo. I'll give some background on the PDA. Uh, there are two actions sought today, you heard. One is to conclude LARC project review on the seventh notice of project change. The sixth notice of project change was before you about eight years ago uh, for nine channel center. I, I worked on that one too. So it's been a gap of eight years, uh, including COVID. And again, the PDA development plan amendment is only to limit use. Right now, uh, laboratory use is permitted by right. Uh, but this would clarify that you could only do one and two BSL levels at this location. Uh, the PDA dates from 2001. It was originally Beacon Capital Partners, and there are 10 components, and as you heard, this is component eight, but in time, it's the last one to go forward. Uh, to clarify, office and laboratory use uh, has always been permitted from the beginning. That's never changed. What uh, had been unclear over the years. The height limit is 125 feet and the FAR limit is 6.68. Previous developers had explored amending that to go higher and we're not doing that. So we are building exactly at the height and the floor area that is permitted by right under the PDA. Uh, another point about the PDA is there's a total limit on development in, the, in this PDA of 1.55 million square feet uh, to date, we're at about uh, uh, 1.36 million. And so with this project, which is 99.5, there will still be 100,000 square feet that was approved years ago, but has not come forward yet. There are also minimums and maximums on uses. There's a minimum and maximum for residential, for office lab, and for other, which is retail and uh, gallery. And again, we're within those maximum and minimums. We're not asking to change any of those. Uh, the final thing I want to note, uh, and you had heard uh, uh, from Ms. Michaud about it, is design review. So there's a long history on design review in Channel Center. In 2001, the state was actually involved. So the Mass Historical Commission and the original developer and Mass DEP entered an agreement on which buildings would be preserved and which demolished. This building was slated for demolition. Uh, the plan then, the PDA also tracked that. Um, and then when they did the Four Point Channel Landmarks Guidelines in 2008, again, it was carried through. So we started with the Landmarks Commission on Design as long ago as October of 2021 with an advisory. We've been working with them uh, for over a year. And they have guidelines that they apply uh, for new construction. And we recognize that there have been some objections uh, in the public comment to the design, but I, I want to emphasize that's the product of Landmark's uh, process. And we went back to them as recently as last week to show them the latest. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Price. Thank you.
Thanks, Garrett. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas and members of the board. My name is Matt Price with Westbrook Partners. Uh, as Jared alluded to, uh, it's been a long and cooperative process here. So before proceeding, I really just wanted to thank the community for participating, uh, as well as Director Jemison and the BPA staff for collaborating and, and their significant work in helping get us to where we are tonight. Uh, from Michael Christopher, Casey Hines, Dan Polanco, Nick Carter, overseeing the city and community process, um, as well as the specific departments, Matt Martin, urban design, uh, transportation, Jim Fitzgerald, working through mechanical systems and sustainability with Katie Peterson. Uh, there was a lot of collaboration uh, and the project truly has improved from where we started in our initial submission. So just wanted to thank everyone uh, for that collaboration uh, and tonight is the results uh, of all that collaboration. Uh, so next few slides, if you may, uh, really just provide some context of the existing building. Uh, this is the last remaining undeveloped building within the PDA. Uh, you can see it at three stories here. If you go to the next slide, you can see the, the building at Seven Channel is in significant disrespect, disrepair. Um, it's in extremely compromised condition. You can see boarded up windows, and uh, on the left and right, you can see nine and five channel respectively, which show some redeveloped buildings. So we're really excited the opportunity to uh, restore a, a great building here um, and add to it. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so Jared touched on this, so I will just note again that, that we are here before you with the seventh notice of project <coughs> uh, from the PDA, which established was established in 2001, uh, along with the First Amendment to the PDA, which is specific only to seven channel, uh, which prohibits BSL 3 and 4, which is in response through the Article 80 process uh, to community feedback, which we're, we're supportive of and happy to do. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a brief overview on, on PDA 53. Again, as Jared mentioned, uh, the development plan for PDA 53 contemplated a total of 1.55 million square feet, of which there's but 163,000 square feet remaining unused today. Uh, and there were a variety of permitted uses within the PDA, office and R&D, residential, parking and other. Each of the components within the PDA were prescribed specific zoning. Uh, for seven channel center, the maximum zoning height prescribed was 125 feet and a floor area to the equivalent of about 101,000 square feet. Uh, and for this building size, 50 parking spaces, which will be accommodated in the existing channel center garage, so not constructing new parking. And finally, as I alluded to, the First Amendment is the prohibition of uh, laboratories uh, classified by the CDC as ESL 3 and 4. Uh, next slide, please. So the project before you tonight, really our, our goals were to meet the mark of the development plan established uh, in, you know, over a decade ago, um, requiring uh, and really just meeting zoning. So, so the project itself is uh, proposes a nine story office and R&D project with ground floor retail. Um, given the really unique character of the neighborhood, we started here prioritizing and, and focusing on a way to preserve the existing building and we've committed to maintaining uh, you know, demolishing, cataloging, storing, and reconstructing uh, with those original materials because not possible, the front and rear facade so we can preserve those, uh, those first three stories uh, and constructing uh, the uh, additional stories from four through nine above that. Uh, otherwise, as I mentioned, the, the project uh, falls within the parameters of the development plan, uh, meets dimensional requirements, and, and prescribed uses. So the office and R&D use uh, meet, is a permitted use within the PDA. The building zoning height of 125 feet and the gross floor area of 99,000 uh, square feet also uh, meet the, the parameters prescribed uh, in the development plan here. Uh, next slide, please. So the next two slides just provide uh, context for the, the total area. So as mentioned, each component of the PDA was prescribed a zoning height, one of three. Uh, one channel center, which is the State Street building, was the only building prescribed 150 feet. A seven channel center and 25 channel center at 125 feet and the balance at 80 feet. Uh, as you can see in this slide, seven channel is the, the last remaining undeveloped piece. That's three stories. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, please, you'll see the proposal is, is filling out the development plan uh, pursuant to the original uh, uh, plan and, and matching the, the same zoning height as 25 channel center. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, so over the course of the, the past year or so is really when we started the process. Um, and, and really we wanted, we started after socializing the project with abutters um, and community groups in uh, the middle of 2021. We approached Landmarks planners in August and September of 2021. Uh, and then ultimately had an advisory hearing with Landmarks in October of 2021, presenting uh, the project to receive uh, feedback. And then in January of 2022, about a year ago, uh, we presented again and received approval for uh, the design. Uh, that design was really informed by the design guidelines for the district and the direction of the, uh, the commission. And there was, uh, it was a public process in both that October 21 and January 22 hearing. And, and really the, the feedback that came back from the commission was pursuant to the design guidelines to not try and imitate the lower three stories, uh, but to distinguish uh, the existing component from the new component, uh, which is where you see the, uh, the new component on the upper six stories and reconstructed on the lower three. Uh, since that approval in January 2022, uh, and filing our NPC in June, we've worked with, you know, we've received feedback from the community, worked with urban design staff uh, at the DPDA and in response, you know, using the landmarks uh, approval as a baseline and have solicited that feedback and have made changes uh, based on comments from the BPDA and, and the community. Some of those changes include changing the trim color on the lower three stories to a green that's more consistent with the neighborhood, darkening the the metal panels up above to a darker gray, which evokes a more industrial um, feeling, which is consistent with the neighborhood. You can see the proportions here, uh, the four bays, and then each of those bays split into thirds. That is, uh, that's a, a response to trying to meet the proportionality of the lower three stories. And we've widened the, the five vertical metal panel pilasters uh, uh, to mirror the, the brick piers below. We've uh, added thicker window mill, intermediate window mullions uh, to mirror again those those three uh, bay windows per bay. So we've tried to we've taken that feedback uh, with the baseline of the uh, landmarks original approval have made changes and as Jared alluded to took those changes back last week uh, and received approval again. So that was really the the, the process uh, to arrive at the design we have today. And if you go to the next few slides here. This is the, the resulting design that was approved by Landmarks last week. So again, you can see the, the lower three stories reconstructed and the details of, of the elements there that it will uh, be cataloged. And then up above, you can see the upper six stories with a more modern aesthetic. The next slide shows just a close up view of that transition uh, between the existing building and, and the new. And then the next slide is the rear of the building, but again, similar, uh, same concept. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, walk through a handful of uh, views from the neighborhood. This is from Medallion Avenue. We have the next slide, please, shows uh, the front view of the building from uh, A Street in the afternoon. And the next slide, we, we have articulated glass here, so you can see the difference in this uh, is a morning shot, which shows some of the different uh, characteristics of the glazing with the articulated glass. Next slide, please. With respect to the floor plans and throughout the community process and feedback from elected officials, uh, there were a number of items that came up, two of which included, and which we completely agree with, is, is making sure this has been a, a vacant building for decades, that the ground floor is activated, there was retail on that ground floor that was accessible um, from Channel Center Street uh, to really activate that section of the street. And second included maximizing the amount of mechanicals inside the building. So you'll see here with these floor plans on the ground floor, apart from bike storage uh, and, and that retail area that was important for us to preserve, the balance of the space is really uh, core area mechanicals that really are service areas for the building. So we've, we've worked hard to get as much, for a small floor plate, as much of the mechanical systems into the building uh, as possible. <clears throat> and then on upper, upper floors, if you go to the next slide, these are our occupant floors that have been uh, proposed as, as a split between R&D and office. Next slide, please. Uh, from a sustainability and resiliency perspective, I mentioned working with Katie Peterson, the building will be uh, lead gold certifiable, will meet stormwater requirements, 
uh, and we've engaged SGH um, to design flood mitigation strategies to meet Article 25A. Uh, next slide, please. And then from a, a project benefits perspective, I think in summation, look, we're, we're excited at the opportunity. This is a building that's been vacant for decades. We think it's an opportunity to reutilize a historic building, activate an area that's been vacant for some time with ground floor retail, which we've committed to um, making available for the community, to the community after hours. Uh, there'll be significant job creation, both through construction and permanent jobs. Uh, from monetary perspective, uh, we've worked with the community to identify potential opportunities to improve the neighborhood. Uh, among those, uh, ultimately, we just determined that the most comprehensive improvements would be had through a contribution to improving Iron Street Park. So we've committed $250,000 to do that. Uh, working with transportation, $175,000 towards blue bikes uh, and new shuttle services. And then in terms of uh, development fees, there's about $1.6 million. Uh, which is greater than what was in the much greater than what was in the original development plan um, and that includes affordable housing workforce training funds as well as a seventy-seven thousand dollar contribution um, to the mitigation fund uh, so the next two slides i'll just go through quickly again the retail concept was important to us uh, a couple things to note here uh, in response to feedback we've committed to subsidizing an operator here we think it's important to have a food and beverage operator who's uh, an amenity both not just to the building but to the community and we're committed to make, ensuring that that operation is subsidized so there is a successful operator in there and then to allow for community use of the space after hours we've tried to design it in a way that the furniture is flexible it's no can be an open space to the right there the furniture could be moved it could be used for a variety of uh, activities programming and the like uh, and then the last slide is just showing the park. I think this is an area that we felt like was part of the original public improvements process from the PDA. Uh, we felt like uh, today it's not utilized the way it should. So it's an opportunity to activate and energize that park, uh, create more flexible uses so it can be used not just for the neighborhood, but bring people in to this community. And there's an inherent cultural arts district here that's got some unique characteristics and we, in conversations with some of those groups we think there are simple opportunities to create more venues to you know, let's have a performance, display art, and the like. So we think a simple improvements like that can serve to make this a space that's more usable um, throughout the day, but also have event programming and uh, bring people into the area. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Jared if there's any final comments. Yeah. Okay, we're all set, thank you. Yeah, great, no, that's a, this is good. So, um... Okay, public hearing. So we're first going to go to uh, to public testimony. Um, Secretary Polhemis, do we have anyone who would like to testify? Yes. I'm going to start with E. Smith again. The hand that doesn't go down. You can unmute yourself. Okay. Zai Bear, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Z, and I've lived and worked in Fort Point for eight years. I'm strongly opposed to this project in its current form. Despite what the developer purported in their presentation, the community feedback for this project has been consistently and overwhelmingly negative. This isn't a case of nimbyism. We're pro-development, we're pro-job creation, we're pro-union jobs, but we expect good and well-designed development that serves our neighborhood and our city. Our feedback and our suggestions on how to improve the project have gone largely unaddressed. Here's the gist of what we've been saying since the public process began. The architecture isn't appropriate for a building that's in the heart of the historic landmarks district. It looks like a seaport building. All design precedents cited by the developer in their presentations at public process meetings have been new builds within the neighborhood. Use is a lab puts PDA 53 behind its long planned goal of one third residential and much needed affordable housing. If that's not financially feasible at this site, the community seeks assurance that the BPDA and the city are committed to enforcing the plan on third residential for Fort Point. Additionally, there's been no communication regarding the implications of the biosafety levels being proposed, nor safety and accident reporting protocols. And third, this project doesn't con contribute meaningful ground floor ac activation on a street that badly needs revitalization. It's only contributing 350 square feet. <laughs> We saw how well the public process worked with a fantastic channel side development by related bill. Tonight, you're considering a project that has virtually no community support and whose public process was questionable at best. 
The project was misclassified and there's only been one public meeting since it was properly classified as a South Boston waterfront project. There have been no public meetings since the project was rescheduled from consideration in December. The Fort Point Landmarks Commission took up the project prior to any Article 80 process, making it impossible for subsequent landmark meetings to approve the facade. Two landmark seats are vacant. The others expired three to six years ago. The project is just 500 square feet shy of even going to DC. The developer has yet to secure the air rights for this project. And again, they have not addressed any community concerns. I urge you to send the proponent back to the drawing board before approving this project so that it can be something great that sets a proper precedent for the expectations of their responsibility to the city and respect for the public <clears throat> process. Thank you. Thank you. Vincent Coyle, you can unmute yourself. Yes, Vincent Coyle, business agent, I August Local 7. Uh, I'm in support of this project. Uh, my members live here I work here. Uh, we're just on the street from this project and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Ward, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Tommy Ward. It was a decent presentation. You know, I'm all for the project. You know, being a Boston resident, now you can say my life being almost 65. I've been here a long time, and uh, you know, it'll be a big uh, asset to that part of the South Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Ready? You can unmute yourself. Thanks, Secretary Polinus, and I appreciate everybody hanging in. It's been a long night. Uh, Chair, Chair, Rail Host, members of the board, Chief Jemison. My name is Tom Ready. I'm an IAG member for this. Southern Channel Center project. I'm speaking on behalf of the IAG with their unanimous support. As members, we are providing comments that were previously shared with the BPA staff and City of Boston elected officials. We are working on various elements of this project, in, including right up to yesterday, and we'll continue to stay engaged to ensure the project delivers value uh, for the residents, visitors, and businesses alike in our neighborhood. Our feedback is focused on the benefits the project delivers. We specifically disagree with the identification of $250,000 for the improvement of Iron Street Park. Uh, for reference, it is privately owned and privately managed as a public benefit in the submitted board memo for the project. Specifically on page nine of the board memo, of the board mem memo, apologies if I could quote, the project will have a number of public benefits, including contr contribution of $250,000 to the Channel Center Owners Association to fund capital improvements to Science Street Park to create a more active, dynamic, and multi-use public environment. It should be noted that when PDA 53 was initially approved in 2001, as the proponent indicated, one of the public benefits listed was the creation and maintenance of open space, obviously, within the, plan, the PDA plan area. That included Iron Street Park. The responsibility for maintenance and operation of that space was assigned to a body named the Channel Center, Owners Asso Channel Center Owners Association. This association is comprised of all property owners within the PDA plan area, including the proponent of this project. You know, we agree that some benefit may be derived from the improvement of the park. We object to the, uh, to the allocation of public mit mitigation benefits to a private association that has responsibility for the space. Simply stated, if the park needs to be improved, the association currently has the ability to just fix it without this project. We have, we have identified a number of other areas where this money could be assigned to provide benefit to the public. We just request that the board take appropriate action by requesting staff to reevaluate their public benefits recommendations and, if necessary, put the funds in a, in a BPDA project account until this matter is reconciled. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Jamison. This is Minor Perez representing hundreds of members from the Carpenters Union to live and work around the city of Boston. This is a great proposed project, and we have uh, enthusiastically supporting it. Uh, we're in full favor of it. Thank you. Thanks, Minor. Gary Walker, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Secretary uh, Secretary Polimus, uh, Director Jemison, once again, Gary Walker, Electrical Workers Local 103, I'd like to speak in strong support. We'd certainly like to thank uh, Matt Price and his team for uh, sticking with this project. It's been a long time coming, and we appreciate the jobs. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Cade uh, Gennard, you can unmute yourself. 
Yeah, hi, Cage and I'm resident of South Boston, and I support this project and uh, can't wait to see the neighborhood develop. Thank you. Thank you. Robert McDonough, I think I said that right. You can unmute yourself. Yep, uh, thank you, Ron. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak. My name is Rob McDonough, business agent for Labor's Local 223. And on behalf of the hundreds of members I represent who are residents of the city of Boston, I would like to pledge my support for this project. I think it's going to be a great upgrade to the neighborhood and um, a piece of property that so desperately needs it. Thank you again. Thank you. Milan Kohut. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. I am the artist living in 15 Channel Center Street, which is almost next door. And I strongly oppose that that building would be used for a lab. I have a small child. And I am terrified that uh, there will be some projects done behind our back like happened at Boston University where they like started to do gain on function research you know not telling anybody so I am strongly opposing the use it for a lab and I have learned after being here 35 years in the US that capitalists are always cheating and lying in order to make profits so I don't trust that it will stay at the level second, you know, as the lab, because I have learned that there is always, I am sure, possibility to upgrade those levels until the possible fourth level. So I oppose it strongly. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Anthony Zanino, you can unmute yourself. Hello, Che Rojas, BPDA board, um, and Westbrook for presenting the new design. Uh, I am also a resident of 15 Channel Center. Uh, I live in an affordable unit in the building uh, that is reserved for artists. Uh, we, my partner and I have been on the waiting list for six years to uh, move into an affordable unit in the city. And uh, I think this speaks to a bigger problem, lack of affordable housing that's come up many times, not only with regard to this development, but we've heard in the previous projects tonight, uh, those projects were supported in part because they created affordable housing on the site. This project doesn't do that. I understand having attended the previous public meeting for this project, uh, it's unlikely to not go ahead as lab space despite whatever uh, economic trends around that. Um, so all I'll say is that, um, you know, I think that the BPDA needs to do a better job of fulfilling its mandate and mission, which is to work to bring in developers to provide more housing, including affordable units, to support artist housing in what is meant to become an artist district. Um, also, I, I appreciate the union members who've spoken up um, in support of construction jobs. And I only would say that I, I would hope that our union brothers and sisters out there would recognize that the permanent jobs created in this space are going to be predominantly non-union jobs, um, you know, in R&D and biotech. Um, and even in a proposed cafe, those are likely to be non-union jobs. So it would be much better to create a development that isn't going to be bringing in workers from outside of the city to work in lab spaces, but rather jobs, union jobs for Boston residents. Thank you all for for um, for listening and for hosting this and for the long night that you've all had. Thank you, Michael Burns. You can unmute yourself. Hi, right, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, Madam Chair Rojas, Director Jemison, and the BPDA board members. My name is Michael Burns. I am a council rep for the Northeast Regional Council of Sheet Metal Workers, representing hundreds of women and men that live and work in the city of Boston. Uh, I'd just like to thank the BPDA for uh, the community process, and we look forward to working on the project. We stand tonight in support of the project. Thank you. Thank you. William um, Friese or Fries? 
You can unmute yourself. Well, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, very good. Uh, yes, my name is Bill Fries. I'm a 24-7 resident artist that lives at 15 Channel Center Street. Uh, I've been here since uh, 2005 and I object fully to the proposed life science lab uh, at 7 Channel Center Street. Um, <sighs> injecting a, a bio uh, life center lab a few feet away from many uh, residential buildings and also the Sunrise uh, Learning Academy for child day daycare. Um, I don't. I don't think that's a good fit. So, um, and I also oppose the uh, the uh, the alignment with the. Um, local buildings as far as the building height goes. Um, so it's not co it's coherent with the, uh, with the building um, street levels. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Amy, Amy McDonald, you can unmute yourself. Um, hi, thanks for uh, what will be a very quick comment. I am also a resident artist at 15 Channel Center Street, and um, I do not want to live next to a bio lab. Um, that's that's it for reasons others have already stated, especially Z Bear. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. Okay, I've got a couple more. M Mario Avila, you can unmute yourself. Hello, actually, my name is Hannah. I have to uh, take uh, my partner's uh, uh, Zoom over because we've waited uh, so long. We had other commitments, and he's on my computer on, the, on another Zoom. Um, I, I agree with everything uh, Z said in the very first comment. You can practically take her, uh, her comment, and everyone in our building, which houses about uh, 80 families or uh, and, and other uh, residential buildings on the street, will agree with most of what she has said. The, our main uh, problem, of course, is uh, having BioLab on our little street, on our little private street, next uh, uh, couple doors. Uh, down to uh, daycare. Um, there is a, this is the last bu undeveloped building in Fort Point, and we are still hoping that it, uh, BPDA will uh, uh, go with the residents and try to push for a uh, residential building. There is, a, there is a housing crisis everywhere. We do not need any more labs. We know from uh, the news that they are springing up everywhere. Uh, the, the whole process was uh, peculiar, uh, if um, I, I'm not sure how else uh, to word it, because when the project went in front of the Landmarks Commission, it was not uh, even proposed to, uh, to the public yet. Uh, the Landmark Commission in the second meeting was uh, somehow unaware to the, uh, uh, to the strong opposition of uh, the public. There was practically 100% opposition to this project in the public meeting. Thank you. Please read our comments. Please read our letters that we have been submitting. Thank you. Th thank you, Anna. Scott Lindbergh, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi, my name is Scott Lindbergh. I'm at 300 Summer Street. Um, I'd just like to uh, signal the BPDA that 
you know, given on the heels of the related bill collaboration, there was success with that and widespread agreement. And the intent was to achieve design excellence and community collaboration. I still think there's room for improvement with that effort, with this particular project. And I think really the opportunity to achieve outstanding projects is the goal for this area of Fort Point. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to testify about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. <coughs> Madam Chair, I believe we're concluded this piece of it. Okay, great. Uh, do we have any written testimony uh, to be read? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I do have um, six letters, three in opposition and three in support. I will uh, go ahead and start with uh, three letters of uh, opposition received. Uh, the first one is from uh, Amy and Kai Nguyen. Um, it reads, we oppose Seven Channel Center uh, Street, uh, Boston being covered, converted into residential and development lab use, especially specifically in a neighborhood which has already established residential areas next door. This project has been rushed and not given a full consideration on the scope and such project. The vote, must, the vote must be postponed. We oppose medical science labs being next door to our housing and small businesses. At the end of December 7th meeting, it was mentioned that Seven Channel Center in Boston was set to be built into an office space and are these spaces 21 years ago. Who has made the decision where is this paperwork? Why this hasn't initially been proposed in a residential area recently and then changed? Something does not that add up. We ask that, we, we when we ask human life life is worth and we compare millions to 1.3 million to that will be contributed to affordable housing from this project to be used somewhere this will be a great failure for the community housing specifically affordable housing is of greater value to the community here at the midway artist studios we already suffered uh, when ops core began here and had to be placed in a more appropriate area moving to the industrial area of boston because of smells and fumes it's also mentioned in the meeting that Westbrook Labs, the proposed tenant, has buildings already outside of Boston. This is where the labs, labs must stay. Inappropriate use of Boston land diminishes a residential business area and moves in an unfair direction for the people. It is more important that Boston is a human city or lucrative city. Sacrificing humanity for a, the wealth of some seems unreasonable for this neighborhood. Thank you for your concern and appropriate action at this matter. Amy and Kai and Ewan. Um, I'll now move on to the second letter in opposition from Sophie Stokes. Hello, I'm a longtime resident, 10 years of Channel Center Street. I have made Fort Point my home, and, uh, and I'm now uh, raising a child here. My family is certainly not in favor of a multi-tenant biolaboratory next door. Our chief concerns are <laughs> what safeguards will be play in place for us residents in case of an accident. The issue has not been adequately addressed and is, of course, deeply concerning to us. How will bio lab and uh, how will a bio lab add value to the neighborhood? Will the ground floor be adequately activated on our residential street, or just another closed door? Our concerns are echoed by our neighborhoods and by our neighbors, and need to be addressed in a dialogue between developer and neighborhood residents and businesses. Regards, Sophie Stokes and family. Uh, and now we'll move on to the third uh, letter of opposition from Barbara Kipperman. Uh, good morning. This is a big phase no to the proposed development of Seven Channel Center. Please consider the following. A life science lab is a very narrow, primarily residential street, allowing a deal still to the developer. The purchase price offer, which our building would receive a portion, is significantly below the current market rates for new laboratory buildings. The offer is 83% below of the 2021 appraised value of the lab space. The appraised value is 2.5 million. The current offer is 439000 uh, to 2 million less than the appraisal. Regardless of one person's aesthetics, is there already enough modern glass contemporary construction in Boston? Shouldn't there be any effort to maintain historic areas? Thank you for your consideration, Barbara Kipperman. Um, and I have uh, letters uh, support from uh, that I have here. I will uh, first read. Um, a letter from uh, Council President Ed, Ed Flynn in conjunction with Council Michael Flaherty at City Council at Large. 
um, and rates uh, support for Seven Channel Center. Dear members of the BPDA board, we are writing in support of the proposed project at Seven Channel Center located in the Fort Point neighborhood of South Boston. This project has been through different iterations since the early 2000s, and the current proposal is one that will activate foot traffic in the area, improve the city's economic viability and recovery, and take into account impact to surrounding neighbors. The project process the demolition of existing vacant building while reconstructing, reconstructing the facade with existing materials to the extent possible. In its place will be a new nine-story office research and development building with ground floor retail. The project team will contribute to the Channel Center Mitigation Fund along with commitments to the capital improvements of Iron Street Park as well as uh, uh, funding mm -hmm. af affordable housing, workforce development, transportation infrastructure, and A Street shuttle. Moreover, the respect to the ground floor activation, the proponent committed to retail space on the ground floor had and agreed to uh, subsidize a user due to importance to the neighborhood. In addition, BSL level three and four lab uses for being on the site and project and, and project and the management team have, are committed to ensuring that the safety measures are strictly enforced. Lastly, the project design was approved by the Fort Point Channel Landmark District Commission last year and was subsequently altered due to the feedback gained by the community process. We acknowledge that there are some outstanding concerns from the neighbors and respectfully request that the proponent continue to work to engage the community throughout this process. If you have any questions, please contact our offices. Um, sincerely, Ed Flynn, Boston City Council President, District 2, and Michael Flaherty, Boston City Councilor at large. Now I'll move on to the second uh, area in support. As a resident of Fort Point adjacent to the, the Channel Center, I am supportive of the proposed life science development at Seven Channel Center. The redevelopment of a long year underutilized buildings is not invi invitable, but necessary to support the health and viability of the city. Our, neighbors, our neighborhood and the entire city will benefit from the addition of this new state-of-the-art life science and office building of several reasons. The neighborhood has expressed the fatigue of new residential proposals due to the density and limited parking. The transit-oriented development enriches the neighborhood by furthering the mixes, the mix of uses, live, work, approach, and walkable neighborhoods that are consistent with a sustainable future. Additionally, the project will be an economic stimulus for the area, small businesses, and restaurants. Uh, finally, commercial and lab development uh, presents opportunities for South Boston residents. Life science, sciences provide jobs, options at all levels, including skilled and unskilled, un unskilled positions. Additionally, this project will provide a new tax revenue to the city and will certainly add value to the neighborhood versus to the, exist, to, the, to the existing use. I encourage the city to continue to work with all of us and improve this, as this development. Thank you for the opportunity to express my support in this project. James T. Morris. And uh, lastly, uh, the last uh, letter from Adrian Wigmore, President, Artist Building at 300 Corporate Boards of Directors. We, the Board of Directors at the Artist Building 300 Corporate uh, Cooperative Corporation, representing some 70 residents in our building in Four Point Channels, would like to express our support for A Street Channel Center neighbors' positions at the January 12, 2023 landmark hearing for Seven Channel Center. At this meeting, uses of program aesthetics and approval process were all cited by our neighbors as not aligning with the community's previous requests. We support the restoration of the uh, and renovations to the Four Point Channel. Uh, landmark district, particularly uh, particularly after all the efforts of the community stakeholders since the district was landmark, landmarked under Mayor uh, Thomas Menino. Our historic area will be enhanced, enriched by the Seven Channel Center developers working with A Street and Channel Center neighbors is a more collaborative effort. Sincerely, Adrian Whitmore, President, Artist Building at 300 Corporate Board of Directors. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so let's move to questions and comments from the board. Um, we'll, can the proponents just respond very, very briefly to uh, the concerns that were raised uh, by the artist, particularly in terms of um, uh, safety? Uh, sure, happy to do so. Uh, so conjunction with our project I think the the concern pertained to the use so I'd have a couple comments the the use is an allowed use under the PDA notwithstanding that we we recognize the concern um, there are uh, already other such uses in the neighborhood uh, there's also there's, there are no immediate residential butters there are commercial uh, properties between our project 
um, and, and the residential. Um, but notwithstanding any of those elements, we've committed to um, engaging with the community and uh, through email communication to neighbors, both during construction and after construction, um, utilizing opt-in emails um, and ensuring that there's a comprehensive list to the extent there of, that folks are aware of activities in the building and to the extent there was ever any incident. And uh, from, uh, and in response to the community, uh, we've agreed to prohibit the use of biosafety levels three and four, which reduces the risk of any potential microbes use in the building, which again was in response to the community and, and something um, to reduce that risk. And finally, I would just point out that there are uh, significant codes, regulations, laws that govern the construction, both of the building, but also the specific use of each space, you know, whether it's fire code with NFPA 45, building code, state fire code, Boston Fire Department has uh, reporting obligations that need to be inspected prior to obtaining a certificate of occupancy. So there are a number of controls in place um, that will uh, protect all, all the neighborhood in conjunction with the build out of any space. Okay, I think just just going on going on that, and thank you, Dr. Landsmark, for um, uh, for opening up that line of line of questioning. So, look, I think uh, this is you know biosafety in general is is a concern for you know for a lot of residents of the city, and, you know, including my, including myself. Um, and so, um, you know, again, while we may talk about this, live and know it every day, right? Like that's not the reality of, of most people. <laughs> um, so, um, so there is, you know, there is an expectation uh, both prior to, and I know there have been efforts made, right? But also, you know, um, ongoing of the, um, you know, of, of the teams, right? To, to keep on, um, uh, to keep on like educating, Right and and answering people's questions um, as they come up. Um, we had some thank you to those who uh, who testified today. I uh, appreciate you staying through the meeting um, to to do so, so that does not go unnoticed. Uh, we have read your you know your your letters and um, and the expectation that we set as a board is that you know is that those are those are answered and, and responded to uh, by members of the agency um, and the developer so it seems like we do have uh, some additional communication that's needed um, to um, you know to uh, to address those very valid uh, concerns including you know whether or not we list public benefits the iron park thing I'm you know didn't quite get all, all of that, but uh, but I think there's some there's def well I know <laughs> there are some definitely uh, you know uh, valid uh, comments there um, that we've received. So uh, so we're going to take you know uh, we're going to take a vote. It will turn out however it turns out. <laughs> um, but uh, but the expectation is is that we uh, that you know there is some follow up work done after this, and it's what we're doing as an entire like agency as an entire city. Right and um, kind of figuring out how we all live uh, um, uh, in this this great life sciences ecosystem um, that we have right in a in a, a safe and, and equitable fair manner. So, um, with that, do we have any other questions or comments? I have a com uh, comment, Madam Chair. The as, as Mr. Price said, this is an allowed use. It's really not up for discussion. I mean, people can have a comment about. But it's allowed, and um, the building has has the four sided building. Three sides of that building, um, you have drivable streets. It's attached to one building, which is an office building. And uh, with respect to bio, uh, I look at bio a little differently. Thank God that our economy in Boston is diversified enough to have people that want to do bio. We the city the city runs off real estate taxes. And with COVID and people working from home, the amount of vacancies that we have, square footage that we have, it's, um, we're in trying times right now. You can't work from home doing lab work. So it's actually good that we, we're diversified in our economy. I think it's a perfectly safe project and, uh, and there's nobody living next door to it. Not, this isn't the case that we had a couple, couple of weeks ago. We had an attached wall with people sleeping on the other side of the wall. 
this is an office building. So I think it's a good project. Thank you, Dr. Monaghan. Um, great. Um, so if there are no other questions or comments, the vote motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for participating. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, all right, so uh, we have our um, our last public hearing, <laughs> and I tried to start with it, but <laughs> but um, okay. So 620. Let's see. We, this is the 776 Summer Street project. Um, this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority, doing business as a Boston Planning and Development Agency, being held in conformance with Article 80B-5 and 80C-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the proposed development plan for phase one within plan development area number 128, L Street Station redevelopment, and to consider the L Street Station redevelopment known as 776 Summer Street project as development impact project. This hearing was duly advertised on January 4th, 2023 in the Boston Herald. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present the case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking both support and opposition at the same time. So if you're planning on testifying, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click on the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal to the staff that you would like to speak, and when your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you are calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be giving up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain at that time. Please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. And finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they so desire. Now, Stephen Harvey will begin the presentation. There we go. Sorry, I was having a bit of- And you're away. Come on. <laughs> well, the camera wasn't working properly, so I had to do a little bit of uh, big tech. Oh, no worries. Um, good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Jameson. My name is Stephen Harvey, and I'm a senior project manager at the BBDA, and I want to thank you for your time this evening. The proposal I bring before you today for consideration is phase one of the development plan for the plan development area PPA number 128, L Street, L Street Station Redevelopment 776 Summer Street located in South Boston. On June 21st, 2022, the BPDA received the project, notica project notification form and PPA for phase one of the development plan. Phase one of the development plan proposes to develop 8.4 acres of the 15.2 acre PDA master plan area. The PDA master plan was previously approved by the BBDA board on January 14, 2021. Phase one of the development plan proposes the construction of two new life science buildings and the renovation of an existing Edison turbine halls. Phase one of the development plan also provides a long list of community benefits and mitigation that when added up will contribute millions to the neighborhood and city. Most notably and priceless is the 3.7 acres of public open space, which has been inaccessible to the public for decades. In closing, I held two virtual public meetings and one virtual IAG meeting for the proposal. All meetings were well attended and brought about thoughtful discussions about the proposal. Both virtual public meetings were advertised in local papers and via email. The comment period for this proposal ended on November 11th, 2022. I would now like to pass it over to my colleague, my colleague and BBDA South Boston neighborhood planner, Eileen Michaud. Eileen, Eileen will present the planning context for the proposal. Once Eileen completes the planning context, uh, Michelle Schock of Help of Helco Redevelopment Partners, the proponent, will present the proposal in detail. Once Michelle, Melissa, I apologize, Melissa, Melissa completes the presentation. We will answer any questions put forward by the board. Thank you for your time today. 
Thank you, uh, thank you Stephen. Good evening, Chair Rojas, Secretary Polhemis, members of the board, and Director Jemison. Uh, once again, and last time for tonight, my name is Eileen Michaud, and I am the VPD Neighborhood Planner for South Boston. The proposed project is the first of multiple phases of development and highlighted on the site plan on the slide in orange and pink. Uh, that will comprise the full build out of the approximately 15 acre master plan site. The master plan seeks to transform a former, formerly industrial site into a neighborhood scale destination connected to the existing street network and neighborhood fabric. Staff review, staff review ensure that this phase of development is consistent with the approved master plan for PDA number 128 and reflects the community visioning process that took place in 2017. This process resulted in a redevelopment vision and redevelopment concepts for the master plan site, which among other goals include the creation of publicly accessible open space at the waterfront, a pedestrian scale street network that improves connectivity to the existing neighborhood, and a variety of retail, cultural, and civic uses. Importantly, staff considered the site of the proposed project as it straddles two different land use contexts. The primarily low scale South Boston residential neighborhood just south of the site along East First Street and large scale marine industrial and new research and development uses at the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park and Conley Terminal to the east and north of the site. Uh, next slide please. The proposed project leverages the unique context of the site to create several public benefits that achieve the cited planning goals. The proposed project creates physical and visual buffers when necessary, particularly at Block F, closest to Conley Terminal, while facilitating access to views and recreational opportunities with 3.7 acres of publicly accessible open space delivered in this first phase of development. Among several site design modifications that occurred during project review, the removal of a through site roundabout off an M Street extension will be replaced with a passively activated M Street Plaza between Block F and future Block E that overlooks the reserve channel and the Marine Industrial Park beyond. This change contributes to the creation of a connected pedestrian scale network throughout the site. Lastly, the proposed project supplies a mix of neighborhood serving uses that draw passers by into the site and facilitate engagement with the site's history. Retail uses along the ground floor of Block D on Summer Street create a welcoming gateway to the interior of the site, where a fully pedestrianized turbine alley connects to several civic and retail spaces inside the early 20, 20th century brick turbine halls. Pending board approval and design review, the proposed project will proceed to the Zoning Commission for approval of the proposed Phase 1 development plan. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to the development team to present the project in greater detail. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, good evening, Chair Rojas, members of the board, Director Jemison, and Secretary Pohamas. I'm Melissa Schrock, Executive Vice President of Mixed Use Development at Hilco Redevelopment Partners. I'm joined tonight by Greg Bielecki from our partners at Redgate and many others on our development and consultant team. We're very pleased to be with you this evening to present the first phase of redevelopment at 776. As you know, the project received unanimous approval from this board in January of 21 on our PDA master plan. Over the last year, we've been working collaboratively with city staff from BPDA, BTD, and other agencies to refine the design of phase one, which has a substantial public realm component and is wholly consistent with our approved master plan. We've also held two public meetings and an IAG meeting specifically on this phase, received input from the Boston Preservation Alliance, and brought phase one through BCDC, where we received unanimous approval earlier this month. We're very grateful for all the excellent feedback received throughout the process from the community, agency staff, local leaders, and elected officials, which has helped us to make an even better project. As you've just seen, phase one offers substantial public benefits that align with city priorities, including significant housing and jobs linkage, jobs creation and investment in the South Boston local community, 
The project will offer economic incentives for WMDBE and local retail businesses, internships for local and underrepresented students, newly created public open space, $10 million to improve tra neighborhood transit, historic preservation of significant structures, a new seawall and elevating the site for resiliency, and of course, the environmental cleanup of a contaminated site. Located here in South Boston along the reserve channel, the site is adjacent to Conley Terminal and sits at the threshold between the rapidly redeveloping seaport and the South Boston residential neighborhood. Next slide, please. Formerly a coal-fired power plant, once owned and operated by Thomas Edison himself, the site has been cut off from the surrounding community for over 120 years. The plant was closed in 2007, but sat mostly dormant for nearly a decade until we acquired it in 2016 and began permitting the master plan. Next slide, please. After receiving our master plan approval, we began planning the abatement and removal of obsolete, obsolete structures on the site. The deconstruction phase started in December of 2021 and will continue until the fall of this year. Next. The phase one project, as you've heard, includes the preservation and adaptive reuse of all three Edison turbine halls and the construction of two new life science buildings at blocks D and F on either side of the site. Additionally, we'll deliver a 2.7 acre waterfront promenade, a plaza at the termination of M Street in an interim condition, a portion of the pedestrian turbine alley, new internal roadways, and offsite improvements to Summer Street. This phase front loads much of the public benefit the project has to offer. Future phases will include new buildings along East First Street at blocks A, B, and C, as well as the 1898 Turbine Hall and block E. Those future blocks contain residential, hotel, and additional R&D and retail uses. Next. As a focal point of the project, the Edison Turbine Halls will be transformed from machine-centric uses to human-centric uses, offering new indoor-outdoor connectivity, neighborhood retail and restaurants, and a new civic and cultural space. Designed by S9 and Arrow Street, here you see images of Turbine Hall's one's interior reimagined into a market hall that spills out into Turbine Alley, and a new generous entry connects the building to the waterfront while preserving the original arched window and mercury keystone. Next. On the other end of the site, adjacent to the neighborhood on East First Street, a new arcade is opened up through Turbine Hall 3 to create a welcoming entry for the South Boston community. Once inside, the ground floor offers new civic space that can be used for temporary exhibits and community events. Of course, the pièce de résistance will be the preservation in place of Edison's Turbine Number 8 where visitors will be able to learn about the compelling history of electrical innovation that occurred on the site. Once completed, visitors will be able to walk all the way from East First Street to the waterfront through the turbine halls, passing historic features and points of interest as they go. Next. Just to the west of the turbine halls at the Summer Street entry is Block D, a life science building with ground floor retail. Designed by Payette, the building includes a through lobby from Summer Street to Turbine Alley, adding to the permeability of the new district. The form is a rigorous externalization of a typical lab module and steps backward towards the south in respect of the Chapter 91 setback, creating a dynamic series of terraces animating the waterfront. Next. This rigorous geometry is modulated at key moments to emphasize the lobby entry on Summer Street or to gesture back toward the neighborhood at the corner of Elkins, the Elkin Street extension. Next. On the east side of the site, designed by Perkins and Will, is Block F. It's the largest building in Phase 1, and it helps provide a buffer between the site and the activities of Conley Terminal. The design features a series of folded planes that break down the mass and offer moments of transparency looking back towards the neighborhood. Next. Fronting onto the future M Street Plaza, Block F features a highly transparent ground floor designed to harmonize with the planning and programming of the adjacent open space. Next. And finally, just a few views of the public open space around the project. 
Here you can see the entirety of the waterfront promenade with block D to, to the right, block F to the left, and the Edison turbine halls in the middle. In the foreground, you can see the rebuilt seawall, and along the waterfront, many historic artifacts will be preserved and woven into an interpretive plan, including the large gantry crane, the greenhouse platforms, and the pipe elbows. Next. Waterfront will be animated not only by these historic artifacts, but also by ground floor retail spilling out, as well as seasonal events, such as farmers markets, art fairs, or an ice skating rink. Additionally, the project fills in a missing link along Boston's Harbor Walk, connecting First Street Park to Castle Island. Next. Up from the waterfront on M Street Plaza, adjacent to Block F, that offers more passive recreation and creates a green link back to the existing open space network of the neighborhood. Next. And lastly, at the northern end of M Street Plaza, linking it down to the waterfront promenade is an overlook lawn affording the possibility for neighborhood activities like picnics, and yoga classes, movie nights, and offering spectacular views of Boston's skyline. For fortunate enough to receive the board's approval this evening, we look forward to beginning the transformation of this former industrial site into a mixed-use community integrated into the surrounding neighborhood, providing waterfront access, community amenities, and offering new economic opportunities. We thank you and we're available to answer any questions. Great, thanks so much. So, um, so this is a public hearing, so we'll uh, we'll rinse and repeat. So we have uh, anybody who would like to testify? Uh, Secretary Paul Hemus. Allison Coyne, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, Hello. I'm Al Hi, I'm Allison Coyne. I'm a Boston resident and I'm also currently working on this project. I started as an apprentice and graduated to a journeyman at the Edison. I support this project because, because it's been a life-changing opportunity for myself and for my family. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Jim Covino, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Covino. And uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can oh, hear okay. you. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, I sit on the IG and I'm a long-term resident of uh, South Boston. Do hope the board uh, approves this plan uh, for the phase one. It's been uh, a long process, uh, and I feel that, it, particularly over the past year and a half or two years, uh, that the developer development team has really listened and heard and internalized the comments coming out of the community about uh, integration and making it feel more part of the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, so I, I was a proponent prior to that, but in, in even more enthusiastic about the project term. So I hope you support it. Thank you. Brian Graves, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. Oh. Sorry, Brian. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, sorry about that. Good evening, my name is Brian Graves. I live on East First Street, about two blocks from the site. Um, I've been talking to uh, Redgate and Hilco, Melissa, Irene, and others on the Hilco team. Um, I'm in favor of uh, phase one, particularly the uh, attention to the open space and working on uh, those items that are going to bring the most public benefits soonest to the neighborhood. So again, I'm in favor of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Earhart, you can unmute yourself. Good evening. This is Anne Earhart. I'm here to speak in support of the project, both professionally and personally. Professionally, I own a business called Everstreet that helps bring retail shops, restaurants, street level activation to the city of Boston 
I think this is a fantastic opportunity for a curated lineup of retail shops and restaurants to really anchor the neighborhood. Personally, my husband and I own a condo around the corner on G Street, and we feel that this greatly enhances the economic value of the real estate that we own, but also greatly enhances the um, quality of, of the experience of living in South Boston, creating a place where people of all ages and all stages of life can come together will be great for a neighborhood and continue to build the sense of community for which Southie is so well known. Um, and so with that, I'd like to be clear that I'm in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Ward, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. Give me one second. Hey, uh, thank you for this presentation. It's been a long night and uh, so far to be a Bostonian with all these jobs. and. I go by this job at least four times a day. Uh, I'm working down the seaport, and I see the, how this project's progressed and the, the quality work they're doing. And seeing that I saw come down with this beautiful project they want to develop, it's nothing but a, a bonus for all of us. And, you know, I'm for, all for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher Ryan. Could you, you can unmute yourself. Hi, Chris Ryan, resident. Uh, definitely for this project. I like how it's going to bring Southie into the seaport and uh, looking forward to seeing this project uh, get on the way and uh, get complete. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Michael Burns, you can unmute yourself. Mike Burns, Capital. Thank you once again, uh, Secretary Lemus, uh, Madam Chair Rojas, Director Jemison, and the BPD board. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Burns, Council Rep for the Northeast Regional Council of Sheet Metal Workers. I represent hundreds of men and women in the city of Boston. Uh, and I'd like to thank, once again, the BPDA for this community process involving everyone. Uh, we look forward to this, uh, working on this project. And uh, thank you all for your marathon night that you've all put in. Appreciate your efforts. Have a good night, all. Thank you. Minor Perez, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Minor Perez, representing hundreds of union carpenters that live and work throughout the city of Boston, just for the call and record support, and thanks for staying on all night long. Thank you, Minor. Robert McDonough, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, just like to read everybody else, um, thanks everybody for staying on. Rob McDonough, Liam Local 223. Um, just want to show my full support for this project and looking forward to continuing the work with the uh, construction team over there. Thank you. Thank you. James Fleming, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Jimmy Fleming. I'm a business agent with International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 103, representing the electrical workers that live and work in the city of Boston. And uh, like the other people, I'd like to speak today on behalf of my members in strong support of this project. Thanks. Thank you. Allison Drescher, you can unmute yourself. Um, hello, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, BPDA staff. Uh, my name is Allison Drescher, and as a director Allison, we, we can't hear you anymore. Are you able to hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I okay. I'm having a sound problem. I apologize. Um, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So my name is Allison Drescher, and as a direct to butter and member of the IJ since inception, I'd like to voice support phase one of this project. Through several years of community discussion, the project revitalizes a defunct power plant into an exciting mixed-use project. The historical preservation of the turbine hall is notable. The inclusion of almost four acres of public access to the South Boston waterfront is only one of many benefits of the project. There has, been all, there has also been a significant mitigation package which will bring substantial benefits to the South Boston community. So much for your time. Thank you, Allison. Would anybody else like to speak about this project? Please raise your virtual hand. 
Madam Chair, I believe we're concluded. All right. Uh, Stephen, do we have any written testimony? Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll read those uh, quickly. Um, <laughs> two minutes, two minutes a letter. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a letter from Council President and District 2 uh, City Councilor Ed Flynn. Uh, dear members of the BPDA board, I am writing today regarding the board's agenda item on the phase one development plan for 776 Summer Street, the site of the former South Boston Edison power plant. Phase one proposes the rehabilitation of the Edison turbine holes one, two, and three, as well as the construction of the buildings on block D and F. The buildings would include uses for office, research and development, retail, and civic and cultural spaces. This planned phase would include 650 parking spaces, significant public open space along the waterfront, improved pedestrian access, as well as landscape beautification and the creation of the M Street Plaza. With respect to this phase of the project, I am respectfully requesting that the development team continue to engage with my neighbors and be responsive to their concerns and quality of life issues that com the community has called attention to throughout this process. Pest and rodent control, traffic congestion, pedestrian and workspace safety, as well as environmental concerns. I hope that the BPDA board and development team will continue to listen to the concerns of the community and work to address these quality of life issues during the construction phase. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at edflynn at boston.gov or at 617-635-3203. Sincerely, Ed Flynn, Ed Flynn, Boston City Councilor, District 2. Um, the next letter, apologies, um, is from Phil Totter. I am an abutter at East First I would like to fully support this project. The developer has been responsive and responsible during the deconstruction phases of the project. When my building at East First Street had concerns, they were immediately addressed and appropriate communication followed. The rendering of the proposed waterfront park and repurposed Edison building are wonderful and I will be a drastic improvement from the existing structure. We are excited as we watch the progress here at East First Street, full support. Um, the next letter is Jamie Simchek, to whom it concerns. My name is Jamie Simchek, and I live at K Street. On behalf of my family, I want to write in support of the approval of the first phase of the re redevelopment of 776 Summer Street. We are very excited for the rehabilitation of the Edison uh, Turbine Hall 1, 2, and 3, and the construction of the building on Block D and F. While we appreciate the nod to the history of the property, we also cannot wait for the chain link fence to come down and welcome redevelopment to begin taking place. We are looking forward to new buildings, new people, and new amenities. Thank you in advance for your consideration, Jamie. And the last letter is from uh, Jason Kaplan. Um, dear VPA board, I'm a proud homeowner in the South Boston neighborhood of Boston. I strongly support the development of 776 Summer Street in Southie as it will increase the amount of housing in the neighborhood, redevelop an area of the neighborhood that has been dormant and abandoned for years and help stabilize rent demand for what has become an unaffordable area of our great city. Please approve without delay. Sincerely, Jason Kaplan. Um, and I believe that is the end of the comments, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, one person on the phone um, that we, we want to recognize and, uh, and allow to testify. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I bet I need to get on the phone. I need to go ahead. Thank you. I want to apologize to our uh, chief of awareness. Uh, I am having uh, difficulties with my computer. You called on me multiple times and I was on the need to respond. So, uh, good evening uh, to the BCPA chair and the board members. And I am uh, an IOG member uh, and a long life uh, resident of South Boston. And I do have a couple of comments. 
And they don't, unfortunately, um, I don't agree with other uh, REG members. Uh, and I, I like to join with the building, the shiny, black, middle building. Um, they, they have no support or significance to the South Boston neighborhood. There's so many different buildings and there's no connection or relationship to us. It's visually just another extension of the group for the the They're done for investors. They're cold. They're unwelcoming. We should have warm work. We should have colors that complement these things. I know that there is all different buildings because diversity is discussed as we go as architecture, but diversity doesn't work without continuity of buildings. The entry and entrance is, is to me, it's a nice block, there's no grass or trees, it's not in my neighborhood. There's a green space that comes out of it once you have entered, entered the project site. The neighboring residents have no latitude unless entering on private water. The other good walls that are coming down and fastening the place with the wall that is separately taller building heights surrounding new tenants and residents. The dormitory entrance is included to the future funding and residents. And the developer that expects the children to have a access that way. And then the neighbors and residents are getting the bathroom with the developer's plan. And we must remember that this property is privately owned, public space, and there are no guarantees regarding continuity with honest open public and green spaces. And my final comment is. The aerial preservation of the turbine hallway should be used as a public museum um, as opposed to uh, using that useful historical room uh, for a, a cafe. I think a museum would be very beneficial and be an attraction uh, for many uh, in the future. And I also, uh, I'm sorry that I caused a little bit of power to that uh, tonight. Um, I also want to express my concern to Stephen Harvey and Mr. Christopher that I did not get any public notification regarding this meeting. I actually received it from uh, April Anderson. So I think that we have a failure with communication to IAG members. And I know that we don't have a full complement of IAG members, but I did not get noticed. Um, I'm so concerned about that. And I do hope going forward that design can be more, um, more welcoming to the South Boston neighborhood. And I do feel that we are still doing well. So I thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Thank you for your, for your input. Um, okay, so we read her testimony, read all the letters. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? I just want to uh, commend the development team for having assembled uh, a group of uh, uh, really interesting creative architects, particularly those who um, are, bought, uh, are based in the greater Boston area, um, and also for addressing issues of resilience and uh, waterfront access. Um, it's a really nice project. Uh, put together by a terrific team. Okay, thank you, Landsmark. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. <clears throat> Second. We'll call for a vote, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone who who uh, stuck with us. Uh, that was the final agenda item uh, for the. Um, thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. I'm excited for the turbines and the the walkway. Um, it's going to be great. Thank you. thank you, members of the board. Cheers. Um, okay. So uh, yes. We're done with agenda items. Uh, we're in the final agenda item, and that is director's update. Director Jemison, please take the floor. Good evening, and thanks to everybody, uh, especially our board members, for um, what was a exciting uh, but um, but extended uh, board time tonight. Uh, just a few highlights for you uh, on an agenda that included a, a large number of them. Uh, I know it seems like it may have been uh, another board meeting ago, but um, 
but you approved a lot of important stuff. Specifically, four new development projects representing 145 new total residential units, 56 of which um, were income restricted. Um, the total developer's cost estimate for the projects approved tonight is uh, 1.9 billion, and uh, these projects represent approximately 2.5 million square feet. Um, they'll put a large number of people to, in trades to work, 2,267 people. Um, will be part of um, creating 4,614 direct jobs and 1,200 indirect jobs. Uh, so tonight, uh, you took action to tentatively designate HYM and my city at peace to redevelop BPDA parcel three. Uh, I want to personally thank Tom O'Brien and uh, Reverend Jeffrey Brown for their hard work and the team they put together, uh, which you heard from, uh, and you saw a great team representing every part of the city. Um, in the, on that uh, on that proposal, it's been a long time coming. I'm proud of the community's vision that, as laid out in Nubian Square, uh, the plan we brought to life with this proposal. Uh, this parcel is over seven acres and the largest remaining parcel in our portfolio. I sat vacant uh, for a long time. Um, and pe people in this agency have worked hard to uh, try to get it redeveloped. I think we have one of the best chances in, uh, in many years to do so uh, with the team that's been assembled. Um, they're proposing to develop the parcel into five mixed-use buildings and open space with affordable home ownership. Um, we've been working closely with the development team to make sure uh, and maximize our chance to make sure that affordable home ownership is in the very first part of the project. It will be lab buildings, residential, retail, commercial, and assembly space there. Um, we're intending to use this lab space as an incubator for job training for Roxbury residents in the industry. Um, and the proposal includes space for Embrace Boston, which we've all been observing uh, this past week uh, with its recent opening on the Common. Look forward to working with these teams going forward uh, as each phase of the development will go through robust community process uh, as part of Article 80 review. I uh, also want to take a minute to address uh, another vote that was taken tonight uh, earlier, uh, the Wadet project. Um, uh, the Wadet property was, uh, action was taken to uh, paved the way for MBTA's acquisition of an important parcel uh, as part of an assemblage uh, that's required to um, uh, for the MBTA to, uh, to do some of the work they need to do there. Um, specifically for them, the parcel, uh, while they still have to assemble other parcels, including from this agency, to complete uh, any kind of um, uh, layover space for, uh, for trains, uh, it is going to make it possible uh, for them to electrify um, they're um, an important line, an important line to us in particular, which is the uh, Indigo line, which um, will have a chance to be electrified uh, in, in the event that we're able to, uh, we're able to realize um, some um, MBTA land use here. Um, this move also means that instead of talking to a private party, um, the MBTA uh, and, and uh, my colleague, um, Chief um, Franklin Hodge about who is the chief of streets about assembling this uh, the city um, can talk directly to the MBTA and potentially bring in other facilities that belong to the MBTA into the discussion. Uh, our thinking has been that um, in that process we might be able to um, consolidate some of our facilities and MBTA facilities and create effectively new land in that area uh, that could be part of growth for the city. Um, so I do appreciate. The, both the great questions we heard tonight about that, um, but also uh, the decision to uh, allow the um, the remaining uh, aspects of the 121A to be uh, to be um, uh, wind uh, wound down. Um, we also voted for an Alston Bright needs assessment, uh, which is a, effectively a planning effort. The RFP was authorized tonight. It was a direct outcome of the ERC negotiations we were in uh, last summer that resulted in a vote for. Um, Tishman, uh, Tishman's project. So uh, we're really thrilled uh, that that started. You just voted on 776 Summer Street, which is going to turn the old uh, Boston Edison plant into something very exciting. Uh, it's an exciting development. Um, we were just learning about it. I won't repeat all the elements of it, but a transit oriented mixed use development uh, that rehabilitates the Edison turbine halls uh, and constructs two new buildings. Um, containing, you know, lab, uh, residential, and other uses is a very, very exciting development. Um, a lot of this meeting tonight uh, was dedicated to a, a very important discussion about Longwood Place, uh, and I do want to make sure uh, that we explicitly talk about 
uh, the kind of dialogue that happened and the importance of it. Um, I do want to highlight its approval. Uh, I know there's been a lot of concern uh, in the community uh, expressed, um, a lot of which was expressed tonight, but I want to make sure that people know that before, um, that during, from now going forward and before, I very likely there's any earth or stones moved uh, anywhere, uh, we're going to have uh, much more information uh, because of the study that's going to be funded by the uh, mitigation uh, dollars provided uh, in the um, uh, in the ne negotiated uh, commitment that came out of the ADC approval. Uh, just for people's clarity, ADC is the part where you're having an envelope developed. No building has been approved. Uh, only the uh, the ability to use um, uh, the zoning envelope has been discussed today. And because that's the vote that we took today, the million dollars dedicated to the planning and thinking through ways to protect uh, the entire area from um, from future encroachment of shadow uh, is something I think is a, is a real thing to celebrate. Uh, and I want to thank um, Skanska, Simmons, um, and frankly the community for uh, the dialogue, because this is how uh, it's going to get better is through the discussions we've had today. Uh, lastly, I just want to say a couple words about Copley Connect. Um, we have um, authorized today um, getting a new uh, so a team member on board uh, through an RFP uh, to examine concepts for um, uh, for the redesign of the street and then thinking through uh, the pros and cons of um, uh, of how it should be opened and closed. Um, that follows last summer's experiment with this that we thought gave us a lot of good information. Um, we are excited about uh, the prospects uh, that will be examined by the consultant and uh, looking forward to what public dialogue comes out of that. Um, and with that, I get to conclude my comments and hopefully allow all of us to go um, back to, uh, to our homes. But I do want to say again a big thanks to you, the board members, uh, for your time and attention, which I'm sure uh, has been quite stretched tonight. I also want to thank all the citizens who came out and critically uh, the development interests and all of their supporters who came out to be part of the discussion and advance uh, the growth of the city in a number of different ways tonight. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass it back to you, Priscilla, and ask we close the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Chief Jemison. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that's the meeting. <laughs> so uh, I need a, a motion to adjourn this meeting. So Second. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was a nice trick, <laughs> Mike. Have a good evening. Um, but yes, real call for a vote, um, Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Get home safe, everybody who's in the office, and we'll see you guys next month. Bye. Good night, everybody.